become laser beak. Unlike some of my other warriors, you never fail me. Soundwave, play back laser beak's findings. As you command, Megatron. Commodore Cam, I want you to rank every episode of G1. But Prime. Listen, Cameron. You can do this. You've got the touch. You've got the power. When all hell is breaking loose, you will be riding the eye of the storm. <laughs> well, Prime, I guess I'll have to borrow this for a while then. Wait a minute. How did you get that? Did Hot Rod put you up to this? Arr, Cam, wait a minute. Arr, Vectus. Our worlds are in danger. Ah. Transformers Generation 1, where it all began. The show that captured the imagination of children and the young at heart worldwide. For better or for worse. Now at this point the franchise has over a dozen of different continuities, with each generation bringing in a new legion of fans. But let's go back to where it all began in 1984. Now even though Transformers Armada was the first series I watched, I was still exposed to a lot of Generation 1 as a kid. My mum and uncle had the toys, I used to watch the episodes sometimes on VHS and occasionally was broadcasted on Pop TV. Now each season greatly differs from each other, but they all follow the same formula. To quote the show's creators, we feel action should be emphasised over plot, especially avoiding any complicated storylines to ensure the success of a series with its intended viewers. Hmm, now where have I heard that before? Hmm, genius. Hi, I'm Michael Bay. Despite its emphasis on action, the show has a lot of warmth and charm to it, giving us memorable Autobots and Decepticon characters that all of us kids fell in love with. Now yes, the series is disguised as a half hour toy commercial, but it does a really good job at it, okay? Now I've decided to rank all G1 episodes in production order just to maintain some consistency and continuity. Regardless if you watch them in broadcast order or production order, you're still gonna get some continuity bumps along the way. Now all episodes of Generation 1 are currently free to watch on the Hasbro Pulse YouTube channel. Now as I deep dive into all these episodes, expect to see some familiar faces other YouTubers that talk about their personal favourites. I decided to make this my big ultimate collab. Now there will be an intermission after each season where I'll rank all the episodes that I like from that season and then at the end I'll do the countdown. So yeah, if you couldn't tell by the runtime of this video, this is perhaps my most ambitious video yet. So without further ado, let's dive straight into season one and see if I've got the touch. Uh, open. Damn it, open. It's the most incredible robot story ever told. The Transformers. The Transformers. You more than meets the eye. You are the most beast in battle. You destroy the evil forces of the Decepticons. The Transformers, now a three-day miniseries, unlike anything you've ever seen before. Don't miss it. Coming December 17th on KBBO. As I believe the Earthlings say, lay it on me, man. The first episode of this season is More Than Meets the Eye Part 1. In search of energy, the Autobots leave Cybertron and are pursued by the Decepticons. Basically, every Transformers plot ever. I think the start of this series really does a good job on disguising itself as a half-hour toy commercial. It's gonna get way more obvious when we get to later seasons. The episode starts out with narration that's kind of like a main staple of season one. Many millions of years ago, on the planet Cybertron, life existed. But not life as we know it today. I want him to narrate my whole life, okay? And the introduction to Cybertron is beautiful. It adds such intrigue and mystery. And it introduces us to two iconic Autobots, Wheeljack and Bumblebee. I guess I kind of would have liked to have seen more Cybertronian modes, especially robot designs of Cybertronian modes, but I mean, I get it. Of course, they're not going to make entirely new designs, only for them to transition into their Earth modes for the next second. But hey, it only took about 40 years for us to finally get a Cybertronian jazz mode from G1. We got vehicle modes with Wheeljack, Bumblebee, the Seekers, and uh, Soundwave. Disclosure. Averted. Nature's gonna slide you down one bit.
You know, it really does give a great introduction to both factions, showing us the differences between the Autobots and Decepticons. Especially with the Decepticons, we immediately get a taste of what Megatron and Starscream are going to be like for the entire series. The Autobots would have lost eons ago if I'd been calling the shots. My time will come, Megatron. Never. Never! I can see why kids latched onto this. This is exactly how me and my siblings behave. As the Autobots and Decepticons leave Cybertron, I, I just never get over the idea of two asteroids in deep space just showing up out of nowhere and colliding. What is it? An asteroid. There's another one. They're going to collide. I mean, just the cosmic improbability of this happening is just wow. And that's another thing, I'm not going to list every animation error. This is Generation 1, it's the 80s. I mean, it's a relic of its time, and it's also got a lot of charm to it, and I can never get mad at it. I mean, I just love it. Some of them are just hilarious. And it's not just animation errors, there are just random moments in G1, things that just happen for no other reason whatsoever, and it's just amazing. Yes! It's kind of funny to me that Skywarp is kind of responsible for kicking off a war again. Like it's been 4 million years since they crash landed on Earth and Skywarp could have just walked out of there, led a happy life, but no. He just had to repair Megatron and kick this war off again. I mean, do you ever just think about how Megatron could have easily have destroyed the repair system of Teletran 1? Just in case if the Autobots get repaired, but now nah, it's fine, I'm sure he's confident that nothing's going to trigger it. Okay, never mind. The main plot of Megatron's plan is that he wants to gather enough energy and build the ultimate weapon. And it's kind of like the main thing he talks about in Season 1, and honestly, still to this day, I have no idea actually what he means. I mean, even in the show, Starscream asks basic plot hole questions, and well, this feels like the writer's response. Use your imagination! Let's talk about the voice acting for a minute. It is just stellar on all fronts. For an 80s cartoon, they've got some real great talent. You can feel every character is unique and different, I mean, you've got the greats, you've got Frank Welker, Peter Cullen, Casey Kasem, who played Shaggy on Scooby-Doo. And then we've got Ken Sansom as Hound, who is a kind of main highlight of this episode. And also Cliff Jumper as well, because in the episode, they spy on the Decepticons to figure out what their plan is. And honestly, they've got great chemistry together. You can tell these guys are comrades. But then at the end, it kind of goes a bit sour, where Laserbeak and a missile chase after them and knock Hound down. And we get an introduction to one of my favourite characters ever, Hauler, who does one thing in the entire series and you never see him again and becomes an absolute icon in the Transformers fandom. You know you'd think for intelligent robots that they wouldn't need to have three robots turn into a camera. I mean damn I think Reflector got the worst when it came to the modern era of Transformers. You know I think it's kind of funny that the first human interaction are just two random lorry drivers and they just get attacked by Ravage. The end of the episode makes up for the weak encounter the Autobots and Decepticons had on the arc by now going at it on a tanker. And it's really cool with just a few lines of dialogue delivered perfectly by Frank Welker and Peter Cullen, you can really tell that these two characters have a history with each other. Don't you not see the time? Give it up, Megatron! The universe is mine! So yeah, they've been at it like this for about 38 years. Well, not as of late. I guess you could say this is what maturing looks like. <laughs> Curse that annoyingly catchy tune. The fight quickly ends with Optimus Prime being attacked by a birdie. I mean, the episode ends with Megatron just blowing up the whole tanker, and I just love how crazy Megatron can get, and honestly, it gets better in part two. In More Than Meets the Eye Part 2, we have the Witwicky family meeting the Autobots for the first time, and damn, this is such an iconic moment. Are you Samuel James Witwicky, descendant of Archibald Witwicky? Yeah. And you know, out of all the human characters we've had, I really like Spike and Sparkplug. I feel like they're a good father and son dynamic, and they fit in with the world of the Transformers really well. But seriously, how are they so calm? Like, why aren't they scared? The Autobots fly back to their base. Oh yeah, flying. So that's never really explained. It drops after three episodes, because, well, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of them turning into cars. But at least the showrunners caught onto that early on. I think one of my favourite moments in this episode is when Spike notices Soundwave's cassette mode and does not think to question it at all. I mean, this is why Soundwave is just a great infiltrator. Like, yeah, that, that logo, that don't look pretty dangerous, boy. Like, you, you, have they not filled you in on the insignia yet for the Decepticons? Mission complete and how? They're going to tell stories about this one, boss. The human characters are somewhat a good leeway for us, the audience, to understand the Transformers a lot more, and I really like that Spike's asking a lot of questions about the Transformers, but me, personally, if I was an Autobot, it wouldn't have been a good idea for Spike to talk to me. 
For one thing, why do you transform into cars and things? Gee, I don't know, why do you breathe, you maggot? This episode shares light on a few powers that the Autobots and Decepticons have, but unfortunately they never get explored again. We've got Mirage being translucent. Over here! Disappearing! It's the best disguise of all! That sounds like something a pervert would say. Then we've got Skywarp with his teleport ability, which makes him the most valuable Decepticon ever. The main premise of this episode is that the Decepticons continue to raid Earth's energy sources, including the Sherman Dam and the Ruby Crystal Mines of Burma. And to start off this plan, he needs Rumble to be Rumble. Yeah, he is a little tyrant. He causes so much damage. He's also blue. Rumble is blue. No way! Also, this. Rumble, activate bio drivers. Operation Tidal Wave. <laughs> I like it when he does that. I don't know why. Every time it just gives me DJ vibes. One of the main problems I have with this episode is that it just moves a little bit too fast. Like, only a second goes by and they're already in a different location. You know, I think this is why they stop the Autobots from flying, because honestly, the plot moves too quick when we do. Once again, we're back at it with science does not matter at all in this series. I mean, we've got Bumblebee and Iron Eye doing genius law-breaking stuff. <laughs> Okay, what the fu- Also, every time I watch this scene over and over, it just gets me every time. You fool, Starscream! Help save the Energon cubes! Get them out of here! Follow me! Also, Starscream has a slingshot in this episode and never uses it again. Damn, I would have loved more slingshot Starscream. One of the most iconic moments in this episode is Octopus Prime and Megatron going at it on the Sherman Dam. And boy, these two love to trash talk each other. They're like an old married couple. We'll see who's ready for the scrappy Chuck. That's what you are, Chuck. Silence! <laughs> One thing to note though is that they only use their energy melee weapons once in the entire series. Despite Hasbro now never letting you forget about those weapons. Also, I just love how Spike is constantly trying to help out the Autobots despite getting knocked down every time by Rumble. Hey, you know, this reminds me of the Bumblebee scene where Charlie dives down to save Bumblebee. No, oh, that's a pretty touching homage. <laughs> uh, easy, Spike. You almost flooded your engine. Okay, I'm glad they didn't pay homage to that. Now we know Octopus Prime is full of memorable quotes, but I think this talk right here with the Autobots just kind of cements how good of a leader he is and what Peter Cullen meant by being a strong but gentle leader. We're not fighters like they are, Prime. We must have courage, Huffer. We can't ignore the danger. We must conquer it. You know, despite the Decepticons being on Earth for only a few minutes, like, they really are good at collecting energy. Like, Megatron's actually kind of a good leader. Also, I think Skywarp and Thundercracker just proved the Flat Earth Theory. They're so flat. Yeah, <laughs> I know what you mean, Thundercracker. The Autobots devise a plan to stop the Decepticons. They nuke it. Optimus Prime grows concerned though because Spark, Pluck and Bumblebee have been in the cave a bit too long, and as he's about to help them, Bang. One of the most dramatic animations I've ever seen, ever. Prime! Now we've got more than meets the eye part three, and structurally this episode is kind of weird. I mean, we've got the Autobots trying to trick the Decepticons, and then we've got the Decepticons trying to trick the Autobots, and there's a lot of backwards and forwards, and it's just kind of a bit exhausting. The episode kicks off with Optimus Prime recovering from his fall, and honestly, it seems like they're trying to show the kids how to transform Optimus Prime, just in case if they didn't know already. Hey, you know, I bet it actually worked with some kids. Arms out to the side and bring him forward. He is mostly in robot mode, we gotta put his hands on. And then flip his head up, and there is his complete robot mode. Despite blowing up the caves, the Decepticon somehow managed to break free and escape. Whoa, 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 hang on a minute, Soundway, whoa, whoa, wait, what? Is that an Autobot insignia? Yeah, so if you're not new to the franchise, this kind of happens a lot. One thing I like about this episode is Einheit's persistence on defeating the Decepticons. Like, he just flies off and tries to take on Megatron and his entire army by himself. Of course, it backfires due to Skywarp's amazing ability. But at least it led us to this memorable quote. I remember the time on Cybertron. Save the war stories, hotshot. Just remember, there's a thin line between being a hero and being a memory. Also, I'm pretty sure Prime just gave Hotshot his name in Armada. The Autobots come up with a plan to trick the Decepticons just because of Mirage talking about his garage fantasy or whatever. When we get back to Cybertron, will you make me a big house with a four-car garage? <laughs> 
Why, Mirage? Why do you want that? Why? The Autobots allow Ravage to escape to lure the Decepticons into their trap, and <laughs> honestly, this scene, I, I just don't get, I can't get over their faces. What happened? Ravage, he escaped. Perfect. Why are they pulling their faces? They, they came up with the plan. <laughs> also, for some reason, this is the only episode where Ravage speaks. The rocket base is 140 kilometers due west of the Autobot camp. Excellent, Ravage! Excellent! No, Ravage. Bad kitty. Never speak again. Decepticons forever! <laughs> okay, I changed my mind. This episode also delivers on some of the best insults thrown at Starscream. Right on schedule, aren't we? No thanks to you. You couldn't lead androids to a picnic. Please don't shoot! <laughs> So somehow the Decepticons have already caught on to Optimus Prime's plan of trapping them with a hologram. I mean, I mean, look at these lab coats. Like, who are they trying to fool? Are they trying to pose as humans? Is Me do they really think Megatron's that stupid? We have come to a moment of truth. We're all idiots. Now we've got an action sequence, which is actually pretty fun. I mean, everything's kind of all over the place. We've got Starscream's missile getting run over by Prowl. We've got Hound just beating up Rumble. Then we've got Prime and Megatron going back at it with a trash talk. I love how this isn't about, like, greater good or any kind of morals both of them have. It's just them throwing pure shade at each other. Octopus Prime seems to want to be really dramatic in every episode. And I love how he yells Megatron's name in this scene. I... I love you. Now I know we rarely see Optimus Prime lose his cool, especially in this series, but the one time that he does, I can't help but just want more of it. Give me your rocket pack. My rocket pack? Now! Uh, yeah, right. This is crazy, Prime. You'll never catch him. You can tell that he just really hates Megatron. Oh yeah, and this is when they suddenly decide that Autobots cannot fly anymore. The Decepticon's plan is foiled by somehow Mirage sneaking onto the ship. The Decepticons are defeated and the Autobots claim victory, but to be fair, this is mostly just because of Starscream being Starscream. Because the Autobots stopped the Decepticons from stealing Earth's resources, the governments of the world have agreed to give Optimus Prime the energy he needs to revitalize Cybertron. Surprisingly, the most unrealistic thing about this entire series. This plot point is thrown out pretty quick. I guess all the governments fell out and they just didn't have enough energy anymore to give to the Autobots. Overall, I think this free part of episode was a good solid introduction into the franchise. Uh, there's a few inconsistencies near and there, but this is them just drafting out ideas. But they do give us some iconic moments that everyone remembers, such as the melee energy weapons, with the dialogue between Octopus Prime and Megatron being pretty solid, with characters standing out like Starscream especially. Like, you can see why kids got hooked into this in the 80s and why it kind of blew up massively. I think the reason why I excuse a lot of things that happen in this show is just because the show overall has its charm. There's some sort of great nature about it where, yeah, I and I doing that, it just kind of goes over your head. Up oh, two asteroids colliding, uh, yeah, it's just a product of its time. It's it's the 80s, like, what do you expect? And I think the soundtrack complements this series a lot as well because it's kind of like a warm atmosphere about it. It's like very welcoming and calm. And I think that's actually a great deception because the world of Transformers is absolutely bonkers. Like seriously, this world is terrifying. I would not want to live in this crazy world. Of all the things that happen, no way. I think my favorite part out of More Than Meets the Eye has got to be part one. I think it's just a great introduction and it's very slow and it doesn't really rush a lot of things. <sighs> right, so that was the first three episodes. And yeah, you bet. After each episode we talk about, I'll be using the Insignia transition. And I dare you to have a shot after every transition. I hope you're still standing by the end of this video. Episode 4, Transport to Oblivion. In this episode, Decepticons have come back after months of hiding, and we have a new method to move in Energon Cubes. Test Cybertron. Yay, more Cybertron. Which means yay, more Shockwave. He's one of my favourite Decepticons, and honestly, it's because he's so relatable. Losing power. The episode kicks off with Cliff Jumper thinking that a rock is a Decepticon. I mean, yeah, okay, it's pretty convincing, but who carved that rock and why is it so perfect? Soundwave once again demonstrates on why he is such a master infiltrator. He's in this factory here, fooling all of these workers, and he fools Ed. I mean, I can't believe it. He fooled Ed. And who is Ed, by the way? He has his own TF Wikia page. I want to know his story. Why is he so important to have his own page? Hey, Ed! Turn your tape player down, will you? That's not... 
Oh. You gotta love how the Decepticons managed to get energy in the show. They're literally pouring electricity in the Energon cubes. Yes, science! We got Jazz and Spike listening to music, and honestly, this music will be used non-stop. Get prepared to listen to this music all the time. It's what all the Autobots seem to like and enjoy. Well, except for Optimus, but more on that later. I love how the Decepticon ship, which is now underwater, kind of has like a little mini city. Like, that's actually one place of a cartoon where I wish they explored more. To find out what the Decepticons' plan is, Optimus sends Bumblebee on a spy mission, and Spike tags along. You know, Spike being friends with all the Autobots, he's probably best known for being partnered up with Bumblebee, and this is like the first episode to really do that, and it immediately fails. They both get caught and are used as guinea pigs to test out the Space Bridge, which is a gateway to Cybertron, and when that backfires, he gets a chance to escape once again, at the expense of leaving Spike. Gee, this friendship's really kicking off to a good start. Even when he has the chance to escape again, he gets caught by the Decepticons and is brainwashed to lure the Autobots into a trap. Something's happened to Spike and Bumblebee. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Bumblebee's speaking normally up to the point that he obviously isn't, and I love how much confidence the Autobots have in him though, like, oh yeah, Bumblebee would never lie. But I mean, if I was his friend, I would immediately start realising he's talking like a robot. Okay, yes, I realise how dumb that sounds. Yes, they are robots, but you know what I mean. When I mentioned the Autobots had special powers, I forgot to mention that, yeah, Ratchet seems to just summon Pac-Man at will. Another thing to mention is that Megatron's full of weird weapons in this episode. He's got some hose-sucking looking thing, and he's got a buzzsaw launcher which just looks kind of creepy. I, d I don't know why that's just animated so weird. Oh, and Bumblebee gets repaired by a seductive Ratchet. Hey Bumblebee, looks like you could use a little repair. Towards the end of the episode, we have Spike Ultimates getting launched to Cybertron, and I can't help but just love how pissed he looks at Megatron. <laughs> Spike is such a mood. You know, this episode actually seems pretty desperate to end. I mean, we've got Megatron blasted into the Space Bridge, and he looks like he's at the carnival. But I mean, hey, at least the Space Bridge works, but this means Shockwave's got no more privacy. Megatron! I mean, this episode was alright. It started off pretty strongly and then it seemed to kind of rush itself towards the end. I mean, even Starscream didn't want the fight to be over quick. Starscream? Retreat? Never! Come again? Decepticons! Retreat! What was that, Starscream? Decepticons! Retreat! Yeah, so he does this a lot. I like this episode for introducing us to the Space Bridge, which becomes a main staple of a franchise, being used in almost every iteration of the Transformers since, and we got more Shockwave. Next up we've got Episode 5, Roll For It, where the Decepticons seek a powerful antimatter formula, and the Autobots with their new human ally, Chip Chase, helps to try and stop them. Yes, we've got a new human ally called Chip Chase, and Chip is handicapped. Why is that important? Well, because he doesn't act like it. Like, his brain belongs in a museum. He's literally Professor X. He essentially uses plot hole devices to fix the plot holes in the episodes. The episode begins with Starscream declaring himself as the new leader since Megatron was shot up to Cybertron in the last episode. See, there's kind of some continuity here with the first season. We've kind of got a new Autobot highlighted in this episode. We have Brawn. Think of Juggernaut as a robot. I love him. He's just so cool. We got Chip, Spike, and Bumblebee entering this really high security lab. Like, wow, okay, yep, yeah, that's a lot of security there. I mean, did Volkswagens used to be wheelchair accessible? I mean, that's kind of cool, Bumblebee. That's pretty neat. And we got one of the most friendly security guards ever. Like, he seems to know everybody. Well, except for Bumblebee, which gives him a good surprise. And this gave me a creepy vibe, like, oh, Bumblebee, please, fix your face. You know, a lot of characters in this episode seem to have a lot of weird powers that just seem to come out of nowhere and they get never used again. We've got Megatron touching a computer and just be able to know everything. We've got Soundwave being able to read Chip's mind. And then we've got Chip being able to control Prowl from a computer. Where is this technology coming from? I'm almost impressed, but then also scared of this world. The Decepticons are right on their tail of getting the antimatter formula, but when I first watched this scene, I literally thought the Doctor just exploded. Come on, Doctor Alcazar, acknowledge! In order to stop the Decepticons from getting their hands on the antimatter formula, Chip rips up the disc, or whatever kind of floppiness that is, and manages to memorize it all in his head. Okay then, Brainiac. But like I mentioned, this doesn't really matter because he gets captured anyway, and Soundwave is able to read his mind. So once I rip this up, there's no way the Decepticons can learn to make the antimatter. You're too late, Ravage. The information's already been destroyed. 
<laughs> hey, we get to hear Soundwave's real voice for a split second. Excellent ravage. I feel traumatized. Animation error of this episode goes to Megatron's tiny face. Antimatter! Why does he look like a worm? The Autobots battle strategy in this episode is honestly just superb, with Rumble being blindsided because of a rock, Hound creating dozens of holograms, and Bumblebee... Wait, did he just kill them? He literally shoved them in his ass. I'll mention Sunstreaker and Sideswipe in this episode, two characters that are actually really beloved in the fandom, for being like brothers, and for good reason, they're just cool. But they can also fly. I guess they forgot to remove it? I know Sideswipe has a jetpack and all, but we don't actually see him use it, so it's like, ah, more questions. It's fun to hear Megatron brag about himself in this episode and being the ultimate weapon when he literally transforms into a small pistol. To be fair, if I was born in the 80s, I would love to have this gun. I would literally be issued as a threat. What always gets me though is how Megatron has to rely on the Decepticons to use his own trigger. Like, what happens to Megatron's brain? Does he go to sleep? Is he self-aware? Is he like conscious? Does he know what's happening? I do find it funny though how close Skywarp was to killing Spike. The Decepticons are defeated by an invention by Wheeljack, but the day is ultimately saved by Chip. And at the end, it becomes one of the official members of the Autobot team. But when you rolled for broke back there, you sure could have fooled me. Roll? Really, Bumblebee? Did you just say roll? Oh my god, I just realised how bad the episode title is. Overall, I thought this episode was just fine. I mean, the pseudoscience was a bit too much for me, where it got a little bit too crazy. Like, I know what I've said already, that the weirdness of this show kind of has a certain charm to it, but then sometimes it gets a little bit too ridiculous and sometimes often boring. Like, just to move on with the plot. Anyway, on to the next episode. <laughs> Episode 6, Divide and Conquer. The Autobots must journey to Cybertron to retrieve a vital piece of technology to save the life of a critically wounded Optimus Prime. Back everyone! He's going to explode! Okay, never mind, he's dead. The episode starts out with literally a bang, like the amount of destruction caused by the Seekers here. It's almost an excuse to Bayham. I mean, I can kind of see where Michael Bay got inspiration from now. Optimus Prime is badly damaged by the Seekers and is taken back to headquarters, but the Autobots aren't even sure if he's even going to make it. He's gotta make it. I don't know. He got hit real bad. Hey, Light- Gee, really giving us a lot of confidence, Spike. Megatron wants to know the condition of Optimus Prime, so he sends Laserbeak out to go and investigate. <laughs> Nailed it. Megatron sees an opportunity to attack Optimus Prime, so he orders Laserbeak to start blasting. Now, Laserbeak, finish him off! <laughs> Know if they wanted money mm -hmm. or they wanted something more sexual wow. but it's a lucky thing i had my pieces your pieces my gun oh nice. anyway i started blasting bam, wow. bam. anyway you guys all think i'm a hero and i'll accept that responsibility this is the first time we actually get to see the inner sides of optimus prime it'd be more important later on because obviously we know him best having the matrix inside of his chest but this is obviously just excused by the fact that, well, the Matrix wasn't even a thing until the movie, so, yeah. But, I mean, it's cool to see the kind of insights of Prime. Okay, that... Like, that sounded weird. That, that... That's not what I meant. With Optimus Prime somehow surviving, the Autobots think of a plan of how to repair him, and, well, the repair that they need is actually on Cybertron. Realising how difficult it's going to be to get to Cybertron, Buffer decides to be a whiny little bitch. I knew it was hopeless, I just knew... We got our... You know, I find it quite funny that despite this, he actually takes charge later on in the episode, but it's like, wait, isn't Jazz second in command? Gee, I guess that just kind of disappeared. The Autobots miraculously find the Decepticon space bridge, but Megatron allows the Autobots to transport to Cybertron because he's got a bigger plan involved, which involves the Rainmakers. So the Rainmakers were a group of Seekers that were in the first episode, and their purpose is to cause acid rain. I don't want to visit this planet. I love how the success of the Acid Rain finally gets Starscream and Megatron to agree, and I just cannot get over the face of Starscream balls. Even he's confused. The Autobots are nearly taken offline, but with a few encouraging words by Chip, they manage to get back on their feet. Acid storm disabled circuit tree. No one's ever really disabled as long as he has courage. I honestly love Spike's resistance on not giving up on Optimus Prime, despite the very beginning of the episode, he had no faith, and now suddenly he's got loads. And I love how he just takes Jazz's gun, like, yep, dude, you're not gonna need this in battle. And the way how he takes on Ravage, oh my god, this is so funny to me. Ravage! Bad kitty! 
This episode ends off with Optimus Prime getting the repair he needs and returns back in glorious fashion. Is there anyone in the universe who'll challenge the might of Megatron? There is one Megatron! Megatron once again whines like a little baby and Starscream is on it straight away. I need assistance! How unfortunate. I am the only suitable leader anyway. And that was Divide and Conquer. The episode was okay, it's not really as memorable. I feel like this episode is only remembered for Artemis Prime's chest because it caused a huge debate on where was the Matrix all this time, but that's kind of it. And as for the Rainmakers, well... They would be given toys about 30 plus years later, and that's it. That's the only another thing this episode is remembered for, is for the Acid Rainmakers. Let's talk about a better episode now. Episode 7, Fire in the Sky. While siphoning the Earth of its energy, the Decepticons uncover a long-lost colleague of Starscream, Skyfire. Or Jetfire. Honestly, it's too long to explain, let's just move on. One of the reasons why I really like this episode so much is just the beginning where the Autobots are having a snowball fight, just showing the fun side. There's just something so chill about it. And I mean, Jazz, every time I watch this, he's just adorable. That's the biggest snowman I ever saw. <laughs> Not snowman, Spike. Snowbot. There's a flurry in a hurry. It seems like this where the Autobots' interaction with the humans just feels so genuine. And the voice acting helps with this. I mean, we've got Scatman Crothers voicing Jazz, who does such a great job of making this character feel warm and cool. And it's no surprise that the cast members loved him during their recording sessions. While they were waiting their turn in the lobby to do their voice lines, he would bring his guitar every session and perform for his fellow cast members to keep them entertained during the lengthy waiting times. I just love how he was basically his character. He was cool in the show and he was cool in real life. The fun abruptly ends though, because Bumblebee ends up killing Spike with a snowball. I'll splat on you! Out of all the Autobots, Octopus Prime, of course, is the one not having fun. And he goes concerned because while the main plot of this episode is somehow the Earth's core is being drained, and of course, it's the Decepticons. You disgust me! God, I love this show. Now, as much as I love this episode, there's also someone else who loves this episode as well. And I'm going to introduce to you my good friend who has a lot to say about this, Dr. Lockdown. Greetings, Cybertronians. I'm Dr. Lockdown. My favourite episode of G1 was Fire in the Sky for one simple fact. This is where I got my first taste for the depth in character this franchise could offer. Starscream wasn't just a one-note treacherous bastard in this episode. He was remorseful for the loss of his best friend. A polar windstorm came up suddenly. And Skyfire and I were separated. I circled half the globe searching for him. Skyfire wasn't just a shallow villain of the week. He was naive and came to realize the error of his ways. It was really simple in terms of writing, but it showed the will to do the right thing went beyond the simple Autobots Decepticon dynamic. Crush him and all the Autobots once and for all. I take no orders from you. Now. Also, I'm aware everyone likes to joke that his revival in a later episode makes this episode pointless, but f you, as a kid, I found that awesome. And I will die on that hill. Optimus Prime! Why are you so frightened? I will not harm you. Next up, we've got episode 8 SOS Dinobots. The Autobots create the Dinobots, but they are unable to control their new powerful warriors. I'm shocked. We've got the Autobots discovering skeleton bones of dinosaurs deep in the volcano of their base, and while Spike enlightens them on a bit of history, which gives Wheeljack an unfortunate idea, the idea of creating robot dinosaurs. Huffer is literally the only self-aware character in this episode. It'll never work. Big waste of time. So we've got Grimlock, Sludge, and Slag. Huh, that sounds controversial. Oh, you Slag! <laughs> After building the Dinobots, Wheeljack couldn't be more excited to showcase them to the Autobots. Dinobots, huh? I thought you were supposed to make dinosaurs! <laughs> F*** you, Huffer. Of course, it's a Wheeljack invention, so usually something tends to go wrong. The Dinobots go berserk. I mean, dude, you could have literally evolved the dinosaur concept 
by giving them bigger brains. But overall, I like the Dinobots. They're an iconic team in the franchise, and I'm not surprised that kids went nuts over them. I don't think this is their best episode though, I think they have better centered episodes later on. It takes a while to kind of understand each of the Dinobots' personality, well, the lack thereof. I mean, they cause chaos within just a minute, and Octopus Prime already states the obvious. The Dinobots must be destroyed! Prime, what happened to freedom is the right of all sentient beings! The Decepticons are pretty boring in this episode, to be honest, though. They don't really do much, they're just scouting for energy. But I don't really care, at least it gave us this shot. I, Megatron, declare this facility Decepticon Domain! I think it's funny how nobody is on board with Blue Streak's joke in this episode. Maybe Hound's got glitch mice in his databanks again! <laughs> Oh my god, I think I just realised which Oliver I am. There's probably some like ethical problems the way the dinosaurs were kept, but hey, they get a big upgrade on their brains, and while well, they save the day by rescuing the Autobots. And you know, it's an alright episode, it's fine, it's a good introduction to the Dinobots, but to be honest, the only reason I'm going to put this a little bit higher is just because of this one iconic scene. Zero inhibitor shells! My equilibrium! Destabilized! Megatron has fallen! I, Starscream, am now your leader! Decepticons, follow me! What always gets me about this scene is that the Decepticons actually follow him. Oh my god, so good. <laughs> Episode 9, Fire on the Mountain. The Decepticons uncover the crystal power in Peru, and the Autobots resurrect Skyfire in order to stop them. Yes, this is the big threat of the episode. So yay, we've got Skyfire back. And it turns out they could have actually gone back at any point to rescue him. They just left him for some reason the last time. They don't even revive him. They just melt the ice and he's suddenly okay. Now this would have been a good switch of character. Like he was so nice in the last episode. But if Skyfire realised that the Autobots just kind of left him. And how they could have actually have saved him. It would have been funny just to see him go all evil now. And they only revive him because they need him to travel to Peru, which is like, wow, okay, that's nice, guys. Yeah, not for any other reason, we just need to use you. But if they can travel to the Arctic, why can't they just travel to Peru? Okay, you know what? Let's not think about this. The episode begins with two of my favourite Autobots, Brawn and Trailbreaker. Now, with Trailbreaker, he's kind of like a forgotten character from the old cartoon, and I don't know why. He's got a pretty sweet design. I know his power isn't like a big thing, like, you know, a force field, but still, nonetheless, it was pretty cool every time he used it in the show. And the same goes for Windcharger, but I'll talk about him in Season 2 when he has his own kind of centred episode. Okay, so what are the main things that stand out in this episode? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, Starscream's rocket nipples. They're pretty sweet. He's literally a cow. Now, we do have an interesting Seeker rivalry between Thundercracker and Starscream, and as a matter of fact, Thundercracker's original toy bio stated that he had thoughts about going over to the Autobots, so like, that would have been cool to have explored that, and kind of implement that in this episode, but that doesn't get explored, it don't go anywhere, we just have Thundercracker calling Starscream a geeky Decepticon. Oh, and he also called Megatron a geek. What's the matter, fearless leader? You and Starscream look real geeky! You know, I wish more Decepticons kind of had the courage to say that to Megatron. Like, how did he get away with that? Also, one more thing I love about this episode is the absolute hatred both Brawn and Megatron have for each other. You're next, you airborne garbage bucket! There's no way a midget like you can handle the mighty Megatron! I mean, he steals his cannon and then uses it against him. Was a kick. Brawn's a badass. But yeah, this episode was fine. It was good to have more Skyfire. And it was good to see Optimus Prime petting him as well. Also, this is a quote that I think is really underrated. <laughs> I'm too darn big to sneak around like this. I think the best animation error has got to go Skyfire being recolored as Skywarp. Like, really guys? Is colouring that hard? But hey, this is the episode where Starscream gets Screamer as a nickname. I mean, the episode would have you believe that there's a love interest for Spike with Lucia, who just kind of shows up midway through the episode to help the Autobots out. But in the end, Bumblebee is the only one to get hooked up with her brother's car, Juanita. And I think the two of them will get along just fine. Aw, oh, shucks. Calm down there, Bumblebee. She's not real. 
Now we have episode 10, War of the Dinobots, and we get two new additions to the Dinobot roster, Snarl and Swoop. You'd think Optimus Prime would learn his lesson from the last episode, with the Dinobots causing so much chaos, but yeah, why not? Let's just add two more. We'll see how this pans out. So Megatron's big plan for this episode is to turn the Dinobots against the Autobots. Yeah, that doesn't sound hard. Oh, and we've also got Chip in this episode. Yay, Chip. The episode begins with him actually calling the Autobots because there's an incoming asteroid. You know, I like the idea of Megatron just looking back at all the nine episodes we've just watched and just realizing that he's not getting anywhere. The Dinobots overwhelmed us with sheer brute force. Brilliant, my boron compressor. The Dinobots. As the meteorite crashes, the Autobots go and investigate with the Dinobots, and Soundwave once again is back at it with his expert infiltrating skills. I don't know why, I always find that so funny. So the Autobots head back to base to analyze some of the fragments they found in the meteorite, and they think it's a smart idea to leave the Dinobots in charge of guarding the meteorite. Which in theory sounds like a good idea, because while they are tough and they can hold back the Decepticons if they try and claim some of the meteorite, but this is the Dinobots. They barely have any brains. No matter how many times I see it, it's always outrageous. Dude, it's literally the same animation repeated over and over and over. Okay, so I don't actually hate Chip. It's just that some of the things that he says, he just gets on my nerves sometimes. <laughs> I love the fact that he actually gets to pick what the next Dinobot should be. But for the second, how about giving the Autobots a little extra flying power? A Tyrannodon. Stego, what's this? And Tyranno, who's this? Is there anything you don't know about Chip? <laughs> I'm not going to say it. So Soundwave scans the Dinobots' brains and tells Megatron that they're basically stupid, so Megatron decides to use his words to turn them against the Autobots. And you know, it's refreshing to see Megatron actually use his words instead of just resorting to his weapons, like it shows how kind of smart Megatron is. Granted, yes, he's talking to idiots, but still. I like how when the Autobots are testing out the new Dinobots, they just allow them to throw them about everywhere just to see how strong they are. In a real fight, we'd have creamed them. Maybe. I'm sorry, what? Meanwhile, we have Optimus Prime taking on three Dinobots by himself, and gee, Prime is not doing good here. He needs to take a page out of the Bayverse book. We're giving you freedom! The episode ends with Snarl and Swoop defeating the other Dinobots, and Optimus Prime saving Grimlock as the meteorite explodes. You've got Grimlock asking Optimus Prime to forgive him, and Prime's just like blatantly ignoring him. He's like, nope, we've got to finish this episode, never mind. Optimus Prime, can you forgive? The meteorite menace is gone. I am so going to disassemble you for spare parts when we get back. Next up, we've got the ultimate doom, where the Decepticons use a space bridge to bring Cybertron into Earth's orbit. No, wait, hang on, I've seen that movie. Yep, this three-parter inspired the third movie of Transformers, Dark of the Moon. I guess Michael Bay could only sit through three episodes of G1. Out of all the episodes in Season 1, the Ultimate Doom seems to get talked about a lot and is praised by fans. I mean, it's okay, I don't think it's actually the best storyline of Generation 1, but I can definitely understand why fans come back to this three-parter. Actually, you know, I think the first time I watched this three-parter was on the Revenge of the Fallen PlayStation 2 game. It was a bonus unlockable. I think I actually worked really hard to get that as well, and that was back in 2009. The episode begins with the Seekers attacking India because they've got a power station that holds a lot of energy. And the Autobots come and save the day, and they get there by driving on water. Great invention there, Wheeljack. With the Autobots distracted, Soundwave captures Spark Plug, and honestly, I think the Autobots have the worst security ever. You see it throughout the entire episode. Now, one of the funniest moments in this episode is a scene between Skywarp and Starscream as they return to the Decepticon base. I think Megatron's plan was brilliant! And I say that the versionary attack on the solar plant was a waste of energy! You waste more energy with your mouth! Look, I... Shut up! I really enjoy the banter between the Seekers throughout the series, but I wish we had more of it. It really does make you debate though on which is your favourite. Starscream of course being the traitor, Skywarp hating everything, and Thundercracker being the goon. But who is superior? I'm telling you, Starscream is the best Seeker. His colours are just amazing. The best combination. But Thundercracker, he likes dogs. So what if he likes dogs? 
Starscream has a crown. Oh no, no, my dear chap. I'm afraid Skywarp is the best seeker. <laughs> Skywarp, get a load of this guy. <laughs> it's true, he is though. Yeah, sorry to let you down, pal, but it's definitely Starscream. End of story. I see you have chosen death. What is that supposed to mean? Oh, you'll see. I said Skywalk! Okay. <laughs> now let's get on with the show. So the Decepticons kidnap Sparkplug so that Megatron's new ally, Dr. Archiville, can use him as a guinea pig to mind control him. Right, this is a character I actually really wanted to know a lot of backstory on, but he just shows up as this like nut job. he's got a robotic arm, he's like Dr. Claw a little bit, mixed in with the guy from the Back to the Future films. I mean, to be fair, he can mind control people, this is like a genius invention and he's using it for evil. Of course he is. Also, I think Megatron has a lot of dummies of Optimus Prime laying around the base. Later on in the series, you actually notice he has quite a lot of them. The Autobots save Sparkplug, but it doesn't take long for them to start picking up that he's being weird, and it doesn't take long for the Decepticons to start attacking the Autobot base again. So, so I can't get over what Spike says here. Attack! Spare no one! How'd they get in? Uh, the door was open. Now I know that Sparkplug to say would be alarmed, but still at the same time it's like, wouldn't they have not heard the giant explosion? You know, I think part 1 frustrates me more than the rest of them. Part 1 ends with the Decepticons getting the upper hand, Cybertron enters Earth's orbit, and I just can never get over how comically tiny it looks. I mean, Prime makes a kind of controversial and, like, big decision, having to save Cybertron and sacrifice the Earth. He immediately regrets his decision, I think Optimus Prime of today, I mean, like we saw in Transformers Prime, he immediately sacrificed Cybertron's future in order to save Earth. And that made him a badass, but in this episode it's like, Wow, thanks Prime, you dickhead. I'll let him off because I bet he was just thinking about Elite One. But I don't understand why he needed to do it. Like, Megatron says Cybertron will be destroyed, but like, why would it be destroyed? I mean, Cybertron's not here yet. I can't believe the Autobots have so much patience with these humans. I would have immediately squatted them. Episode 12, The Ultimate Doom Part 2. The episode starts out with Megatron immediately choking Starscream. Why you little? You bastard! Dad, that's my wrist! You know, actually, I don't blame him. Starscream, for some reason, in the Ultimate Doom becomes really irritating really fast, and it's very apparent in part two. We also have Optimus Prime immediately regretting his decision to bring Cybertron into Earth's orbit. My actions may have cost Earth its future. You did what you had to do, Prime. What any of us would have done. Nah, my boy Beachcomber would never do something like that. And now we've got Dr. Archiville, or whatever his name is. That's it, right? Creating a mindless slave is simplicity. Um, okay, this is kind of weird. I love how detailed Sparkplug's face is for this one single shot. We can't stand by and watch the destruction of this beautiful planet. Then maybe you shouldn't have pressed the button. Oh yeah, I totally forgot the Dinobots are in this episode. Also, the sound mixing in this episode is really bad. Like, it's like this in a few episodes, but here is very more apparent. Must help stop these disasters. Uh, me, Grimlock, not care. Same, Grimlock. Same. You know, one thing I'll give this episode credit for is the touching scene between Optimus Prime and Spike. When you said you were done fighting for humans, you didn't mean that, did you? How many more of my kind must be sacrificed to atone for your mistakes? We've got pseudoscience in this episode out in full force here. We've got the volcano where the Autobots base is erupting and Iron High Soldier is to shoot the rocks into the lava because, yes, that works. And then you've got the Dinobots kind of like just launching themselves into the sea and like digging a hole and hopefully that will stop the tsunami from happening or whatever. G1 logic at its finest. Now, I know I've gone on a lot about the pseudoscience in the show, but one part of me just can't help that a kid got inspired from this and wanted to become a scientist. And then he realised that that's not how it works. I'm not certain, but for the moment, I feel we must not let the boy find out. Find out what? Spike? I'm afraid you're adopted. 
The Autobots find out that Sparkplug is on Cybertron, so they get a small group of Autobots and they jet off to Cybertron to go and rescue him. And this is actually Spike's first time on Cybertron as well, so it's pretty neat because unfortunately last time Chip was the first one to go to Cybertron, you would have wanted it to have been Spike, and he's actually the last person out of the main group to go. And I've just got to say, the way how part 2 ends is just animation gold. Alright, now we've got the Ultimate Doom Part 3, and we've got the Autobots surfing. Yep, that's it. That's all you need to know about this episode, really. I would literally bump this episode higher just because of this scene. Oh, it's just so comical. You see, it's nice to see more Autobots fine on Cybertron, and it's not something in the franchise we actually get an awful lot of. I mean, it's the main reason why the High Moon Cybertron games are so beloved, and why everyone went nuts over the opening scene for Bumblebee. I mean, what else we got in this episode? We've got Dr. Archieville and then Starscream teaming up. It's an alright pairing. You know, they both hate Megatron, so it makes sense. But it doesn't really go anywhere. But that'll be set up for a future episode. I just want to note one good sound cue in this episode, and we never really hear it again. It's like Doctor Who vibes. But I am not. Also, the Decepticon Starship in this episode looks like a Transformer. Give me a toy of that. I love how when the Autobot saves Sparkplug, instead of just opening the door, Braun just bashes straight through it. I'll get the door! You know, I'm going to take a rest on talking about the Ultimate Doom, because I've got a friend who actually really likes this episode a lot. We have that toy guy. Hello, that's me. So the G1 episodes I like the best are the Ultimate Doom sets number one to three, but out of the three, I think the third one's my favorite. Just because of the action within it, I feel like it's probably got the best fluidity to its action. Like, it, it's a lot more solid. You can follow it. There's different varieties. There's dog fights. There's melee battles. There's blaster battles. It's a very fun episode to watch, and it ends with the plot of Dark of the Moon. So, that's pretty funny. I also really like how the entirety of the three-parter just sort of encompasses how Optimus Prime would definitely pick Cybertron over Earth. But then in the last episode, he's like, well, maybe that wasn't the best idea. And they send Cybertron just hurtling through space. It's the physics is hilarious. But that's why I like that episode. Thank you, random toy man that I found on the streets. Now, that was Dark of the Moon. Let's move on to the next episode. Next up, we've got episode 14, Countdown to Extinction. This might as well be a four-parter to the Ultimate Doom because it carries on right after it. And that's why I really like Season 1, it has a much tighter grip on continuity. And it's actually really cool to see the amount of destruction caused by Cybertron being in the Earth's atmosphere. I mean, we only made it 14 episodes before the Transformers destroyed nearly the whole planet. Hey, we got Frenzy's first appearance in the series, so Frenzy is red. Repeat, Frenzy is red. I don't know what Skywalk's problem is in this episode, he really does not like small bots. And carrying on from the last episode, we have Starscream and Dr. Archieville teaming up. I, Dr. Archieville, genius of science, say, open sesame! How original. Okay, maybe this is better than I remembered. So basically, the plot of this episode is that Starscream wants to destroy the whole planet. It's basically as simple as it gets. You know, I'm really glad that this is Doc Tarkyville's last episode, but as a kid I always felt like he was in more episodes of G1, but he only appears in three. And to be fair, what happens to him at the end of this episode, he just becomes an absolute cabbage. I really wish I went more with his backstory and kind of made him a bit more interesting. I mean, the guy just vanishes at the end of the episode. They could have done something really interesting with him, like they could have had him like control a part of Cybertron, or build his own like kind of robot army on Cybertron. Like that would have been really cool. But I can only imagine the worst thing happened to him. He just got stomped on. I now lead the Decepticons. What? I love how Megatron's grand plan on stopping the Autobots is trapping them in quicksand. <laughs> I know you Autobots know how to tread water, but it's not quite the same in sand. <laughs> also, I love this little twirl he does while he's flying. Gives him a bit more of a glow. Also, this is the episode where Optimus says the thing. Hey, Optimus, how'd you like to hear number one on the Decepticon hot cassette charts? As I believe the Earthlings say, lay it on me, man. You got it. Let's hear what laser beak tape. I 
In this episode, I think Optimus Prime actually borrowed Mirage's teleport ability. Optimus Prime woke up that day and chose violence. So yeah, in short, Starscream's plan is forward. But hey, at least we get to see Optimus Prime using Megatron as a gun. Now load me! Fire! What was... You'd think Megatron would definitely get rid of Starscream, but we see him in the next episode. But at least it ends like this. <laughs> hey, Prime! What do you think Megatron's gonna do to Starscream? Nothing gentle, I would say. That's what he said. Right, guys, because of gay? <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we've got episode 15, A Plague of Insecticons. Reports of giant insects terrorizing Bali lead to the Decepticons to discover their long-lost comrades, the Insecticons. So the new characters we have here are Shrapnel, Bombshell, and Kickback. They landed on Earth not long after the Autobots and Decepticons, because they tell us that they followed them when they left Cybertron. But when they crash landed, they were awake, and as time went on, they just adapted to the insect biology. And you know, as a concept, that's actually pretty cool, and I think they executed pretty well in this episode. I mean, we got a few good scenes of the Insecticons just terrorizing people of Bali, and I just can't help but feel sorry for all these people. Monsters? What are they talking about? Ah! Oh dear. At first, it makes you think there's only just three of them, but that there's actually dozens of them. Something that kind of becomes a main staple in the franchise. Just an excuse for more cannon fodder, I guess. We got a lot of good moments in this episode, such as Optimus Prime getting sick of Sideswipes digging, so he just rams straight through rock. And I just can't get over how Optimus Prime just launches brawn at the Insecticons. Give me a toss, Optimus. I want to teach that bug a lesson. Go get him, Brawn! Gotcha, beetle brain! They just treat him like this indestructible object. The logic on how they defeat the Insecticons is a little bit baffling. Like, oh yes, transform and your rubber tires will protect you, but what about the rest of you? I think it was just an excuse to get Optimus Prime rolling on Brawn and Ironhide. The bizarreness of Optimus Prime is on full force this episode. I mean, Optimus Prime literally throws an oil tanker at Megatron. Megatron! Catch! You know, when you see how strong he is, you just don't know how he died in the movie. But yeah, overall, this episode was fine. It adds more to the mythology and makes the Transformers more interesting. I've always really loved the Insecticon's voice as well. Just this echo effect really makes him feel unique. Something's going to explode. Now it's time for the next episode. Episode, episode. Now we've got episode 16, Heavy Metal War, where Megatron challenges Octopus Prime to a one-on-one -on -one battle to end the war. Spoiler alert, it doesn't end. It will never end. This is also the episode where we get introduced to the Constructicons that form into a combiner called Devastator. Now, according to Megatron, they built them on Earth, but this gets retconged like twice in the series, and it's like hard to really keep up at this point. I'll explain a little bit later on when we get to those episodes. But Megatron needs the Constructicons to dig a tunnel underground to distract Teratron 1 from detecting that he's cheating. So yeah. Megatron devises a plan to cheat his way of winning against Octopus Prime and uses all of the Decepticon powers. And apparently according to Cybertronian lore that whoever wins this fight has to leave the planet in sense of honour. I think it's kind of funny how Starscream is so concerned at first with Megatron cheating and talks about the ethics of it. It's like, alright dude, when did you start caring about the lore? It's weird to hear Octopus Prime kind of accept the deal because it's like, wait, in the Ultimate Doom you literally let half of the planet get destroyed by Cybertron, wouldn't you think you kind of would have wisened up on your morals a little bit that despite Cybertronian lore, you're not going to allow Megatron to conquer the planet? To be honest, a lot of stuff happens in this episode just to get all new characters fighting each other, such as the Dinobots, which go up against Devastator. And I like this fight, it's really well animated. Oh yeah, we also have Chip in this episode, we got all three main human characters together, and they really don't do anything in this episode, they're just there for kind of moral support. Doesn't this remind you of the gladiatorial combats in ancient Rome? Maybe it would if I knew what you were talking about. It's Earth history, Ironhide. Don't worry, Chip. The Transformers will adapt this in future incarnations of a franchise where Megatron will be known as a gladiator. I love how Soundwave strokes Ravage. Also, why the hell have we never got a toy of this hologram character that Hound creates? Like, this actually looks pretty cool. I totally forgot he existed until re-watching this. You know, for a season 1 finale, this episode was actually really good. It's basically the main premise of every Michael Bay movie. Action. And you know, that's okay sometimes. Sometimes. I'm like a fat ballerina, but 
take scalps and slit throats. The Transformers will return after these messages. So this is my ranking of Season 1. As you can see, Fire in the Sky is the best episode. For me, it just has a lot more of emotional weight and adds a lot of depth to the characters. You know, it's not just a simple good guy versus bad guy episode. My least favourite has got to be the Countdown to Extinction, just because I was sick and tired of Dr. Archiville already. Like, I just wanted him to go. And Starscream's kind of like revenge plot on Megatron was just a little bit of a waste of time. But overall, I like Season 1 mostly for its consistency. You got a few continuity errors near and there, but something that's easily overlooked. I think it's helped mostly because of the characters all sticking together because they kind of just disperse and separate when it comes to season 2. And it seems like season 1 characters seem to get all their little moments in the spotlight. Now we're going to move on to season 2, but I've decided to split them up into two parts, just like how I used to watch them with the DVDs growing up. It just makes the ranking just a little bit more easier, and well, it's a big season, 49 episodes. So, without further ado, let's dive straight into season 2. We now return to the Transformers. Now before we begin, I want to talk about the season 2 opening, which is just amazing. I love this opening so much. It's so kind of random and wackiness, but really well shot at the same time. And I like the soundtrack. The soundtrack is a much better improvement over season 1. I always felt like season 1's was a bit too corny, but season 2 felt a bit more badass. And I like how there's just random characters coming out of nowhere. Of course, this was for the 1985 line. I mean, they just don't make Transformers intros like they used to. This was gold. We have episode 17, Autobot Spike. And oh my god, this episode's terrifying. The episode begins with Sparkplug being psychotic. He basically wants to build a Frankenstein Autobot monster, and of course it goes horribly wrong. I can't tell who's more insane in this scene, either Sparkplug or Wheeljack, because you could tell that Ratchet's scared to even help. Ratchet and I'll help. You know. Uh, no thanks, uh, no. So this episode is where Spike gets injured, and I kind of like how it gets mirrored in the future with Transmus Prime with Bornby and Raph. But when Spike gets taken to the hospital, I cannot believe an actual doctor said this. Hmm, if only there were a way of separating Spike's mind from his body while we work. You're a medical professional. Doctor, maybe there is a way. What is wrong with you? So Spike goes berserk, and Megatron gets wind of this and plots to manipulate him against the Autobots. And during the episode, Spike is actually watching a Frankenstein movie. Okay, whose smart idea was it to put this movie on? Okay, so I know Spike's having a hard time being an Autobot, and despite this situation being incredibly messed up, I'd love to be an Autobot. But I guess the transfusion kind of made it a bit more crazy for him. But overall, I actually really like this episode, despite how wild and crazy it is. It's just peak Generation 1 randomness, really. In fact, they actually mentioned something in the end that actually sounds more interesting than this plot. I wonder what it'd be like for a robot mind to be transferred to a human. We'll get to that one later. Next up we've got episode 18, Changing Gears. In a plot to drain the sun for power, the Decepticons capture and alter a grumpy Autobot Gears. Wait, hang on, I've also watched that movie. We've got another episode where the Transformers nearly destroy the whole planet. I love how this episode begins with Ben's dreams just being immediately crushed by the Decepticons. We're rich! We're rich gold! <laughs> Also, I just want to go on a rant on how the Decepticon insignia is drawn throughout the whole series of G1. Like, it's got three points when it should have just two. Now, you can tell they did this because the animators assumed there was three due to the transition card, and this boils me to the core. Whoever did this to us will hear from all of us! Now, one thing I find remarkable about this episode is that they made a single episode about Gears. They had so many Autobots, but they chose Gears out of all of them. Now, don't get me wrong, I actually think Gears is an entertaining character. I actually like how he is in this episode, like his attitude. It's very relatable. Happy to be of service. I wish I wasn't, but I am. What did you do to Gears, you monster? You turned him nice! Come on Hasbro, more justice for Gears. Where's he gone? I want more Gears. But the fact that they just like, he's got a special circuit and they're gonna use him to fulfill their plan of draining energy from the sun. It's just like, why Gears? It's just hilarious how this episode inspired Revenge of the Fallen. Like, okay Paramount, if you're gonna borrow from this episode, you could have at least included Gears. 
but yeah, the only thing I like about this episode is Gears' personality. And it's quite unfortunate that he doesn't do anything this significant ever again throughout the entire franchise. Also, you gotta love how they saved the Earth on just blind luck. Ah, you got a blowout in your binary circuit. It's that one. Whoa. Keep your fingers crossed. Episode 19, City of Steel. The Decepticons invade New York. I actually hate this episode, but mostly for the animation. So the animation studio this time around is by Acom. Now they only animated a few episodes of season two, but they would mostly cover episodes of season three. Now up to this point, the episodes have been animated by Toei Animation, which actually did a rather consistent job on the animation style, but I cannot for the life of me stand Acom's animation style all the characters suddenly look off model, a lot of things get recycled non-stop. I mean, I just hate this animation style. Everybody just looks ugly. This reminds me of like the old Justice League cartoon. I know this is probably going to sound way too harsh, but I just always feel sick watching an Acom episode. The Empire State Building is sinking! Animation gold. But yeah, this is like one of the first badly animated Transformers episodes, and when it comes to the plot, I gotta say I'm not so keen on it either. It's not the best. I mean, we have Optimus Prime get dissected, and then his body parts are used for a crocodile. Yes, literally a crocodile. We have Crocodile Optimus Prime. I want to destroy- dissect this thing now. The episode is essentially a scavenger hunt, where the Autobots have to go out and find missing body parts of Optimus Prime. I can sense the presence of my legs. They're nearby. Do you think you could activate them from here? <sighs> One of Optimus Prime's missing body parts is his arm with his rifle attached to it, used as a surveillance drone on one of the buildings. Megatron's turned it into one big fortress. Wheeljack, look. I think we just found Prime's missing arm. This episode is just too on the nose with its references, like we've got Devastator climbing a building, which is just a nod to King Kong. Like, Wheeljack even says that in the episode. I mean, we have our first appearance of Buzzsaw, which is pretty cool. Also, Sideswipe is able to fly once again without his jetpack. Say uncle, or I'll shove your nose in your afterburner! Uncle! Gee, <laughs> I didn't know Decepticons had uncles! Okay, maybe this episode isn't all bad. I know I'm going pretty hard on this episode, but I, I just don't have an affection for it. Every time I see it, I just skip it. It's just not one of my favorites. I mean, I just don't get it, guys. I, I can't believe they made a whole game based on this episode. <laughs> Next up, we've got episode 20, Attack of the Autobots, and this episode would serve inspiration for the Transformers Last Night movie. I mean, it probably wasn't, but let's just say that it was. After a surprise attack from the Decepticons, the Autobots repair themselves in their regenerated chambers, only to emerge as evil. So we've got another genius plot by Megatron, and actually this is actually a pretty fun episode. I mean, I don't always like it when the heroes get turned into the villains, unless if it's done creatively, and this was pretty simple. I mean, at this point, Teletron 1 is literally the worst security system ever. Even when Megatron plants the device into the repair chamber, you'd have thought it would have picked it up or something, but it only picks it up after the fact. The episode is mostly about this solar power satellite that Megatron wants to get his hands on, and he's using the Autobots to get hold of it. And we have a doctor here that has those plans, and when the Autobots come after her, she just launches herself out of the window. Like, wow, this guy's like Wonder Woman. You know, a small thing I like about this series is when the Transformers just burst through walls just out of nowhere. We're going to have to abort the launch. I wouldn't if I were you. So Sparkplug invents this attitude exchanger, which stops the Autobots from being evil. You know, if something like this could be built so easily, why would they not just put these on the Decepticons so they could end the war? I mean, the Decepticons weren't born evil, right? You know, I'm going to stop trying to look for solutions when it comes to some of these episodes. <laughs> Another one. Christ, thank God she was not in the first one. You know, I actually kind of like this episode, and I like that there was a solution found kind of pretty quickly, so it didn't drag on for so long. 
And another good highlight of this episode is Jazz. Anytime he shows up, I just smile. Plus, he's got some pretty killer tunes in this episode. Time to get down! And we get that wholesome moment between Octopus Prime and Bumblebee, which is kind of like the main starting point of their strong friendship throughout the franchise. You did it, little friend. You saved me. Episode 21, Traitor. Cliffjumper suspects that Mirage has betrayed the Autobots. Now this episode is fun and does something kind of interesting, but it kind of gets a bit tedious and annoying pretty quick, mostly because of Cliffjumper, just the way how he goes so hard on Mirage, it's like, dude, chill out, please, we need more evidence. I just love how this episode begins with the Decepticons immediately blowing something up. They could explode at any moment! Decepticons! Also, I'm pretty sure Megatron just murdered everyone in this building. No way were there just only two people. I like the way how Mirage is actually written in this episode, though. I feel like they did a better job on this character-centered episode with Mirage more than Gears. Cliffjumper judges Mirage purely based on the fact that he didn't pick up the Decepticons when he was on patrol last. I've located the missing Electro cells. Good work, Cliffjumper. Where? In the same area Mirage patrolled yesterday. Impossible! I'd have picked up a reading on them for sure! Maybe you did, but decided to keep it quiet. That'll do, Cliffjumper. We don't want bad feelings. Like, they're supposed to be Autobots, I don't understand why he would judge him so quickly. I felt like this episode wanted to make Mirage actually a Decepticon, but decided last minute to change it, like, because they lean in pretty forward with the idea throughout the rest of the episode. But yeah, anyway, Starscream calls Cliffjumper Papa. Come to Papa! Not so fast, Papa! But anyway, Mirage has a plan to set the Decepticons against the Insecticons. So yeah, we got the Insecticons back in this episode, but Bombshell is the one who's primarily featured, due to his brand new device that when it's screwed into your head, you're brainwashed. And unfortunately, Mirage falls victim to this, which makes Cliffjumper more convinced that he is a traitor. Despite the plot kind of being backwards and forwards, like I said, I do actually really like this one. And the ending is actually pretty fun as well when you actually see Cliffjumper and Mirage get along with each other. So if we had to go through Cliffjumper's bullshit just to get the scene that we wanted at the end, then it was worth it. <laughs> I think I have a hole in my head that needs repairing too! You what? <laughs> and that, people of Earth, is what we call a ship. Episode 22, The Immobilizer, a weapon so powerful that it can freeze anything. And halfway through the episode, Wheeljack gets immobilized by his own device, thanks to Spike. To be honest, I just love how calm Octopus Prime is when it happens, like he's so used to it at this point. Wheeljack's been immobilized! He's frozen solid! What are we gonna do? I don't know. I mean, you'd think at this point that Octopus Prime wouldn't allow Wheeljack to invent anything anymore because at some point it always blows up in their face. The Decepticons manage to get their hands on it, but this episode is mostly centred on Ironhide. See, now Ironhide is one of my favourite characters, and he's also voiced by Peter Cullen. You know, it's always baffled me why Peter Cullen has never voiced Ironhide in future incarnations. It's a good voice, I miss it to be honest. Now I like how this episode really does explore Ironhide, how he feels like an old man where he doesn't feel like he's good enough in the fight anymore because he mistakes Hound's hologram of Laserbeak for being real. I mean, that's a fair mistake, you know, he's actually way too hard on himself in this episode. Later on in the episode, Octopus Prime tells him to guard his post so the Decepticons don't sneak up on him, but unfortunately he gets distracted by a new human character called Carly, and that one mistake leads him to retire as an Autobot. I'm retired from active service, Prime. Very well, if you feel that strongly about it. But we shall miss you, Ironhide, old friend. I miss you already. To be fair, the only people to blame in this episode is actually Spike and Carly. They become such a nuisance. What happened in the forest wasn't your fault, it was mine. Maybe. <laughs> Basically, yeah. But oh yeah, we got a new character called Carly, who becomes Spike's love interest throughout the whole series. And the only sin she committed was giving birth to their son, Daniel. More on him later. Now you wouldn't assume they would become romantic from their first scene together. Uh, Bumblebee, remember Wheeljack's polarizer? We should have been- Ew, God, what happened to his elbow? That's literally disgusting. I find it funny how you can't tell if he's being jealous over Carly or Bumblebee. So she conveniently bumps into him at an arcade. Oh my God, what's happening with that kid? He's having a fit. 
Now, one of the many reasons why I remember this episode so well is because of the animation of the police officer. So they drive out of the arcade, and oh my god, this gets me every time. Uh oh, we've got a problem. <laughs> oh, that face. Oh my god, I love it. But yeah, Carly's introduction kind of treats her like a stalker. She's very persistent on me and the Autobots. Like, I don't know, she kind of gives me creepy vibes. But to be fair, they do kind of transform Carly's character from being annoying to kind of a badass. Like, she does actually try and redeem herself after what she did. But what I find funny is how bold some of these human characters are. Like, they have no fear at all. You know, I actually really like the bond between Carly and Ironhide in the end. They're a good pair together. I just feel happy for Ironhide. He's finally proved himself once again as a good warrior. See, look, he's finally happy for doing so- Oh, never mind. But yeah, I like the way how the Decepticons are defeated in this episode. Jazz's music. Okay, folks, it's showtime! Now we have episode 23, the Autobot Run. When the Autobots race for charity, the Decepticons take this opportunity to trap them in the vehicle modes. Now, as a premise, it actually sounds pretty good. And you know, out of all the ACOM episodes, this one is not bad. Story-wise. Animation. It's vomit. Once again, like I said with the previous ACOM episode, everybody looks ugly. There's always something unnerving of how they animate the humans as well. It feels like they just went back 10 years. Like this was made in the 70s or something. So the Decepticons build a device called the Transfixitron. And honestly, I just love the way how we transition into the Wild West. Constructicons, attention! When will you complete the Transfixitron? You know, it'd be cool if you had a Wild West-centered episode, but they're just kind of out here for no reason. So Megatron needs to test out his device, and who better than Starscream? Hmm, perhaps I should leave you as a jet plane forever! You can't leave me like this! The Autobots banter is also good in this episode. Like, the idea that they actually want to get out and do this for charity is actually quite funny. <laughs> Just a waste of time and energy if you ask me. Who's asking you, party pooper? You know, at this point we're used to the Octopus Prime animation by Toei, but Acom's attempt to transform Octopus Prime... Yeah, I'm kind of missing the Toei transformation now. Another painful error is Shockwave being on Earth when he should be on Cybertron. And then we've got the infamous shot with Megatron and the boys. I feel like the best part of this episode is the first half, and then the second half kind of drags on a little bit. I mean, at one point when we're trying to figure out how to fix the Autobots, Terrestrial 1 just comes up with this random robot. And wow, okay, as a British person, I find that disgusting. I mean, if everybody just listened to Huffer, none of this would have happened. I knew the racing bit was bad news, but would anybody listen to me? Oh no! Ugh! Stifle it, Huffer, or I'll put my footy -o in your audio! I wish Braun was my friend at school. But yeah, this episode was fine. It gave us some good Sunstreaker moments, and then it also gave us this ugly claw-looking thing. And we've got Chip. Well... Think fast! Now, if I can just get close enough to the Autobots... Wait, I think Chip just died. Oh no, never mind, he just lied about being disabled. Right, next up we've got episode 24, Atlantis Arise. The Decepticons ally with the undersea realm of Sub-Atlantica, but they become more treacherous than Megatron expected. This is the episode where the Autobots are boiling. Yeah, so I could care less about the frog-looking men plot that happens in this episode. Oh, I can't stand the sound they make. Shut up. Just shut the f- It's really just all the obscure stuff the Transformers do that makes this episode really worth it. He communicates telepathically. His mental power is great. But not as great as my firepower! Ah! To be honest, this episode's only worth it to watch the Autobots play football. Hut one! Hut two! Hike! I don't know what it is, but seeing Generation 1 characters play football is just so wholesome to me. Like, it's the only show that really gets away with it. I gotta love how Megatron is so respectful of US statues. I mean, this is completely different to how it was in Dark of the Moon. This isn't an episode you really remember, you just kind of sit back and watch and just let it all happen, even if you don't really know what's going off. 
But I will give this episode credit for being vastly different. Like, this is the first time we get an introduction to these, like, mythical creatures, which we'll get a lot more of in future episodes, which kind of unbalances the show a little bit. But, I mean, hey, this is a groundbreaking human discovery. Another civilization lives within the sea, and, of course, the Transformers immediately destroy it. Atlantica now joins Atlantis in the midst of legend. Also, this animation error. Now we have episode 25, Day of the Machines. Megatron's latest scheme involves using the most powerful computer on Earth to control machinery remotely. Illegal access, illegal access. Oh my god, it needs to die. So yeah, we've got this thing here. I mean, who on Earth would design a machine like this? Honestly, this planet just gets even weirder going into season two. But hey, at least for once the Decepticons are trying to use espionage instead of just blowing up the place. Seriously, Megatron hiding in a guitar case is just comical. Genius. Now the reason why this scientist decides to make this highly advanced supercomputer is to make robot cabinets. I'm not making this up. What if the wrong people got control of him? Man's future depends on the development of sophisticated machines. Robot file cabinets. Hmm. I just love how he gets immediately warned about it being into wrong hands and the next minute it gets into the wrong hands and he is, he's not even shocked. I control Quantum Labs now. Torque has seized command? But how can that be? You're an idiot! This episode is literally just the Autobots trying to stop this machine. It's pretty much worth it just to hear Octopus Prime say this one line. It's a safe bet those doors are locked. Fortunately, I have a delicate lock-picking technique. Genius. Actually, you know, we're full of geniuses in this episode. I think it's pretty sweet how Talk made a cameo when Trance was animated. I mean, yeah, whatever. This thing just reminds me of Modok. Next up, we've got episode 26, Enter the Nightbird. Finally, a good episode. So the Decepticons capture this deadly ninja bot called Nightbird, and they turn her loose on the Autobots. So in this episode, we have a famous scientist called Dr. Fujiyama. And trust me, he's really famous. Optimus Prime, come quickly, it's Dr. Fujiyama, the famous scientist! He wants the Autobots to be at the unveiling of his brand new creation, just in case the Decepticons try and get their hands on it. My curiosity is aroused. We will come, Doctor. Whoa, 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 calm down, Prime. Hang on, what? If it walks, it probably needs a long extension cord. <laughs> I wonder if batteries are included. <laughs> uh, hey guys, remember when you give the Dinobots literally dinosaur brains? Not very smart, were you? So the thing that gets me about Nightbird is that he states that she's not meant for battle or assassinations. But the thing is, she looks absolutely lethal. She's got weapons all over. So come on, Dr. Fujiyama, who are you fooling? Throughout the episode, she's got, like, weapons hidden as well. It's like, okay, yeah, this girl's really powerful. She's a tough robot. She was definitely meant for assassinations. So, of course, the Decepticons attack. And, you know, there's actually really good fighting in this episode. We get to see Mirage use his invisibility. We've got Blue Streak even taking a bullet for Prime. It's actually a pretty good action sequence. Well, until the Decepticons use a can opener to open the dome. I don't think that's how it works. I love the Decepticons' new base, by the way. Like, yeah, that doesn't give it away. <laughs> it's literally right on the nose. The main highlight of this episode really is sort of Megatron's infatuation with this machine. Like he's really impressed with Nightbird. Terrific! <laughs> She's everything I've always wanted. She looks like some earthling play puppet. Yes, but this puppet has a punch. And it's just hilarious to see Starscream get extremely jealous because he's scared of being replaced by her. Replace me? Poor Starscream, he must have a lot of insecurities if he thinks he could be replaced that easily. <laughs> but yeah, I like this episode overall. You know, the Autobots are having more of a challenge with Nightbird than they ever have with the Decepticons. And it's really interesting that a human invented this. It wasn't something designed by Megatron. And it'd take a few years, but we finally have a toy of Nightbird. You know, she's actually a very popular character within the Transformers franchise. I hope we get to see more of her someday. I would give for anything to hear Optimus Prime say this in the movies. was playing Roboto Possum. Also, there's a moment in this episode where Cliff Jumper can't jump a cliff. Now that's just false advertising. 
Next up we got episode 27, A Crime Problem. This is where Megatron creates a clone of Optimus Prime to lure the Autobots to their doom. I really like this episode, and I cannot for the life of me explain why. It is a Wind Charger episode and an Optimus Prime episode. And like I mentioned earlier, Wind Charger is one of my favourite characters. I don't know what it is about him, it's just this particular episode, I guess it's because he's like one of the most obscure characters. They brought a season 1 character into the spotlight, and I don't know, something about that is just kind of magical about G1, that they are able to take these obscure characters and create a whole plot around them. To be fair, I think that's a bit of a problem with modern Transformers, they're always trying to focus on Bumblebee and Optimus Prime and the mainline characters, like bring back a random character like uh, Trailbreaker and make an episode about him. You know why we love this brand so much? It's because we like all the characters, not just a select few. So in this episode we've got Colonium Raw Crystals which apparently are the most lethal form of energy ever and they happen to be on Earth. But like the Plague and Insecticons episode, they realise that they can be okay as long as they've got tyres. Yes, tyres. This is why I love this episode, it's just so obscure. What is it with Megatron with temporary bases at the minute? We had it with the last episode with the Decepticon insignia and now we've got a ship. So, you remember in the Ultimate Doom where Megatron had a clone of Optimus Prime? Well, it baffles me how he has to scan Optimus Prime once again in this episode, because somehow Laserbeak manages to shoot Prime down. I love how when every time Megatron reveals a clone of Optimus Prime, the Decepticons just assume it's the real Optimus Prime. Like, do you not know what the plan is? Excellent! The Fallen Gladiator is very photogenic! Wait, aren't you the Gladiator? I'm pretty sure Optimus Prime was just a nerd before he met you. And I just love how daft Megatron's controller helmet looks, like it was actually included in the Masterpiece toy. So as the real Optimus Prime wakes up from his hangover, the clone Optimus Prime has infiltrated the Autobot base, and it gets off to a fine start. Bumblebee, I'm speaking to you. You talking to me? Of course. But uh, I'm not Bumblebee, I'm Ironhide Prime. But you all look alike. Einheit gets offended that much that the clone Optimus Prime forgot his name, but when the real Optimus Prime shows up at their doorstop, he hesitates on firing at him. With the Autobots unsure on which Prime is a real Prime, they set up a few tests that is supposed to prove which Prime is a real one. The first one they come up with is firing at a rock. Sure. The next test they do is racing. Transform! Gee, even their transforms are the same. Yeah, no shit. Also, something a bit obscure, I've always loved how Trailbreaker was drawn in this shot. Like, wow, that's actually a really cool design. We've also got some great comedy between Megatron and Starscream. To convince the Autobots that their Prime is a real Prime, they'll have it destroy one of their own. And of course, who's gonna volunteer? Which is why I've decided on... you. I? Starscream? Ah, uh, Starscream, do you want to play Call of Duty? You know, actually, I've just realised, Laserbeak is probably one of the strongest Decepticons on the team. Like, no matter who it is, he's able to shoot everyone down. I feel like this G1 episode is the best animated episode. Like, all the characters are on model, and the animation is so fluent. Oh wait, never mind. The ending of this episode was a big step for the franchise, where they actually ended up killing the real Optimus Prime. Oh wait, never mind, that comes much later. Oh yeah, we've got two new Autobots as well in this episode. We have Powerglide, who saves Spike from falling, and then we have Warpath, with no lines at all. He... he's dropped Spike! From one ship? How, Peter? How did you get that name wrong? Next up, we've got episode 28, The Core. Megatron tries to drill his way to the centre of the Earth, because he's being really smart in this episode. The Autobots take control of Devastator, however, with a mind-controlling Dominator disc. So we've got a lot of things going off in this episode, and it's another ACOM episode. So like I mentioned before, <laughs> there's a fair amount of plot holes in this episode. Okay, so the Autobots want to control Devastator for reasons I don't know why, and then somehow Megatron knows what they're up to? I mean, the group of Autobots in this episode was actually kind of fun to see, but I kind of wish Jazz was leading them instead of like Sunstreaker most of the time. I mean, it does deliver on some comedy gold with Megatron and Starscream. Perfect vengeance at last! Let them go! What? Traitor! I think the biggest offender out of these ACOM episodes is the way how they draw Megatron. It is just so incredibly gross. I hate it. It's so... Oh, God. Just get it away. Surprisingly, though, Spike isn't in this episode. That makes for a change. To be honest, the only main highlights of this episode is Devastator just throwing a bunch of Autobots around. 
And then you've got the Autobots and Decepticons teaming up, and Megatron just absolutely hates it. And then you've got the heartwarming quote with Optimus Prime at the end that I think a lot of kids actually found inspiring. I guess I was hoping Devastator might join the Autobots for good, but that's probably just a dumb old dream. Hang on to your dreams, Chip. The future is built on dreams. Hang on. That's a stupid dream, Chip. Episode 29 being Insecticon Syndrome. In this episode, we have the Insecticons feeding on a source of power which makes them grow bigger. And if they don't find a cure, it will cause them to explode. We have another episode now that introduces brand new characters. And the first one is Beachcomber. I like Beachcomber. He's one of my favorite characters. And I'm not talking termites. I'm talking big creatures. Real big. He smokes weed. He's basically a hippie. That's not why I like him. It's just because he's all about peace and love. And that's like, you know, a cool thing to have an Autobot be a pacifist. It's actually kind of an interesting concept. It's not because of the weed. I'm promising you. I meet you down at the big yellow joint. So the Autobots discover that the Insecticons have been eating trees, and I think this is actually the fastest transition to the next scene, not just in the Transformers franchise, but I actually think in cartoon history. Gigantic robot insects that eat trees? You've gotta be kidding! We've also got a new Autobot as well in this episode called Inferno, and well, he's basically just too busy foaming everybody in this episode. And you got Spike as well, he's finally got his own gun. To be honest, the only thing weird in this episode was actually seeing the insides of Ironhide's arm. So the Insecticons and Decepticons are not getting along at all in this episode, and it actually makes for a really great comedy. In the episode, the Insecticons have pretty much mind-controlled half of Megatron's troops. They started out with Soundwave. I like this one line of Megatron, that's actually pretty badass. No one gets into my chamber. And this leads to Optimus Prime and Megatron teaming up. We once again have Optimus Prime using Megatron in his gun form. Honestly, at this rate, it's just becoming a tradition. Also, I think Spike's been hitting the gym. He is absolutely insane in this episode. Optimus, no! <laughs> what can I say? Modern Transformers shows just don't have human characters like they used to. Episode 30, Dinobot Island Part 1. So the Autobots make a monumental discovery. Dinosaurs on a prehistoric island. They're just flying by and they just discover it by chance. And instead of telling the world about it because, well, this is a significant discovery, they just use it as an excuse to throw the Dinobots on it to get rid of them. Just because they've been a bit too chaotic around the base recently. And I swear, Huffer has it out for Wheeljack here. But lately I've been teaching them to use their powers with a little more finesse. Brilliant baloney, Wheeljack. Once a dino clutch, always a dino clutch. But go ahead with your demonstration, it'll only prove my point. <coughs> you, Huffer. And with the idea of a dinosaur island, Spike gets excited and wants to go see it. And Optimus will give any excuse at this point to just get rid of all of them. Now Spike, you've got to be really creative here. This is a dinosaur island. Give some creative names. What kind of ideas you've got for this monumental discovery? Oh wow! I think I'll call it Dinobot Island. So Spike in this episode is every archaeologist's worst nightmare. He goes wandering around for just two seconds and immediately gets picked up by a pterodactyl and holy shit, how big are those eggs? Oh my god, that's scary. Then Swoop comes to the rescue, and it literally takes five seconds for this to happen again. It's unreal! <laughs> Let go! <Help! laughs> oh my god. This is literally why I love this episode, just because of that one scene. <laughs> oh, Spike. Oh, you idiot. Despite being a pain in the ass, he does actually say something that's pretty funny. Goodbye! Bye, guys! I'd write, but uh, you can't read! Hmm, I wonder how long it'll take Megatron to figure out he can make energy out of this island. <sighs> a raw and primitive place! And an energy paradise ripe for plundering! So I haven't got really anything to say about part one except for this happens at the end, and I want to know which of the riders was on acid. Run out of error. 
Now we've got part two. I don't actually remember anything from this episode and I've just watched it. Seriously, we have so much wacky stuff going off. We've got mammoths, bikers, cowboys with lasers, and then pirates that I, I don't even want to get into it. It's just weird stuff, right? And I'm pretty sure the writer of this episode, Donald Glut, was on acid. Like, I don't know how else to explain it. I mean, a mammoth fits in Optimus Prime's trailer. How? How is this possible? That is not possible. And we've got a load of new characters just kind of launching our faces. We've got Coneheads, we've got Dirge, Ramjet Frost, Perceptor, Sea Spray, Blitzwing, Warpath, and Smokescreen. And my favourite one of all, Trax. I'd rather stay in my stunning auto mode. You're going to be hearing a lot of that in this video. And these new characters, well, some of them are new. Most of the designs are based on season 1 designs, but they've been touched up and remoulded ever so slightly, but just given like a different colour scheme. New package, same product, losers. No explanation is given as to where they came from. I mean, do we really need an explanation? Let's just say they travelled from Cybertron to Earth. It's just that simple, really. So basically, Megatron's plan causes the volcano on Dinobot Island to start erupting, and the Autobots go over to go and save it. Well, you know, we'd get the jetpacks because obviously these guys can't fly anymore. And this is kind of like the first time we get to see the brand new characters in action. <laughs> Like, I hope we don't destroy this place before we can study it. Oh, Beachcomber. It's not that kind of show. It was fun to see the Decepticons actually get tossed around by real dinosaurs, but honestly, the drastic errors in this episode are just stellar. Episode 32, The Master Builder. We have Grapple and Hoist. Brand new characters get their own centered episode. And when an invention doesn't get approved, they ally themselves with constructor cons. Also, this is the episode where Optimus Prime's balling. <laughs> Am I drooling correctly? The word is dribbling, Optimus! Look at this! Here, Spike, compute quickly! That's literally wild of this episode. Oh, oh, Gary! Of course you need feeding right now, don't you? Okay, so I'm gonna go feed that little tyrant. I'll get Ferrimus to cover this episode because I know this is one of his personal favorites. I'll be right there, Gary. One of my favorite episodes of Transformers Generation 1 is the episode The Master Builders. I love this episode because it has a lot of fun moments in it, especially when Optimus Prime is playing basketball and dunking on the bots. He shoots, he scores, what a star! Watch out, Spike! I'm driving for a layoff! It's called a layup, Prime! And watch out for tracks! Uh-oh! Sounds like it's time for a maintenance check, Trax. Though we have a soft spot for Bay vs. Optimus, his basketball skills cannot touch G1 Primes. I gotta go. Another highlight of this episode has to be Devastator, who has to be my second favorite character from this episode behind Optimus Prime. I find it funny how his size from shot to shot differs drastically. The best example of this has to be when the bots are driving up to Devastator and he is just towering over them. <laughs> I also find it funny how we can just swipe his arm and cause a giant gust of wind to hit the Autobots. A clever thing that the Autobots do to take down Devastator is to use his strength against him, which ultimately causes Devastator to destroy Hoist and Grapple's tower, making Megatron's plan of besting the Autobots fail once again. Another thing that I want to mention is that there is something kind of dark in this episode, especially for a kid's cartoon. You see, after Grapple and Hoist complete the tower with the help of the Constructicons, Megatron orders Devastator to seal the two Autobots in the tower. They were only saved after the Autobots were able to break them free from the rubble, meaning if the Autobots were unable to stop the Decepticons, Hoist and Grapple would have been trapped in their own creation that was now taken over by the Decepticons for all eternity. All because they were gullible, which is definitely a hell of a way to teach kids not to be gullible and to think twice before taking up an offer that seems too good to be true. Oh, Optimus. I'm so ashamed. Me too. Apologies accepted. Now we better get to headquarters for repairs. 
After which you'll return here to clean up this rubble by yourselves. Overall, I highly recommend this episode since it's just pure fun and it has something for everyone to enjoy, especially Optimus Prime dunking on the boys. Lastly, I want to thank Common and Cam for letting me be part of this collab. Right, so with that out of the way, let's talk about Auto Berserk. Another one of my personal favorite episodes. You're kidding me. Gary! <sighs> okay, now he wants to be let out. Who am I gonna get to talk about this episode? Ow! Ow. Fine, sure, yeah. Okay, fine. My favourite episode of Generation 1 has changed every month for the last several years, but for a while now I've settled on Auto Berserk being my absolute favourite. A Decepticon attack leaves Red Alert with a head injury so bad that it damages his logic circuits, uh, making him a paranoid wreck. Feeling betrayed by the Autobots, he runs away and allies himself with Starscream with the intention of stealing Wheeljack's new weapon, the Negavator. Stand aside, Red old buddy! You're safe now! Not so fast! Starscream's my partner! Red! You need help! I love everything about this setup. We've got the one and only Red Alert centric episode. We've got one of the many Starscream centric episodes. We've got scenes that the poor writer had no idea would become ship fuel many, many years later. It's cheesy and it's stupid and it makes no sense. It's the perfect G1 episode. All my favorite episodes of G1 happen to have three different components. Niche characters, bizarre logic, and weird stuff that goes completely unexplained. Auto Berserk has all of this in droves. Red Alert and Inferno are front and centre, two characters that barely show up again. An unfortunate side effect of this is that by being Red Alert's only highlight episode, everyone associates Red Alert with being a paranoid weirdo. You want to get rid of me, just like the others do. Mm, you're more damaged than I thought. <laughs> Even though that's really not what he is. In terms of bizarre logic, we have Rumble firing a missile down through a door along a winding corridor where it hits nobody along the way before colliding into Red Alert. Not to mention that the extent of the security of the Negavator consists of prison bars that literally anyone in the world could get through. Finally, for weird stuff that goes completely unexplained, we have the Tunnel Drone. While Starscream and Red Alert are sneaking through the vent drain thing, they encounter a creature known as the Tunnel Drone a gigantic robotic monster that Red Alert claims to be unstoppable. Quickly, before the tunnel drone gets here. The what? I don't want to die! No! The alarms! I worry about them later! Why is it there? Who built it? Why don't the Autobots bring it into battle? Who knows, I love it. My favorite moment in the whole episode has to be when the Seekers get completely screwed over and Megatron says, Quickly, the Negavator! You're too late, Prime! Next up, Oblivion! I've got morons on my team! Just a very honest moment of reflection from Megatron, really. Favorite animation error? It has to be this one right here where Optimus Prime's trailer clips over a building. It only adds to the godlike powers of that thing, it defies reality itself. The insanity and stupidity of G1 fluctuates throughout the show, but this episode is by far the most condensed amount of stupid nonsense, insane weird stuff and genuine plot. It's great. Come on Red, we'll take care of you. What's the matter? Can't you transform? Hey, that's my car! Put it back where you found it! Oh, sorry, Chief. It looked like a friend of mine. No two ways about it. I gotta take that vacation. Especially if you're one of those peeps that ship Red Alert and Inferno based off of this one episode. I, I mean, they're pretty cute. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to camp. Thanks for having me. Bye. Now, one thing that gets me about the Auto Berserk episode is just why exactly the Autobots, the peaceful Autobots, were working on such a highly destructive super weapon anyways. Like, I can't fault Red Alert for being a paranoid nut in this episode. This was essentially just Red Alert going through his goth phase. I can definitely imagine him being into My Chemical Romance, and I'm all for it. 
Now, the Negevator is one of Wheeljack's only really successful inventions. I can imagine some kids having an epileptic nightmare with this episode due to the abnormal amount of rapid flashing. Like, even I was, like, taken aback by it. Like, oh my god. I think secretly Wheeljack is evil because the only thing he succeeded in this episode was giving kids seizures. Episode 34, Microbots. Perceptor, Braun, and Bumblebee must shrink themselves to go inside Megatron to retrieve an artifact, the Heart of Cybertron. Yes, we got a shrinking episode, because every 80s cartoon did at that time. There's also the episode where the Decepticons get drunk. Get Cybertron! Land of the Metal Moon! You know, out of all things Michael Bay could have took from G1, I'm surprised he didn't do something like this. So in this episode, we have a bunch of archaeologists find the Decepticons' old ship. Yes, I'm 100% crushing on this girl because of her hair. So you know at this point, I really love Braun, but in this episode, he becomes a massive dick to Perceptor. It takes more than muscle to fight. Yeah, it takes courage. Or maybe that word's not in your fancy vocabulary. Leave him alone, Braun, or you're gonna tangle with me! Oh, I'm shaking in my proton boots. You know, I think it might be because Perceptor is really a Decepticon. I can't go. I've got too much to do here. Ha! That's a good one. It's not just Percept who gets bullied in this episode. On the Decepticon side, we also have Starscream receiving this treatment. Ah, help! Get this thing off me! Oh, oh. I think it looks stunning on you! <laughs> also, we have a scene here that has no relevance to the main plot whatsoever. We just have Ravage going up against a leopard. The Decepticons just hate nature in this episode. Nice scenery! Yeah, let's waste it. I hate nice things. Anyway, Megatron gets his hands on the heart of Cybertron, which is basically used to just fuel up their ships. But when you put it in yourself, you get enormous power, and Megatron just demolishes all of the Autobots. And the only plan that Perceptor seems to come up with to stop Megatron is to shrink to the size of an ant, go inside him, and violate his insides. I can only imagine what the scene would have turned out if Megatron actually saw the Autobots go inside him. What's Decepticons! He's trying to get in my ass! Get him out! He's like, he's like... The concept of going inside a Cybertronian body is like really interesting, but Megatron's just acts like a castle. I mean, you've got things guarding and protecting him, you've got brain impulses, electro sanitizers, they're basically antibodies. And their solution on how to get back the heart of Cybertron is to hop on a ride on a brain impulse straight to it. They're on a time limit, like they have to get to it in time before they start to go back to normal size, but then a part of me is like thinking, actually, why don't you just wait it out? Why don't you just grow to full size and just rip Megatron in two? Because that will stop the war, right? And no, don't even think about it, I am not going to show you that clip from season 3 of The Boys. What I find hilarious is just them coming out of Megatron and growing to normal size, and his reaction is priceless. Uh, excuse us. You filthy retro rats! <laughs> I really like this episode. It's a wacky Transformers episode, and I'm all for it. I'm just glad that my boy Braun and Perceptor got along in the end. Episode 35, Megatron's Master Plan Part 1. So the Decepticons manage to turn the humans against the Autobots, and the Autobots are ordered to leave the planet. We have a new human rat in this episode called Sean Berger. Seriously, how does his hair get like that? He gets upset that he isn't mayor, so he sets up the Decepticons, but then he ends up joining them because he gets fooled by Megatron and believing that they are good guys. Seriously, dude? They literally call themselves Decepticons. That doesn't set off any red flags? Enough! The Decepticons fool the Burger Man by disguising themselves as Autobots. I think this is the only time in the show where robots in disguise is taken quite literally. I know it's Starscream, but hearing Peter Cullen laugh as Optimus Prime is really unnerving. Another ray to blame on the Decepticons. <laughs> now I understand why he never laughs. I like how in this episode we actually get more dialogue from the Coneheads. Hey guys, look, Burger dropped one of his video cameras. Let's make some home movies. No more filming. We need to protect Dirge, okay? He's so precious. So the Autobots are worried that the humans are going to end up believing the Decepticons, and I love how Sunstreaker is just being so honest in this scene. I knew the humans would turn on us someday. They're such undependable creatures, inferior life forms. Uh, I'm not so sure, Sunstreaker. 
Some of my best friends are humans. <laughs> I just love how Spike is stood right there. Anyway, he manages to figure out what the Decepticons did, and well, I love ever having a court session in a stadium. You know, that actually kind of works. I gotta admit though, the scene where the Autobots are about to take off and leave Earth is really emotional. I need to know how you're gonna fight back. What your leaders say is true. I... This was all my fault. Episode 36, Megatron's Master Plan Part 2. This is the episode where Megatron slam dunks a human. No, I won't let you! <laughs> I love it. Now the only thing about this episode that raises concern for me is this kid's drawing. Like, oh my god, how is this so detailed? Also, he's dressed up as Megatron. I think this kid needs to get to therapy quick because I'm very concerned about his future. So yeah, in this episode, we have Decepticon Day. I love this update, Kande. Uh, come again? Hey guys, the Firebird is here. Uh, what are you doing? Shut up, comedian! I'm the main character now. I should have known you'd show up sooner or later. Ever since I was a kid, this is one of the episodes that stands out to me the most. I absolutely love the amount of memes that you can find on this episode, from Starscream taking out his Optimus Prime head, to Soundwave and Rumble dancing. Hey, get down, Soundwave! Most of the episode consists of the Autobots struggling to survive, the Decepticons having their way with the city, the humans doing their best to clear out the Autobots names, and overall it's a pretty tense episode with moments of levity like spread in between. It's all very entertaining and it keeps you on your toes constantly wondering how are our heroes gonna make it out of this one. It really does feel like a season finale. Eventually the Autobots manage to find their way back and the whole Autobot army and the Subicon army engage in moral combat, which is probably one of the most hype moments out of the whole season, culminating with Sean Berger getting his just deserve, and the Autobots being hailed as the heroes once again. So overall a very solid episode. My favorite little error of this episode is during the final battle between the Autobot and the Decepticon army. Starscream knew he was gonna get shot so he instinctively yelled. This episode marks the first on-screen appearance of Cosmos and Astrotrain and also includes almost the entire Autobot and Decepticon cast, something we don't see very often in a regular G1 episode. Like, I remember being a little kid watching this thinking that the Autobots were truly dead and thinking to myself, Oh my god, it's all over, how do they come back for this? But this always stood out as one of the most memorable G1 episodes to me. It has great character moments, it has that goofy G1 writing. It's overall a pretty memorable episode that includes things that you don't see in your typical G1 episode. Isn't that right, Squeaker? Yeah. Congrats, you can cheer to the conversation, you can go now. I did something! Anyways, back to you, Cam. You know, another thing I like in this episode is Optimus Prime realizing he made a bad decision, and you got Einhorn making a remark about it, which is not something you actually see a lot of from the Autobots, especially in modern Transformers. You're right. Maybe we ought to take it out on the one who got us into this mess. I did what was necessary. Damn Ironhide, the absolute shade. Also, I can't believe after all these years, I've just picked up what Frost meant to chip in this scene. You pile of reject parts, I'll... Reject parts! <laughs> Oh my god, his face. He knew exactly what he meant. <laughs> Aww, I feel so bad for Chip now. Slightly. But yeah, this episode was really fun. I'll end it off with one of my favorite scenes in the entire episode. Uh, laser beak wanna cracker? I started blasting. Bah, bah. Episode 37, Desertion of the Dinobots Part 1. The Dinobots abandon the Autobots just when the Autobots and Decepticons begin to suffer a malfunction. Now this is a fun two-parter, but there's a lot to unpack here. I mean, the opening scene is just wild. We got Soundwave sitting in Einhide's cargo compartment, and Einhide somehow fails to notice that Soundwave was inside of him. But not only that, we've also got Blaster in Einhide's cargo, and he fails to notice Soundwave sitting right in front of him. And it's only until Ravage is ejected that <laughs> Blaster picks up on it. So yeah, we're off to a great start. It was nice seeing Mirage and Hound use their holograms again to great effect, 
But then we transition to Bo and Bea at the carnival, and this scene always makes me laugh because of just how quick the transition is, but then also what Carly says. It makes no sense. You'll see, Bumblebee. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> what did you do? I switched off his equilibrium circuit. <laughs> okay, so what? You turn on his sense of humor? Anyway, Carly, Spike, and Bumblebee pick up Sparkplug from the airport, and you know, I actually want to know more about this than the actual plot of the episode. Like, where was Sparkplug coming from for him to look so snazzy in a blue suit? The Decepticons have a new base of operations, the same airport where Sparkplug is at. And they've named it Hangar. Okay, how did nobody notice that military jets were coming and going? And they weren't noticing Megatron or Soundwave? With this being a Dinobot episode, Optimus Prime sends Grimlock and his crew to the Hangar to defeat the Decepticons. I do love how the Dinobots cause so much mayhem with just one single hit. But unfortunately, after being attacked in their robot modes, because apparently they're more vulnerable that way, they decide to quit the Autobot team, and this is just when the Autobots begin to malfunction, because they've been exposed to Earth for too long. What's going on? I've been drinking again, Autobots. It doesn't make sense for the Season 2 characters, because it's like, wait, didn't they just recently get to Earth? Or have they been a part of the arc this whole time and we've just not seen them? Honestly, this question, it doesn't really matter. This episode's more comedic than it is serious, and you know, that's fine. I actually like this, because it's got the Autobots just malfunctioning and just being in weird positions. Same with the Decepticons, like mid-transformed. Hey, I'm stuck! I can't transform! Ow! Oh, thanks! I think. And it gets even funnier when it happens to the Decepticons as well. It's the Arrow! The Arrow! Too bad! He's blown his vocal components! I guess that makes me the new leader! The Autobots need Sabatonium, and with the Dinobots being no help, the kids, well, the superhumans, they're basically superhumans, travel to Cybertron. Also, why are their eyes drawn like that? It's really unnerving. Now this gets explored a lot further in part 2, but I like the idea of the humans having to interact with the Dinobots because we don't really get a lot of scenes with them all together. After successfully travelling through the space bridge, honestly I'm surprised if they don't throw up, they encounter Shockwave. This time we will be ready. Oh, never mind. They just died. Also, why is Shockwave holding himself? He is exactly like you in every way. Except one-eighth your size. Breathtaking. Episode 38, Desertion of the Dinobots Part 2. Carly and Spike travel to Cybertron to find a way to save the Autobots. So Part 1's ending just like completely lied about the ending's cliffhanger, because uh, as soon as Part 2 begins, well we've got Carly and Spike ready to enter Shockwave's lab, of course he's there, ready to fire, and well, Shockwave just vaporizes everything. Yeah, love, I, I don't think this guy gives a shit. Somehow, they manage to evade all of Shockwave's attacks. Quick, under here! Shit! By escaping Shockwave, they discover the supercomputer of Shockwave's whole lab. So Spike uses his thumb to talk to his dad back on Earth. That sounded weird. And oh my god, okay, that's disgusting. Uh, don't do that. Spike calling Teletran 1. <laughs> oh. Okay, let's just move on. You know, there's something about this episode where Shockwave sounds kind of different. Like, I don't know, just throughout the episode, it just seems like he's tired of Megatron shit. And what of the humans? They, they managed to escape Megatron. Like, what am I doing here? Why, why am I working for this guy? In the episode, Carly gets electrocuted and falls down and twists her ankle, like the convenience that she is. She becomes a painter carry throughout the whole episode. So when they get to Wheeljack's lab, they find out that Swoop has been following them this whole time after the other Dinobots got captured and he managed to escape. And all three of them head off to go rescue them. And just as I expected. Carly, your ankle, you're not limping. I, I think it's better. I knew it, she was lying. And you know, this is actually a good episode and it's mostly thanks to Swoop. I'm glad they chose Swoop to be with Carly and Spike. The one that can fly, but then 
isn't able to because he gets damaged halfway through the episode. I personally think Swoop is one of the best out of the Dinobots, just because I'm a big fan of a pterodactyl in general. But also his personality is a lot of fun as well. I don't know, I just like this guy. But one thing this episode showed was actually Swoop is one of the more smarter Dinobots. Almost forgot! Me Swoop can transform! Well, kinda... One thing to significantly note about this episode is that this is the first time we get a real glimpse of Cybertron's past, of how the Autobots and Decepticons started. Of course over time this would be kind of slightly retconned and things about the lore would change over time, but I think the designs here are actually pretty solid. You know, for a first draft, this isn't bad. You don't see a lot of these designs. They don't really go back to this first episode and kind of pull these designs out. So we discover the Dinobots digging for Cybertonian, which Shockwave is so desperate to get, but it only takes a few seconds for them to conduct a plan to escape. One of the funniest moments in this episode is just how long it takes Shockwave to notice that the Dinobots are stood right there. The Cybertonian is ready for shipment, Megatron, but I have lost control of the Space Bridge destination. Intruders! You know, I just cannot get over in this episode how weird the humans' eyes look. Like, they look freaky, and we never really see this again. And also, another thing we never see again is kind of a Dinobots being rebellious. Like, they joke at the end about, until next time, that they don't want to take orders anymore. But actually, yeah, this is kind of like the last episode where we kind of get anything like that from the Dinobots. Because now they just get used as brutes, and for their comedic relief. I feel like they did enough stories of the Dinobots rebelling, and I kind of always found it annoying when they did, so it's kind of good that this episode kind of wraps that up, and makes them like a whole unit again with the Autobots. Episode 39, Blasters Blues, and oh my god, it starts blasting. They've got two generic rock themes overlapping, and I cannot hear anything at all. It is just painful to the ear. I want it to stop. Please let it stop. Yeah, so this episode's annoying. But I'm not the only one who feels this way. I'm glad that me and Optimus Prime were on the same level. Yeah! My audio receptors. What is that noise? Humans call it music. Not this human. Blaster. Shut up. Sounds all right to me. And then you've just got jazz. So the Decepticons are after this human creation called the Voltranic Galaxy, or whatever, and it's supposed to disrupt airwaves? I don't know, the Decepticons want it. Anyway, the main characters focused in this episode are Cosmos and Blaster, which is nice. And we get a bit more of Astro Train as well. He previously did in Megatron's Master Plan Part 2, but he didn't really do it. But in this episode, his shuttle mode gets used to greater effect by actually flying to the moon. So yes, we have a Decepticon base now on the moon, which I actually think is a breath of fresh air. Finally, no bases underwater or on land. And it kind of helps for Megatron's plan because it makes the Autobots get into them a little bit more difficult. And that's what I liked in Transformers Armada when we have the Decepticon's base crash land on the moon because it just makes it a little bit more difficult for the Autobots and Decepticons. So we have Blaster inside of Cosmos, and, uh, okay. I mean, this is just weird, right? You know, you've got the smallest Autobot, who's part of the Minibots team, who is the size, suddenly, of a big ship. Then you've got Blaster, which is the size of a cassette player. And don't even get me started on Astro Train. It's Transformers. It's mass shifting at its finest. So the Decepticons hijack Earth's airways, and yet somehow you're still able to watch this episode. So the Earth is suddenly on fire, everything is going chaotic, and you gotta wonder the logic of this though, because it's like, human societies can adapt without radio, so I don't know why radio is like, causing so much chaotic with the weather and things without electric. I mean, don't even get me started when Carly and Spike go to the moon, I could just have a field day with that. Like, like the creator said, we gotta emphasize action over plot. I mean, I like the Autobots just helping out when we had the montage of them going across different places around the world as it was set on fire. You know, I just really like that with the Autobots. But despite all that, of course, the only thing that ends up saving the Earth in the end is music. <laughs> what was that? Don't play with me, fool! Equalize this! It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. I mean, who cares? At the end of the day, we get a fight between Omega Supreme and Astro Train, and we have Optimus Prime versus Megatron on the moon. Megatron, no! Okay, well, that was easy. 
But I don't know how to explain it. There's something about this fight that feels a bit more brutal. I know, it's a lot different than other kind of fights. Altus Prime is actually really pissed. I think this is because of how annoyed he's been at Blaster in this episode. Blaster! <laughs> hey, Prime! Dig the decimals! The Transformers will return after these messages. This is my episode ranking of Season 2, Part 1, from Episode 17 all the way up to Episode 39. And as we can see, my favourite episode has got to be Microparts. Now, I said a prime problem was my personal favourite, but when I look at it, I actually think Microbots deserves that one up more just because it gathers a lot of fun moments and it went all out in its wackiness. You'll notice that most of the wacky episodes are the top tiers. That's just because that's what I love about this brand is how crazy it can go. But not so much where some episodes just kind of throw logic out the window and it's animated poorly and it just becomes overall a mess. I'm talking about wackiness where they are put in a setting and it's actually done for creative effect. My least favourite episode had to be City of Steel. I just can't bear to look at that episode. Okay, so with part one now done, let's move on to part two. From episode 40, all the way up to episode 65. We now return to the Transformers. Now episode 40 is such a wild and wacky episode. There's just so much to talk about. So I think I'm going to need the basics on this one. A Decepticon Raider in King Arthur's Court may be a surprising choice, but it's definitely one of my favourite episodes from the entire G1 cartoon, if not my favourite episode. And I, I don't know that I could really explain why exactly. I did love time travel. I still enjoy a good time travel story now, even as an adult. But I loved time travel stories as a kid. So this one really jumped out at me. Because it's from that point, like, in the middle of season two, when the series is starting to steer away from stories just being about the pursuit of energy. And they're starting to do more stranger, more eclectic, more, like, genre pieces. Going off to alien planets and back in time and to Hollywood and... It's it's getting weirder, you know, but it's not so weird. It's still quite sci-fi, you know? And then as part of that, putting the characters in these weird and unusual new scenarios gets you, like, memorable set pieces, uh, scenes like uh, like the Red Knight riding on Warpath, jousting with Rumble on Ramjet, and Rumble's got a little shield with a Decepticon symbol on it. You want to Rumble with Rumble? <laughs> Who doesn't love that? My nose! you ruined my nose! And then, like, as far as the characters go, it's the first episode that doesn't have Optimus or Megatron in it. Well, Megatron's in it for a few seconds at the very end, but, like, it's the first story that doesn't involve Optimus or Megatron. And you wind up instead with this strange little cluster of characters, Hoist and Warpath on their own. It's like it's the closest Warpath ever gets to a Spotlight episode. It's always fun to see the cassettes without Soundwave, and I think it gives Ramjet some of his best lines, best bits in the show. <laughs> Inferior construction, even for an Autobot. One good whack, it breaks right in two. And it also goes back to the idea of Starscream as a scientist. You know, something that was established in Season 1, Fire in the Sky, that sort of just doesn't really come up again. Except until now, suddenly they go back in time and it's all magic can never defeat science and he builds a dynamo and he invents gunpowder. It's a good Starscream story. Starscream free from Megatron, just seeing what he gets up to when he's out on his own. Faster, you malingering peasants! But it is a very silly episode, you know, with all the medieval characters talking in these really exaggerated voices and then sometimes occasionally just slipping into modern English, uh, way to go, father, for no reason. But it's funny, you know? I don't know if there's a funnier scene in the whole G1 cartoon than that scene of Rumble coming back all covered in bird poo. No, Rumble, not I. Me and my big mouth. I've got your stupid potassium nitrate. Great work, little buddy. Listen, right, I'm just going to say it. Chip Chase has nothing on Chris McFeely's brain. The amount of knowledge stored in there, it's so precious. It belongs in a museum. It is a museum. Episode 41, The Golden Lagoon. Well, this is a sad episode, but also the best episode but then also sad again. 
This episode is by far one of my favourite episodes to come out of season 2 because it tackles like the moralities of all the Transformers battles, like what's the point of them, and it kind of reflects on us humans as well with our wars. It's still your typical Transformers episode, but then at the end makes you really look back and kind of reflect on what we've just watched. And then at the end you kind of come to a dark realisation. So it's kind of fitting that this episode features an obscure character, the pacifist Beachcomber. And this is another reason why I love this franchise, you can just take an obscure character, it doesn't have to be Optimus Prime, it could just be someone random and it can still carry the emotional weight of the story. But the basis of this plot is, uh, kinda silly. So Beachcomber finds a pool of golden liquid that makes him invulnerable, unfortunately the Decepticons find it too, and they all go in for a little dip. The episode begins with pretty much a majority of Season 2 characters fighting each other, no Season 1 characters in sight, which is good, because you know, Hasbro are still promoting the toy line. But during the battle, Beachcomber just kind of wanders off and enters Bambi world. Well, let's see if I can learn your language. Hmm, well, how do I say, it's a beautiful day. Aw, don't you just love him? Beachcomber heads back to the other Autobots, but unfortunately, just as he leaves, Frost appears and discovers the Golden Lagoon, and now with his new invulnerability, is able to defeat the Autobots. Beachcomber tries to get all the Autobots to retreat to the Golden Lagoon, but unfortunately, Ramjet goes full laser beak and captures Preceptor and Sea Spray. Megatron learns about the Golden Lagoon and delivers one of the best backhanded compliments in Transformers history. Megatron, I discovered a fountain of Electrum! We will be invulnerable! Personally, I need proof! Personally, I don't care what you need! They travel there and by good Decepticon fashion completely wreck the place. Poor Bambi. Also, Starscream holds his breath before he goes into the lagoon. I don't care about the logic of it, it's funny. In this episode we have a lot of Season 2 Autobot characters' personalities get really showcased and that's why I think G1 is so strong with its personalities, because every Autobot kind of feels unique, there's not like mirrored copies of each other. Like with Warpath, whenever he would make up like sort of weird rhymes or whatever the hell it was. Zing! We got a zoom! I want another crack at him, kazowie! But it does wear off pretty quick. And we get Mirage in this episode as well. You know, it feels like it's been ages since I last saw him. Sure wish Mirage was here, we could use him. Your wish is granted. Huh? Why? I've been here for ten minutes. Um, okay, what were you doing there for ten minutes? Uh, I'm kind of creeped out now. You know, just not Mirage as well, we get a lot of other Season 1 characters in this episode, and it feels weird, like, for syndication it probably wouldn't be an issue, but watching these in production order, you do kind of notice how much we kind of phased out a lot of the Season 1 guys. Starscream being the sick freak that he is, decides to make Sea Spray and Perceptor fight each other. Something we've not seen kinda yet of Starscream, his more sadistic side. You know, his ego is in full force here, calling himself the Ace of the Air. Just an interesting touch that even has Soundwave spooked that he goes and tells Megatron about it. Also, I like the idea that even though Beachcomber is a pacifist, he's still like a warrior. Like, he doesn't like fighting, but he's actually a really good soldier. Yeah, he gets captured by Megatron, but it isn't long until he breaks free, saves Perceptor and Sea Spray, and heads back to the Golden Lagoon. For some reason, Dirge gets left in charge of looking after the Golden Lagoon, and at this point, I just feel really sorry for Dirge. He's such a precious character, but he always gets treated so badly. Thanks for nothing, Lawson! All the Autobots seem to conveniently meet at the Golden Lagoon at the same time and all hop in and now all become gold, which becomes an easy cash grab for Hasbro to repackage them all gold now. The Decepticons arrive and chaos ensues, and during this fight, unfortunately, the nature surrounding it gets destroyed. I think one of the reasons why this episode stood out to me so much is that, well, you just gotta look at what the creators said about the G1 cartoon. They wanna emphasize action over plot, and this episode does that. There's so much action, but all they need to do is just add one plot thread. It's not like a big major plot thread, it's not overshadowing the entire action, it's just something at the end that makes you look at the episode in a completely different light. With nature destroyed around it, the Autobots won the battle with the Decepticons, but at what cost? Everything gets destroyed, and Beachcomber, a pacifist, like I said earlier, throughout this episode demonstrate how good of a warrior he is, but at the same time, he loves two things. He loves fighting, but then he loves nature, but he can't really enjoy both at the same time with the war that he's in. I mean, the Transformers are pretty simple. The Autobots are the good guys, and the Decepticons are arseholes. 
And the way how this episode ends with such like the cheering victory music, and then you've just got one line from Beachcomber that is completely the opposite to the sound of the music. Usually at the end of G1 episodes when the Autobots win, you kind of like cheering for them to win, and you win, you're like, yay, the Autobots saved the day, like, 10 year old me as a kid is like, yay, the Autobots saved the planet from the Decepticons. But in this episode, you realize something. We won. The Autobots are kind of assholes. Episode 42, The God Gambit. The Decepticons arrive on a new planet and come up with a scheme to conquer a race of primitive humanoids by exploiting their religious beliefs. Because sure, why not? Some humans do it. Now this would be the kind of first episode where the Transformers would start to go out of space and discover new alien races. We get more of that in season 3 especially. I mean, we've got Atlantis, we might as well go to space, right? But I can't really say I care for this episode all that much, it's just the alien characters aren't really interesting to me at all. There are a few good moments here and there, Astro Train definitely gets a lot more screen time which is nice, this is kind of the start of more Astro Train. But you'd think by the title right, they're trying to sort of like give some sort of message in this episode, but the message is kind of a bit blurred and they don't really know what they want to do with it. Your Sky Gods are an excuse for high taxes and harsh laws. I believe in reason and common sense. There are no Sky Gods. Just imagine if they did this episode on Earth. You know, that'd actually be a bit more interesting. Also, no matter what other planet you're on, there will always be taxes. And you know, Astro Train feels out of character in this episode. It feels like originally this was written for Megatron, but because they're in space, I guess it just made more sense to have it as the Astro Train. Like he's being bossy to view the Decepticons and he's making insult remarks to Starscream. From this day forward, all who defy me, die! Stop your ranting, Starscream! We will- These fools worship Transformers! Oh my god, they're self-aware! But we have this new alien character here called Talaria, and she's cool, I like her. She manages to press the beacon on Cosmos who was wounded, and Matt gets viewer Autobots over to the planet. Jazz, Perceptor, and Omega Supreme come to the rescue. Yay, Jazz! Perceptor? Uh, alright, I'm kinda getting tired of him now. I kinda would've hoped for someone different. <laughs> right, so these crystals on this alien planet are supposed to be like super precious, right? Well, I just love the fact that Starscream's just tossing one around and Jero's face is priceless. Jero, the crystal- <laughs> He's just in disbelief. So yeah, anyway, in this episode, Omega Supreme is like stuck on a ledge for ages. He just doesn't seem to have the will to move. And then the Autobots come up with a plan to save Talaria, and whoa, 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 hang on a minute, hang on a minute, what's going off here? The Autobots manage to successfully defeat the Decepticons by destroying the home of the Titan people. Nah, nah, not all of it, but still, nonetheless. Can we move on? I don't want to talk about this one anymore. Episode 43, Make Tracks. We Autobots head to New York, and I make a new friend, Raul. Am I really going to be doing this whole review in the Tracks voice? No, I'm not. So the Autobots become vigilantes. They're taking a page out of Batman here. Unlike in City of Steel's New York, something about this feels a bit more realistic, more grimy, more kind of like what you'd actually expect. Even though it's still a cartoon, they do a good way of kind of balancing the actual reality of it. And also another reason why I like this episode is because I like the human partner, Raul. And I also like Tracks, if you couldn't tell. Yeah, he'd rather hang out with humans than us any day. For obvious reasons. At least humans aren't stick in the mud, spinning their treads all day long. Power glide. Yeah, I've always kind of looked at him like that. He's just the perfect kind of Autobot snob, really. Not that I'm anything like him. I watch Frasier, okay? We have Optimus Prime here being a dad, and he tells Trax not to stay out too late, and to make sure that he gets back home in time. Trax. Where are you going? Out for some invigorating city air. It's too stuffy in here for me. Well, don't be gone too long. I love how Trax just goes out for five seconds in New York and immediately a crime's happening. Ah, oh, that's more like it. All right, hold it. The Geddes brothers will pay primo for that baby. Well, I'll be sure to stay away from New York. So Trax gets his tire shot, and honestly, it just breaks my heart to see Trax get damaged. Like, oh no, his paint job. Ouch! My 
hood. My beautiful hood. Before knockout, we had Trax. The only difference is Trax isn't gay. He's a snob. I think the reason why I like Raul so much is because his story is so different. Like, this guy's got a heart of gold, but he's made bad choices, and it's when he comes across tracks he tries to rectify that. Kinda similar to Cade in Transmus 4, why that was such an interesting concept, because it's different from, like, Spike and Sparkplug, who were working and then the Transformers just flew over and saved them. But with Trax, it's like, okay, Raul notices Trax damage, so he wants to repair him, but not for the sake of Trax, just for the sake of himself, because while he's in debt to, like, these real big players in town. So we haven't got a character trait that's just so basic. Like, he's a selfish character, but he's only doing it out of desperation and fear. When Trax teaches him a few odd lessons, he starts to realise that deep down, he's not that person. You're not serious. Hey, you don't make promises to the Geddes brothers you can't keep. Anyway, I need the bread more than I need a set of wheels. More than you need a friend? Oh my god, we just got character development. Also, you gotta feel sorry for Trax in this episode. His finish gets abused non-stop. Look, I've been shot at, smashed up, and stolen three times tonight, and I'm in a most foul humour. The difference between Raul and Spike is that you know who Spike is straight away because that writing is just kind of shoved in. Like, you know he's a good person, but that's it. Like, there's nothing more interesting to kind of know about him. Because, like, yeah, Spike's got a heart of gold, but Raul's got a heart of gold underneath. And I just find that lifting that personality up instead of shoehorning it straight away makes for some compelling storytelling. It's like you're discovering more about this character over time. The main thing that really annoys me in this episode is how the Transformers work with just one cable. So Raul accidentally snaps one of Trax's cables, and that's like the main wire to his computer, and it's just kind of like, wait, it's that simple? Uh, that's lame. We've got the Autobots doing their regular saving stuff around New York, and what the hell is this? Huff is small, hoist is big, how does this work? Alright, fine. We've got Devastator inside Astro Train. Then we've got the Autobots aboard in Silver Bolt. When we got Cosmos having an injection chamber that can fit all of his passengers, why do we question anything in this franchise? We should just accept that it's weird. I mean, we've literally got one of the biggest malls in the world. Do you have any idea how big an F-15 jet is? Starscream is massive, and yet he's just going up the human stairs. So as for the Decepticons in this episode, while well, we learn that the people that Raoul owed a car to are actually working with Decepticons to make some sort of car army thing, whatever, we are ready to reconvert this final batch of vehicles, Megatron. Why are you talking like this? Obviously their plan goes into ruin, but I love Optimus Prime's strategy just at the end of the episode. Forget about the Decepticons. Just aim for the building. We're putting your company into bankruptcy, Megatron. <laughs> yeah, just forget about the Decepticons, just go straight for the building. Let's just cause so much carnage. Oh, and one more reason why I like Raul so much is because he straight up just kills Megatron. <laughs> episode 44, Child's Play. Alright, Beth, confess. Was you on drugs when you wrote this episode? Not only that, this is one of the most unfinished episodes of Generation 1. I could just talk about the animation errors. They are just wow, just stellar. The basic plot is the Transformers end up on another alien planet and they are the size of toys. Because obviously Hasbro had to make an episode where the Transformers were literally toys. And you know what? As a concept, that's actually pretty fun. And this episode is fun. It has a lot of comedic moments. So we have an alien boy called Aaron, and yes, you guessed it, he is annoying, but not as bad as the other characters in this episode. What you got behind your back? Nothing, Marty. Come on, Goosehead, I saw you hiding it from me. I wanna kill Marty. Also in this episode is Aaron's space rat, or cat, or what the hell is that thing? Whatever, never mind. So you're not gonna guess how the Transformers managed to get to this brand new alien world. Because of a game of baseball. I respectfully request that you allow us to play ball! Since the humans- Unfortunately, this is just another regular day on Earth. Skyward, think fast. Help! Leave me alone! Stop! You know, it's actually kind of an interesting contrast to see the Decepticons play with the humans as like toys, only for the same thing to happen to them in the next scene with the Autobots, and then with Aaron later on. Strike two! I got him! Oh my god, I love this episode, why? So yeah, for some reason there's a space bridge at a stadium and it gets activated and transports a few Autobots and a few Decepticons 
to a completely different world. And as soon as they get onto this planet, the Decepticons become immediate targets. Get this thing off me! Assistance required. You're not gonna believe this. No! Don't come near me, you monster! Ah! Starscream's torture literally carries this whole episode. It makes me question the kind of size in this episode though, because it's like, did they shrink to toy size? Or are these aliens like literally giants? And if they are, that's even scarier just because of how big the Transformers are. You know, Aaron kind of scares me a little bit on where he places the Decepticons, because I know he thinks they're like toys, but this is like some sadistic torture stuff. Also, I just absolutely love what was Prime just to Bumblebee here. Starscream, why you? Everybody out and get these Energon cubes. You know, I wish this episode would transition more on Megatron because I'm just curious to know where he thinks his troops have gone. Oh, wow. Look what I found. Hand it over, son. Ow, it bit me. Soundwave hasn't reported back in days. Where can he be? Megatron, I think I've found him. eBay? Request permission to buy it now. The sadisticness goes to another level when Aaron's parents find out and then they take him to the authorities and they're literally about to cut them open. I kind of want to see it though. Marty gets the Autobots out of there so they don't get dissected, but unfortunately we come across Marty. And this guy, he's a real prick. Looks like your birdie flew the coop. I can't blame him being around a nerd like you. I mean, it's like, what's this guy's problem? He gets ice cream all over the Autobots as well. Now that's pure evil. So this is the part of the episode where the animation errors start to show. I mean, we've got Starscream's blaster clipping through his face and Ravage is running in thin air. Uh, sure, okay. Also, these guards are chasing Aaron with guns. It's like, whoa, 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 okay. He's just a child. I love how at the very end of the episode, Optimus Prime just gets fed up with Perceptor. I can modify my light cannon into a transport beam, amplifying the rays through this telescope. Don't tell us about it, just do it. Well, anything's worth a try with some modifications through the propulsion core. Perceptor, just do it. How Prime is with Perceptor is how I am with Chip. They find a way to get back to Earth by using the Energon cubes through a telescope, but unfortunately, the Decepticons hijack their plan and travel to Earth first. You know, it's worth it just because of this one scene. This isn't the type of welcome I had in mind. <laughs> Who cares? As long as there aren't any green monsters around. <laughs> get this thing now the thing with G1 animation errors is that some of them have kind of a charm to them because it was just a relic of the time, you know, and some will be a blink you'll miss it as well, like barely noticeable. But then this episode, they are right in your face, you notice them straight away and they last longer than the typical second. And by far this one is the biggest offender of all. I, uh, <laughs> I feel the same way about you, Nitro. What just happened? Anyway, Optimus Prime once said this. Here, kitty kitty. Episode 47, The Gambler. So yeah, the air date's kind of messed up on this one. It's supposed to be Quest of Survival, but continuity, The Gambler takes place after Child's Play. So I'm just going to talk about episode 47 now, just for the sake of consistency. Because I love that in my Transformers. On the return journey from Aaron's world, the Autobots are captured by a gambling addicted alien and are traded away. Living Smokescreen and the Autobot bounty hunter, Defcon, to rescue them. So we get an obscured character centered episode, that being Smokescreen. And you know, I actually really like this one, but it is a massive, massive headache when it comes to the animation errors. But I like how this episode kind of redeems the screen time that Smokescreen had in Child's Play because he was present through all of that, but he wasn't really given any lines and he didn't really get acknowledged by any of your other Autobots. I'm Optimus Prime, leader of the Autobots. This is Preceptor, Bumblebee, and Inferno. Aaron, can you tell us- Uh, Prime, I'm right here. But yes, as the episode title suggests, the only way to save the Autobots is by gambling. Because this is a kid's cartoon. So the person who kidnapped the Autobots is this alien freak called Bosch. And Bosch finds out that Smokescreen is good at gambling, so he decides to make a proposition that if he helps him win millions, he'll let him and the Autobots go. Also, Bosch doesn't really blink in this episode at all, and it is incredibly freaky. You know, one thing I actually like about this episode is actually the location itself. You know, it's actually a good setting, and you know, it feels like space 80s. 
As we're on the way to see Lord Gaikane, we have perhaps one of the most annoying creature I have ever witnessed. It is so ugly. I'm going to dissect it. Anyway, Smokescreen loses all of his energy chips because someone plugs out his cheating thing. And because of this, Jabba the Hutt will now use the Autobots in the Gladiatory Arena. Now we do have some Coneheads in this episode with Astro Train, and I like this, just get the obscure characters together instead of like the core characters. But the most interesting character in this episode is actually a character that doesn't have a toy. He's called Defcon. He's a bounty hunter that is going after Decepticons that need to be brought to justice. And then this little rat thing starts kissing him because he saves his life. But, you know, Defcon's voice should be familiar. He's voiced by the legend John Stevenson. I mean, he voices Alpha Trion, Huffer, Cup, Thundercracker, Wind Charger, one of my favourites. Now, there's a lot of love for Defcon within the fandom, especially by a good buddy of mine, Autobot Sonic, the Telltale Gamer. Hello everyone, I'm Autobot Sonic the Telltale Gamer. Today I want to talk about one of my favorite G1 episodes, and that being the Season 2 episode, The Gambler. While I was mostly drawn to Smokescreen for this episode, what actually was the surprising, my favorite thing about this episode was the character Devcon, who is a character that surprisingly has never really showed up again in the Transformers franchise outside of this very one specific episode. And I don't understand why he's this really cool... Autobot slash neutral Cybertronian bounty hunter who goes across on to different alien plants to make a living, get his Energon and all that. Instead, I know he has the Studio Series figure coming out soon. Um, they did use his name for that one Decepticon that gets killed at the start of Dark of the Moon. But we really haven't seen a true alternate version of Devcon in the past almost 40 years, which is crazy to think about. And really makes me hope that we do actually get to see Devcon again because he's such a cool character. You could say he's been the blueprint for a couple other... Transformers characters that have come after him, such as Lockdown or even the Prime Incarnation of Wheeljack. I just love the whole premise of the episode being sort of like a a heist or like gambling, like thriller, because like stuff like that, like Ocean's Eleven and other heist stuff like that, some of my favorite things in um fiction. So to see Transformers sort of tackle a casino gambling heist episode, I really really love that. I think Devcon was an absolutely great character i know i for one would love to see him again because he definitely is a character that deserves more love in the transformers fandom but yeah a lot of things kind of escalate in this episode and the ending well we got fat r slips here about to get away with the autobots but then botch and zuazado is what the rats called try their best to stop him and honestly this is perhaps one of the worst animation errors i remember seeing this as a kid and it still bothers me to this day for me, remember? I order you to take his gun away! Do you hear me, Slizzardo? Slizzardo! Pain. Just pure pain. I don't know what it is. What's wrong with his face? I don't know why I find it so funny every time. Anyway, the Decepticons get away and Defcon and Zuzardo become partners because... Sure, why not? Uh, someone's gotta take that rat away. As the Autobots come to, Octopus Prime does his draw me like one of your French girls pose, where all the fan arts go absolutely wild for, and the Autobots learn absolutely nothing from this episode and head back to the city to do more gambling, because that was a good lesson to teach the kids from the 80s. Hey, what do you say to a little R&R, &R, guys? Why not? Autobots, transform! How very optimistic of you, Optimus. Let's go! the gambling to me. So now I know where my dad got his gambling addiction from. Episode 45, Quest for Survival. In this episode, we have an Insecticon clone army and the Morphobots, and they are disgusting. They were believed to have been extinct by the Transformers, but in fact, they launched themselves into space a long time ago in a desperate bid to find more sources of food. They eat any forms of mechanical life, but they seem to enjoy eating the Insecticons more. This is probably my least watched episode. I don't know, I, I can't actually remember this one all that much. The episode begins, like with every Insecticon episode, of them harassing farmers. You know what, they just expect it at this point. I just feel sorry for these guys. We got a new Autobot introduced in this episode, called Skids. Now he only makes an appearance in two episodes of the entire G1 cartoon. And I don't know why he wasn't in more. He's a very memorable character. And we're on our way home. Why don't you get a haircut with your bitch ass? Good work. So, we got Cosmos, Bumblebee, and Spike going out of space to find a giant can of insecticide, which is bug spray to insecticons. Though really, they should just call it the genocide spray. 
The Decepticons have essentially turned the Insecticons into an unstoppable force that all the Earth's food gets converted into Energon. And you know what, this is pretty smart. But do the Autobots really think that one can is going to stop the entire Insecticon clone army? This is your typical grandma plot trying to get rid of the bugs at home. So Spike and Bumblebee find Cosmos, but they can't do anything because he's trapped with all those weird looking tentacle things. And when they arrive back at the Autobot base, Bumblebee discovers that spores are attached to his body. <laughs> Stand skills. Wait, what was that? <laughs> okay, so B is ticklish. Didn't expect that. So this is the last Insecticon-centric episode, and I gotta say, it kinda ends on a whimper. Like, I just don't find this plot so interesting, along with the fact that there's dozens of them in this episode as well. Like, they could easily overthrow the Autobot and Decepticons, and it's like, yeah, I'm not against the idea of an Insecticon army, but in this episode, it's kinda ridiculous. But oh well, at least there's one thing in this episode I like. Soundwave laughing. <laughs> So wholesome. As Megatron is looking for the insecticide, he comes across the Morphobots. Knowing that Cosmos has it, decides to lay back and let the Autobots do his dirty work for him, so that he can seize the moment to take the insecticide to stop the Autobots from foiling his plan. God, God saying all these words is a real tongue twister, man. Anyway, this ends up backfiring on Megatron. <laughs> oh, I love you, Starscream. One thing I love about this series that's consistent is Optimus Prime's hatred for Blaster's music. Alright, let me try something. Blaster, no music plays. <laughs> Oh, I just love how genuine he is. We need more of this in the modern era of Optimus Prime. So yeah, we save a day with music. You know, this is actually character development for Optimus Prime, because at the end he learns to appreciate Blaster's music. <laughs> Mission accomplished, Prime! Good work, Blaster. You've just gone platinum. The way how this episode ends is just so weird, right? So we've got the Morphobots destroying the entire Insecticon army. Well, they murder them. And the Autobots praise them as heroes, and then they shoot them off to another world because, well, obviously they're going to destroy the planet Earth, you know, if they keep them on there. But not all of them are gone because some are still inside the Autobot base, about to murder Perceptor, and it's just like, it ends. And it's like, I guess Perceptor just died. Also, Autobus Prime has this ugly thing on his face. Whatever, let's just move on. Episode 46, The Secret of Omega Supreme. The Constructicons begin mining on a distant asteroid. Whoa, hang on a minute, why is Sideswipe there? Uh, did nobody seem to notice the Autobot insignia on his model sheet? <sighs> anyway, Optimus Prime calls Omega Supreme for help, but ends up sitting down for story time to learn about the dark past between the Constructicons and Omega Supreme. And the asteroid that the Constructicons were mining ends up hatching as there was a creature inside of it, and the Autobots have to deal with it on Earth. Doggone! At best, we can only keep that thing from landing in the streets. And how long do you reckon before it simply eats San Francisco? Why are we still here? Just to suffer? Yay, we've got a law building episode. Only thing is, it's a massive contradiction. So I'm going to have my good friend Alex to explain on why this is one of his favourite episodes. The Secret of Omega Supreme. What a fascinating episode this turned out to be. This episode created a solid foundation for how Omega Supreme was to be portrayed in future pieces of Transformers fiction. The episode's plot really starts to get going when Optimus tries to have a chat with Omega and he detects that Omega seems to be holding a grudge against the Constructicons. I really love the way this scene plays out with Optimus telling Omega to speak like a normal Autobot before Omega explains his history with the Constructicons. And Omega starts talking like how he did before the incident of the, with the Constructicons. He used to talk normally. Clear on out of here! Your city needs you! I'll say, what with all the trouble the Decepticons have been making? Thanks, Doc. How I love this place! Which is interesting, a very interesting character tidbit they added there, I really like that. Omega was a guardian robot on Cybertron, tasked to protect the Crystal City built by his friends. 
the Constructicons. However, things go south when Megatron captures and reprograms the Constructicons to follow his orders. Open you stupid door, Megatron! The Constructicons then deceive Omega and destroy this Crystal City behind his back. Now this backstory for Omega Supreme may be setting off some red flags in some of the minds of you avid G1 watchers, and there's good reason for that. This episode contains one of the biggest continuity errors in the entirety of G1, and that contradiction is with the origin of the Constructicons. In a previous episode, they were clearly built on Earth, but in this episode, they've existed since before or early into the war. This is generally where most of my headache comes from with this episode, since continuity errors this massive seriously bother me. But in a vacuum on its own, this episode is definitely solid. Relax, man. Remember, we're all one with the universe. We're about to become one with the pavement, duck! All in all, the episode ends with Omega Supreme saving the city of San Francisco from a space creature after a chewing out from Optimus that makes Omega realize that pursuing revenge and going after the Constructicons would only cause the loss of another city. Prime move. You caused that thing to hatch. You're responsible. It's happening again, Omega. San Francisco is going to be destroyed. Are you going to let it all happen again? For something as useless as revenge? Course of action altered. By the standards of a G1 episode, this episode was, was fairly well animated. Fairly good episode. A decent, like, popcorn watch. Episode 48? What the hell is this thing? So in this episode, and an electric pest annoys everyone, including us, the viewers. And oh my god, where do I even begin? We're only two seconds into the episode, and Megatron creates an abomination. Yes, Grimzik! You will be my ultimate weapon against the Autobots! This thing's like Pikachu if you had ADHD. The animation errors are off the charts, we've got colouring that is so bland, the character sizes are just inconsistent. But the main focus of this episode is, of course, the little imp that is Kremzy. And you know what? I actually kind of like him. But it's one of those episodes where it's just kind of fun to see the Autobots just roaming around the place trying to stop him. There's just something that's just so... I don't know, 80s about it? Like, I actually don't mind the character. You know, there's something kind of adorable about him, but I'm surprised we've not seen more of in kind of recurring transfer shows. Have you seen what he was originally supposed to look like? This thing is disgusting. Like, hell, this would have traumatized children. Like, this is something that would definitely crawl up your ass. So I'm definitely much happier with what we got. I mean, heck, I want to pet this thing. Granted, he'd probably electrify me to death. But still, he's cute, okay? Anyway, Megatron uses Kremzik on the Autobots, and I love how in this shot here, it looks like he's about to go to the vets. He's just like every other parent. That dumps their kids off when we don't want them anymore. Anyway, shit goes nuts. What the heck's that? Maybe this will slow it down so we can find out. Um, that's not jazz. Anyway, Kremzik somehow ends up in Japan, so the Autobots go there to try and find him. This is where I saw him go! Now all we have to do is find the little... Shit. Optimus Prime was gonna say shit. See, the Autobots don't actually have a plan, and I love the absolute utter shock on Blaster's face when he realises that Optimus Prime doesn't have a plan. What do we do when we catch that weirdo? We'll worry about that when we catch him. You mean you don't have a plan? Who's had time to think up a plan? Hang on! To be fair, he's right though. There's just no slowing down in this episode. Everything just escalates quickly. Faster, Prime! Faster! Oh! Slower, Prime! Slower! And by escalating, I mean he ends up in a video game store. Why is that guy shirtless? He goes inside a video game and destroys this poor bloke's chance of winning and ends up in a computer factory where we end up meeting... I am Dr. Soji Yoshikawa. Very honored. That one didn't age quite so well. Anyway, he inserts himself inside a blaster and they start making babies. Oh, here comes that sinking feeling. Oh my god. It's my sleep paralysis demons. Optimus Prime is in such a rush to finish this episode that he isn't waiting around for anyone else. 
But the episode doesn't actually end. So deformed Pikachu gets big. Then they find a way to destroy him. Then Bumblebee has second thoughts. But, but he's kind of cute. Bumblebee, shut up. Then they destroy him, only to find out that there was a secret Quimsy hiding inside of Blaster this whole time, and the episode ends with the Autobots chasing after him once again. Now this wouldn't be the last time we see Kremzeek in the franchise. Oh no, he's hot! Episode 49, Sea Change. Sea Spray turns into a merman with robot feet and falls in love. Wait, what? So yes, this episode centers on and his love for the I'm not gonna do this for the whole thing, don't worry. So yeah, we got a merm bot thing called Alana. Anyway, they're on another planet, and their race is called the Talakakans. Of Talaka I can't pronounce it. They are slaves to the Deceptitrans. <laughs> Basically Decepticons. God, we are having a whirlwind of names in this episode. Though it's really just Talatran because it's just one big dude. He's basically programmed by the Decepticons to harvest Energon on their planet. And he's developed a rather disturbing method of gathering Energon. Anyway, Alana and her people revolt, which results to Deceptitrans sending out a distress signal, which the Autobots pick up on and head to the planet. Anyway, the Autobots get shot down, and unfortunately Cosmos is badly damaged. Oh, oh no, my pink job's ruined. I think you've got better things to worry about than your paint job, mate. Alana helps out the Autobots by taking out some Deceptor Trams, and then Sea Spray ends up saving Alana, and then we've got a moment where Sea Spray blushes in front of Alana. Oh my god, he's melting. You know, the way how this episode kind of handles the romance thing is actually kind of alright. It's more authentic and genuine, unlike some other episodes where... Ooh, yeah, we'll get to that one later. But yeah, there's just something sweet and also sad about this episode. Anyway, Megatron is now on the planet, and they chase after the Autobots, and they manage to escape. Well, except for Bumblebee. And I just love how he's having such a nightmarish time on this planet. Where is everyone? Anyway, the Talakans have something called the Well of Transformation. If they put their mind to it, they can transform into anything. And Sea Spray wants to try this out because of his feelings for Alana. He wants to be more like her. And well, this happens. <sighs> I did love you. You did? Really? Sea spray? I think so. There. How do you like that? Oh. <laughs> Ouch. Whoa, wait a what? Steady there, tiger. Oh, never mind. <laughs> it's just robot feet. Oh. So yeah, now sea spray is a merman who still talks like his robot mode. And he has robot feet. Okay. They realise, however, they're going to have to actually be robots to take on the Decepticons, so Alana transforms into an Autobot. And, well, she turns into a gondola, because of course. But Rumble, on the other hand, unfortunately falls into the well as well, and becomes a tree. You must think of a tree. It's your only chance. A big tree with big roots and spreading branches. Okay, I'm trying. I'm trying. Phew, that was close. Hey, wait a minute. You tricked me. Tree Rumble is the best rumble. The planet is saved, but of course, like all great things in the Transformers, it has to get destroyed in order to be saved. But in the end, Alana and Sea Spray come to terms that they don't actually have to be the same outside to be the same inside. Which, you know, in a way, is actually kind of a sweet message. <laughs> Episode 50, Triple Takeover. Astro Train and Blitzwing dispose of Megatron and Starscream, and then proceed to cause havoc. Now this episode will be in the highest of rankings just based on its absurdity and Starscream's Oscar performance. You let me into this trap! I was tricked! They told me it was a power station! You are either lying, or you're stupid! I'm stupid! I'm stupid! Now this is what I call good comedy. This episode is actually one of my favourites, and I don't know why. This is the one episode of G1 I have rewatched a dozen times. Now there's just so much to say about this episode, I mean this is Skids' second and last appearance. We have the Decepticons carving their own phases in Mount Rushmore. Oh, and Spike returns, but only when the Autobots are trying to stop the city from getting flooded. Here, grab me! Help me! 
Yep, he's dead. Rest in peace, Spike. This episode is just madness, so I'm going to have my buddy Keenan Carlisle explain why this is one of his personal favorites. Take it away, Keenan. Triple Takeover is my favorite Generation 1 episode without a doubt, and it's unironically one of my favorite pieces of Transformers media ever made. What I love more than anything is when Transformers is just absurdly stupid. It's just random bullshit relentlessly for 21 consecutive minutes with no end in sight. I just watched the episode for the first time in like 10 years, but in that 10 years, there's so many lines from this that I just never ever left my head. Hey, trail breaker! All this water is beginning to dampen my day! Or <laughs> Blitzwing says to Devastator, We built your maze! Tell you what, guys, why don't you go build a bridge and jump off it? <laughs> But just the little things like Astro Train runs up to a random train station, he just gets some random trains, takes computers out of the human 80s technology train station, shoves them in the trains, and he just decides that they're his army, and that's his total plan. And then the Coneheads just show up to bully him for no reason. Come on, guys! Astro Train couldn't lead rats to a garbage can. <laughs> And then on the other end of town, Blitz <laughs> kidnaps a human football coach. This is your new office. Now, give me some military advice. You don't understand, Mac. I only know football plays. You stay here at your desk. Blitzwing will return. The guy says random football things like, oh, zone defense. And then Blitzwing has to construct a cons, build a giant maze <laughs> across the sea. And it's so big <laughs> that all the Constructicons get lost in it. And there's just so many little things. At the very end, Astro Train randomly shows up to the football stadium. He's like, I got a score to settle with you, Blitzwing. <laughs> and they just fight for no reason because we don't even know why they're mad at each other. We don't know why Astro Train's mad at Blitzwing. <laughs> I am Decepticon leader! I just laugh hysterically. Nothing makes sense. It's so dumb. And if you don't have this episode near the top of your list, I'm gonna be really mad at you and never talk to you again. I'm naming my son Triple Takeover when I have kids because that's how important this episode is to me. Now, despite this episode being chaos, at least it demonstrates on why Optimus Prime is the better leader. Yeah, but there is only one great leader in the universe. Have a seat, boss. Thrones are for Decepticons. Besides, I'd rather roll. Episode 51, Prime Target. The big game hunter, Lord Chumley, begins hunting Autobots, and he's gunning for Optimus Prime. This is the episode where Optimus Prime says boobies. Amazing. A booby trap that actually catches boobies. Hey, we got a G.I. Joe reference in this episode. Now, I'm not a big G.I. Joe fan, but I can just imagine the excitement kids would have had if they had like a big five-parter back in the 80s. You know, we got the cast all together. I mean, we do have a kind of crossover in season three, but it doesn't really go anywhere and it's kind of a letdown. Okay, so in this episode, we've got an insanely rich fat bastard called Lord Chumley. And oh my god, how rich is this dude? I'm already annoyed at this episode because the wannabe old butler British dude can't pour a cup of tea right. Yes, I'm British, okay? It makes me mad. And for some reason he wants the head of Optimus Prime because, uh, well, whatever, I don't give a shit. Somehow Chumley and this old dude managed to capture the Autobots. But you know, the only annoying thing about this episode is that we never got to find out what happened next on the soap opera. So you see, my dear, if Donna is having an affair with Gordon, Jack doesn't know that Cheryl hid the real will. We interrupt as the kitchen sinks for this special news bulletin. Oh. Just when it was getting good. I know, guys. I feel the same way, too. You know, I just want to know how Chumley is able to do all this, and how the world of the Transformers works, because how he captures all the Autobots is just ridiculous. It feels like the writers are just coming out with any shit that comes out of their arse. I mean, seriously, how do you explain this? How does it work? This is just, wow, even as a kid, this right here angered me. Fantastic, Lord Chumley. Your tribal instincts theory has proven true. 
Oh my God, just die. No cooperation, no cooperation at all. I seriously hate him. He needs to die. Like, just look at this, the way Javi Autobots are being tortured. We've got a beach coming here. I mean, Ultra Prime's not worried about him because he can keep up with that. Grapple, though, he's almost about... Yeah, he's fallen already. I feel like Bumblebee's got the worst of it. You know, him just constantly transforming. I feel real sorry for him. Anyway, you know, Starscream actually makes a good point in this episode. Whoever he is, is brilliant for a flesh creature. Especially since he has done more in two days than you have in two years. Octopus Prime heads off to save the Autobots, and then he fights a dragon. And then he kills it, which is like, great, another human historical find that is now gone. We also have Astro Train and Blitzwing in this episode, but they're not worth talking about because they do practically nothing. But Octopus Prime does eventually get to Chumley and ends the episode exactly how I wanted it to. There he is, lads! Ha -ha. Give him a good tragedy! Hey baby, I hear the blues are calling, toss salads and scrap. Amazing boobies. Episode 52, Autobop. Blaster and I uncover a hypnosis plot. A funky hypnosis plot. So in this episode, we only have Blaster and Trax and the return of Raul. And his return is kind of underwhelming. I just wish they gave him more to do. He didn't really do much in this episode. The only thing he really does is save tracks from a crucifixion of music. Oh god. And he also says this. <sighs> Unusual hiring policy this club's got. Time to pull a Michael Jackson. What? Let's beat it. It doesn't get more 80s than that. Besides from the highly exaggerated clothing style. So the Decepticons, Starscream and Soundwave are hypnotizing people with a dancing club called Dancertron. Very original. For reasons... I don't know why, but this episode gives us finally a standoff between Blaster and Soundwave. Oh yeah. You poor excuse for a sound system. All dark, no shock. That's it. Uh, okay. I mean, heck, at least we get to hear Soundwave laugh again. So Blaster upgrades his sonic power to defeat Soundwave, and it's very effective. I need some extra punch, and here's the punch I need! Well, at least they got a rematch in Headmasters. Oh yeah, I remember, they both killed each other. But yeah, this episode, it was alright, and it actually has a fun ending. Episode 53, The Search for Alpha Trion. This is the episode where Shockwave really hates females. Female. Octopus Prime discovers that his girlfriend, who we thought was dead, Alita One, is in the hands of the Decepticons. So Octopus Prime speeds to Cybertron to rescue her, only to end up discovering something about his own history in the process. But how would you know, Alpha Trion? Only my creator could know that. An educated guess, Prime. Activate. Whoa, steady on Prime. This is a kid's show, remember? Now, I love this episode, but I know someone else who also loves this episode. One of the absolute best Transformers reviewers on YouTube, my good friend Ultra Primal. So, take it away, Ultra. Welcome back to my G1 Retro Reviews. Today, we're taking a look at the original Transformers series episode, The Search for Alpha Trion. Hey, wait a minute. Didn't I already review this episode? And this isn't even my channel. Oh, right. I'm doing a mini review for Comet and Cam. Well, this episode was one of my favorites in G1. Starting off, this is the first episode in the franchise to feature true female Transformers. Before this, we would have Nightbird, but she wasn't actually a Cybertronian. At least not in this series. This is the first time we have any girl Transformers in the show. And I think they're awesome! They all get quick little moments to show off their cool moves. And each of them have boyfriends of sorts! How quaint! The girls have come to rescue their boyfriends! That is, except for Greenlight and Lancer. 
who don't get any lines and are barely seen compared to the other girls. However, in future fiction, Greenlight and Lancer would be retconned to be in a lesbian relationship together. Meaning that this might be some of the first LGBTQ plus representation in a children's cartoon. If, you know, not wholly intended to be at the time. As well as containing our first official girl Transformers, this episode also has some connections to others in the series. A rarity in this show, especially for episodes that weren't explicitly part of a multi-parter. This episode flashes back to the events on Cybertron at the very beginning of the series, giving us a little bit more lore from that time, with Alita and the other ladies being there for the Ark's departure. I want to go with you! It's too dangerous! Go back! Hmm, I wonder. How would things have been different had they boarded the ship with the boys? This episode also references the future episode, War Dawn! Another one of the best episodes in this show, where we learn that Optimus Prime and Alita One were originally the young couple, Orion Pax and Ariel. That is, before having their first run-in with Megatron and the Decepticons, and later being rebuilt by Alpha Trion. Some of the connections are a bit wonky, probably because these episodes were written by different writers and such, but it's still really cool that they're there. Not something you usually see in a serialized 80s cartoon. My only real complaint about this episode is that the girls don't show up again in future ones. But the search for Alpha Trion is definitely one of my favorite episodes in G1. Episode 54, The Girl Who Loved Powerglide. So a newly orphaned debutante must protect her late father's work from Megatron and she finds Powerglide, which sparks a new romance. Of sorts. Well, whoever you are, I think you're completely the greatest. Uh, thanks! Now listen! Oh, I want to go flying again! Aw, oh, come on! Will you shut up and listen? Dude just tossed her around like she was a cabbage. So this is the episode where scale doesn't matter, really. We've got to get you out of here! It's dangerous! So Powerglide falls in love. Nobody tell Moonracer. We have a new human character called Astoria. Now, this woman, whether you love her or you hate her, you can't deny that she manages to somehow destroy everything in her path. And you know what? I kind of love her for it. I think he's wonderful. You do. Oh, wow. He's tall, he's handsome, he's shiny, <laughs> and he can fly. Yeah, well, there's a few things he can't do, you know. What are you doing? Terrific. Okay, so that time it wasn't her fault. <laughs> How the hell does that even happen? Now this episode by modern times is definitely outdated, but as a kid this was kind of a guilty pleasure episode and I can never really explain why. I just found this episode so hilarious by just how stupid it is. And in a way I look at it as a parody of like stereotypes. Like when Megatron interrogates Astoria for her father's energy formula and watching him just get so mad and frustrated. It's just... Tell me what you know! All I know is that you're a complete and total utter- SILENCE! I do not believe this! I never thought I'd witness Megatron go through so much pain. When are you guys gonna feed me? That's what I wanna know. Your dumb machine leg like, doesn't even work and- Enough! Remember when Soundwave could telepathically scan people's brains? Yeah, regardless, I think he would've had a tough time with Astoria. Subject's mind completely empty. Impossible! Oh, the stuff they got away with back then, eh? I don't believe this is an attack on all women. I think it's just an attack on Astoria. But you gotta admit, she did destroy the Decepticons' plans. I actually think she's kind of smart here. It looks like Hook's just popping out of the window. <laughs> well, at least this episode finally taught the Decepticons a lesson to implement some force fields. Energize the force fields! What force fields? I can't go on with this episode, so I'm going to give it to someone who also remembers this episode very fondly as a child. Uh, Gavin! 
I am an ancient being born way before mankind was civilized enough to introduce on-demand digital home media. So when I was young, access to episodes of the Transformers was limited to moments where you were lucky enough to be home when it was on TV or costly VHS tapes. Now, I only had a few back then, but my favourite was a tape that contained the episodes Heavy Metal War and The Girl Who Loved Power Glide, two very different episodes, which looking back probably did a lot to show me how versatile the Transformers franchise could be. The Girl Who Loved Power Glide is absolutely a product of its time, one which conforms to the supposed gender norms of the 1980s, the lads get stuff done and the women are best left in the relative safety of the back seat. You! You're the problem! Get out of here! You're jinxing the controls! Oh no, I'm staying with... Through a modern lens, it becomes a cautionary tale because of this, as much as a morality play. Powerglide acts every bit the chauvinist we've seen a million times in other action comedies of the era, with his robotic heart softening as we follow his adventures with Astoria Carlton Ritz, a girl with such apparent daddy issues that it's no wonder she fell for the first guy that looked her way, even a millions of years old robotic warrior from Cybertron. I mean, like, I care about you. You saved my life. Of course, you wouldn't feel anything like that about me. Of course not. You're a robot. You're above all those kinds of things. Well, maybe I kinda, sort of, possibly feel that I think you're a... Decepticon! It's a powerful episode in that it was the first time I'd really seen one of the Transformers exhibit emotion that was wholly disconnected from the context of the conflict they were in. You know, I'd seen Autobots make some fun quips, sure, but falling in love? You know, it placed the entire concept of the show on another level for me. These weren't just automatons duking it out over resources. They were real living things that could love as hard as they fought. It also lit the spark of the concept that love has no boundaries. And though we may look different or have completely different backgrounds, love is love. You know, there's something really nice about that being introduced to me in the Transformers of all things. Well, I gotta be going. Uh, uh, next time I'm in town, would it be okay if I uh, looked you up? That would be wonderful. <laughs> Hardly the best episode of the Sunbow Run, The Girl Who Loved Power Glide is more of a fun time capsule than anything else. It's not like I'd recommend it unless you're currently a four-year-old kid from Scotland in 1986, in which case, how are you even watching this video? Everyone else, you can watch my Toy Reviews Done Quick series over at trdq.org. I don't know if I'm allowed to plug my stuff on here, so just edit that out if not. And, and no, in fact, don't. Episode 55, Hoist Goes Hollywood. In this episode, Hoist meets famous Hollywood movie director, Michael Bay. Hmm, genius. Hi, I'm Michael Bay, director of Hollywood hits such as Transformers. Yep, that's it. That's the episode. The Autobots go to Hollywood, because they want to be in a movie. This is the Transformers at their finest. Strangely enough, this does actually kind of foreshadow how the Transformers are in the Michael Bay movies. Uh, listen, Hoist, this crashing business isn't exactly the kind of acting I had in mind. Yeah, my joints sound like they haven't been lubed in a year. You know the director. Talk to him. Uh, tell him we want to do some real acting. I'll see what I can do. I can't even tell where one robot begins and the other ends. <laughs> <laughs> and just like in this episode, the Autobots are used as set pieces for a big blockbuster Hollywood movie. With very little or no character development. And that's what happens in this episode really, the director is using the Transformers as just set pieces for Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher. Yes, we've got Indiana Jones and Star Wars references in this episode. Yeah, who gets kissed? What do I get? Just gonna clear up, if you're new to my channel and this is like somehow the first video you've watched and you're up to this point, thank you by the way. I don't actually hate the movies, there's certain charms of the movies that I've grown to really love. I mean, I grew up with them for God's sake. There's something rewatchable about them in some way. Like, despite all their faults, I think the first three Transformers live action movies are some of the finest blockbuster movies to ever grace cinema. Like, the sound engineering is bang on perfect. I definitely think we're stirring in the right direction with films such as Bumblebee. Like, I'm very excited now for the future of the Transformers movies, and I think I love these movies just a little bit more now because that era of the action set pieces is kind of over. Not that that was ever the real problem, the real problem was that there was little character development with any of the characters. The focus on the humans instead of the actual Transformers was really what downplayed a lot of the movies for me. Make no mistake though, these live action movies definitely brought a lot of life back into the franchise and engaged brand new fans. 
There was just a lot of character choices with Autobots and Decepticons that just didn't really kind of make sense to me. I mean, heck, even Optimus Prime's voice actor, Peter Cullen, who at this point knows the character better than anybody, had a few issues with some of his lines throughout the movies. And there was only one director that ever told me, he said, well, just say it anyway, I, 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 I want to have it, I want to have it. I, I just don't feel comfortable. So, well, listen, uh, just read the line. And it's just not Optimus, you know? It wasn't Optimus. I'll kill them all. Honestly, I think it's a crime that he's not had a cameo of himself playing a truck driver or something. Like, come on, just think about how cool that would be. In this episode, we have a return of Carly and Spike. Now, it's been a while since we've seen Spike, but he is now Ginger. Oh, that's a shame. It's just an animation error. They end up accidentally crashing a movie set and almost an accident occurs and Hoist saves the day, and that impresses Michael Bay, so he offers him a job. They call me Hoist. What a name. Good job, Moist. He calls him Moist throughout the whole episode. Oh, uh, Hoist can't, but I will. But you're not a vehicle robot. Well, I'll fake it. I'll fake it. You've already done that, Spike. Didn't work, did it? The Autobots get wind of Hoist being in Hollywood, and they want in on the action. And you know, this actually makes up for some good comedy. I like Tracks, Powerglide, Warpath, and even Sunstreaker's attempt on trying to be big movie stars. Hey, boys, we're gonna be movie stars! Yeah! Sadly, none of these guys made it past Michael Bay. With the Autobots feeling unsatisfied with their roles in the movie, Michael Bay decides to revamp the script. Oh wait, ha hang on a minute, who misspelled tracks? Anyway, the Autobots are assigned to their new roles in the movie, but are disappointed once again. I feel like a fool. Do you want to quit? No, but I still feel like a fool. Action! You know, it's kind of worth it just to see Indiana Jones cry. Oh no! <laughs> Damn. Oh yeah, so also the Decepticons are in this episode. They're after Wheeljack's um, ultimate weapon, which turns out to be just junkyard crap. But anyway, Dirge... <laughs> well, let's just talk about Dirge in this episode. Mayday, mayday. Can Dirge carry out a simple mission? I think the answer is obvious. You ever notice in the series how Dirge always seems to have a bad day? He always seems to get bullied a lot. We've also got Megatron being abusive to Starscream more than usual in this episode. You insolent pile of scrap iron! How, how was I to know? I did what you told me, I followed your orders! I warned you, Starscream! I've had enough of you and your ideas! Megatron, don't! Don't! I'm too valuable to this the Decepticons figure that if they don't delete the evidence of when they were filmed taking the weapon away, then the Autobots will make a counter weapon and it'll all be for nothing. So Rumble does what he does best, he blows up the place. Hey, take it easy. It isn't worth getting this upset, is it? Well, maybe you're right. And we can use the explosion in the film! Oh my god, he is Michael Bay. Anyway, the episode ends with Hoist killing Carly and Spike. You and the rest of the Decepticons get out, or I'll drop them and your precious film into this pit of flesh-eating lava. <laughs> Episode 56, The Key to Vector Sigma Part 1. Megatron hatches a plan to create a new team of Decepticons that will give him supremacy on the roads. It only took us 56 episodes in, but we got there. In this episode, we get brand new Decepticons called the Stunticons. I am Ultra Master! I swear loyalty to you! I am Dead End. I guess I'll have to do what you say. I'm... I'm Breakdown. I'll obey too. I am Dragstrip. I live to obey! I'm Wild Rider! And I wanna bust something up! And when combined, they become Menasaur. A goth punk icon. They are created by Megatron and the Decepticons, but to have personalities, they're going to need Vector Sigma, which is a supercomputer that gave life to all Transformers personalities. Didn't do a very good job, did it? It existed even before Cybertron. Megatron, however, needs a circuit key to activate it, so he seeks out Alpha Trion, who is on Cybertron. The Decepticons somehow manage to mold Alpha Trion into the metal. Oh, that looks weird. Sadly, the Autobots are too late, and the Stunticons are born. Huh. Megatron actually accomplished something in this episode. I think that might be because Starscream isn't in this one. But yeah, I like this episode. Part 1's pretty solid. The tone of this is a lot more serious than other episodes we've had lately. And I just like the idea of Rumble just stealing all of these cars. What in the world? You mean Rumble takes it! Uh, 
Episode 57, The Key to Vector Sigma Part 2. So to counter the new Stunticon team, the Autobots create the Aerial Bots, that when combined, form Superion. We have Silver Bolt, Air Raid, and um, uh, okay. I love how we get introductions to these guys one by one, but then when it comes to Firefly, Optimus Prime is just blocking his view. Like, nope, you're not getting any screen time. Then we've got Skydive and Slingshot. Because it only took 57 episodes for the Autobots to fly- Ooh, hang on a minute, forget that, never mind. With the key of Vector Sigma in Megatron's possession, the Autobots can't actually give the Aerial Bots life, but Alpha Trion, with him being a first generation product of Vector Sigma, can pretty much activate it by himself by just merging his life force, which pretty much means he's going to sacrifice himself to give these guys life. I am Vector Sigma. Before Cybertron was, I was. It sounds like Optimus Prime is taking a shit. Jesus Christ, my eardrums are bursting. Alpha Trion tells the Autobots that the key's presence on Earth could be devastating to the planet with its amounts of energy. Uh, yeah, sure, okay. Also, Omega Supreme dies. You know, it baffles me why the Aerial Bots are in Prime's trailer when they can fly. But you know, I like how the Aerial Bots do have kind of an attitude on them. I mean, heck, if I was born like just five minutes ago, I'd be like, um, no mate, I'm not being part of your war. Oh, you just burned because they were more than you could handle. Why, you little punk. Okay, never mind. No one talks to Ironhide like that. Also, Silverbolt having a fear of heights is just genius writing. No, I'm not being sarcastic. It's actually an interesting character plot. Silverbolt, I've got an idea. I'm making you commander of the aerial bots. Yeah, Prime, that's really smart. The aerial bots conclude that the humans aren't worth saving after watching television. A man wants to explore. To explore. Girl, I wanna make you mine. Yeah, come on. No doubt you look so fine. Whoa. I think they're trying to tell us something. So this is one of the few episodes where Megatron insults Soundwave. Even though Soundwave tripping over on the branch actually does lead to Megatron discovering that the key can be used to make everything metal. Aw, Megatron just wants to decorate. The aerial bots actually do end up helping the Autobots out in the end because while well, we see Sparkplug helping Omega Supreme, and that makes them realise that the humans are worth saving because they're willing to help out the Autobots even though they're really small. And at the end of the episode we have Menasaur vs Superion, some good Combiner Wars action. You know, this is actually a good episode. It's pretty much one of the better two parlors of the entire series. And I just like that Silverbolt conquered his fear of heights at the end of the episode. It's what makes this episode more memorable to me. Episode 59, War Dawn. Now yes, I've just skipped episode 58, Aerial Assault. That's because we have a big continuity issue, that being the Combaticons appearing, without having their origin story in Starscream's Brigade. So Aerial Assault needs to take place after the Revenge of Bruticus, but it also takes place after War Dawn as well, because the Aerial Bots have no problem fighting the Decepticons, and they're not jerks to humans. I'm not going to change the number of the episode, because while well, we're still following production order, but I'll just talk about Aerial Assault later on. Okay, now on to the episode. Trapped in Cybertron's past, the Aerial Bots learn the truth about Megatron, and the rise of Optimus Prime. Finally, this is one of my favourite episodes. It's got rich characters, a rich story, so much lore. Oh hey Cam, what's up? Let me guess, you want to talk about this episode? That's actually my favourite episode, I was gonna pick that one. Yep, how did I figure, yeah. Cam, are you jealous that I'm gonna be talking about this one, and not you? <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, War Dawn. All right, spill it before I go crazy. Hello, my name is Road Russell, and my favorite episode is War Dawn. It's not just because it has the origin of Optimus Prime, but also because it's a really clever delivery of an important message. The writer David Wise was tasked with making an Aerial Bots episode and was inspired by the effect action films such as Rambo had on young minds. So he decided that the aerial bot should be infatuated with the Decepticons similarly. You talk about those Decepticons as if you admire them, Slingshot. They're well built, resourceful, and they're superior to humans in just about every way. They're also evil guys. And to make them realize how horrible the Decepticons are, they'd send them back in time to the first shot of the war, which would be the origin of Optimus Prime. I was wrong, my friends. I admired Megatron merely because he was powerful. I failed to see how he used that power. 
<laughs> it's okay. We've all made the same mistake. Learning that it's not just about having power, but what you do with it. Do you protect or destroy? The aerial bots come to understand the reason why the Decepticons must be stopped. <laughs> that Megatron! I'll pay him back for this if it's the last thing I do! And he's the guy you wanted to be pals with! And are responsible for how a simple dock worker becomes a hero to us all. Seeing Golden Age Cybertron is a treat, it's an unseen and interesting time where their society was a little different with Guardian robots and stuff like that. The lack of a head will limit its maneuverability. A warrior doesn't need a head, just a good, strong body. I still think this is a great and clean Optimus origin. Megatron raiding energy houses to steal Energon, killing anyone who opposes him inside. This shot right here, he kills Orion Pax and it doesn't even phase him, but Orion returns as Optimus Prime, the living consequence of Megatron's callous cruelty. You've caused enough destruction for one day, Megatron. I haven't even started. You! Who are you? Your worst nightmare. The animation in general is inconsistent, but I really like this one shot of Optimus that's really wide. Reminds me of his Cyberverse and Earth Spark selves. I like myself a Chonkamus Prime. But yeah, it just ties things together very neatly, narratively, and provides some great character development and backstory. There's a lot more I can get into, like how Ariel becomes Alita 1, some more Alpha Trion, how I think Dion is actually Ultra Magnus. The execution is far from perfect, but it's got a strong core, which is why G1 gets the love it gets. It could be done better, but the value is in the ideas that can hopefully be expanded by future writers taking them to their full potential. And War Dawn is a great example of that. My favorite episode of G1. Thanks, Cam, for having me. Episode 60, Trans Europe Express. In a plot to obtain a Cybertronian weather controlling device, the Decepticons stage a fake race across Europe. I guess we're back to the less serious episodes, huh? The episode starts quite peacefully, however five seconds pass and then it becomes chaos. Oh dear. You know, I don't even know what to say. I'm just going to let the footage roll and um, let you all just take this in. I would never reveal his whereabouts to hoodlums such as you. 1024 Draymond Street behind the herb vendor shop next to the mosque of Sultan Selim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, can we move on from stereotypes now? So yeah, Megatron's after a device called the Pearl of Bahudin, and you're gonna remember that name, because it gets mentioned almost every 5 seconds. I'm serious, take a shot every time the Pearl of Bahudin gets mentioned. You'll have alcohol poisoning, you'll die. The Pearl of Bahudin. If the Pearl of Bahudin is ba Something called the Pearl of Bahudin! The Pearl of Bahudin! The Pearl of Bahudin! The Pearl of Bahudin! Build a new controller for the Pearl of Bahudin! What happened? Have you ever heard of the Pearl of Bahudin? He gets too lazy to find it for himself, so he hires an archaeologist. Seriously? You're robots, and you don't have a device that's like a metal detector? Meanwhile, the Autobots are taking place in a race called the Europa 2000, which goes from France to Turkey, and they're doing this all for charity. And wow, I think my brain just broke. I mean, I guess no one did geography on the writers' team here. Like, France somehow became like a dominant superpower in Europe, and Greece is just gone. I can't look at this. My, my brain, it's going to explode. And one of the racers, called Augie, who, trust me, he becomes a pain in the ass throughout this episode, he doesn't like the idea of the Autobots racing because he thinks with them being advanced robots that they're more likely to win the race. These Autobots have computer brains! They're robots, not regulation cars! No, no, Augie, remember, this is for charity. Seriously, I thought we stopped with the stereotypes. I want that million bucks. Who was that? An absolute prick. I love how up to this point we've seen Bumblebee as like this caring, loving Autobot who loves humans, but in this episode, he's having none of it. 
this in you? Didn't anyone ever tell you about fair play? I'm gonna win that million- The Stunticons are knocking the Autobots down on the road, except for Blue Streak who manages to get away, and ends up coming across the archaeologist. But what happened? Have you ever heard of- No, shut up. So for some reason the Decepticons actually need Augie's car because there's some kind of metal that will help with the pearl. I don't know. Anyway, why do we even need to finish the race? Aren't fighting off the Decepticons a little bit more important? Anyway, Megatron gives us a pearl history lesson because, well, why not? We've got time. And somehow Bumblebee is able to just like straight up take the pearl from Megatron. Bumblebee? It can control all the elements and just do so much damage to the weather. So with that knowledge in mind, Bumblebee decides just to use it to get away from the Decepticons. Because that's smart. Blue Streak, let him have it! Such senseless violence! My thoughts exactly. Anyway, Menasaur just dies and Bumblebee saves the day. And they find out that the whole race was actually staged by Megatron, so there's no money for charity. So Augie decides to like just give them the pearl so they can sell it for loads of money. And there's kind of a redemption arc for him, but eh, nah, he's still a prick. <laughs> Episode 61, Cosmic Rust. After finding a new weapon, Megatron becomes infected with a strange disease, one that he intends to use against the Autobots. So yeah, they just find this randomly while they're out in space, but they get warned of this infection actually on the planet. But like Decepticon fashion, they completely ignore it. Oh yeah, Starscream's back. You know, it's been weird not seeing him in his last few episodes. He definitely adds a lot to the show when he shows up. So the Decepticons rub on a bug to activate it? Okay. As they travel back to Earth, an asteroid is somehow chasing them, and Megatron blasts it with the bug weapon. And as it explodes, a part of it gets inside of Megatron. And he becomes infected with Cosmic Rust. Basically, it's the Black Plague to the Transformers. Actually, the writer of this episode, Paul Davids, mentioned that the idea of a plague spreading amongst the Transformers was actually inspired by the AIDS crisis of the 1980s. It was in the mid-1980s and the AIDS crisis had hit full-blown. And it was absolutely devastating. We lost a lot of top creative people in Hollywood during those years. And, you know, that was the inspiration. What if there's a disease that's spreading among the uh, Decepticons and then to the Autobots, and how are they going to stop it? Anyway, on to the Autobots now, and we're in New York, as Perceptor is being awarded for his creation on Corostop, a solution which prevents rust and corrosion. Yahoo! Come on, Aerialbots! We're going to spray all Lady Liberty! Whoa, wait, you're going to what? Okay, people, this is a mutiny. No, no, a hijack. I mean, we're taking over this boat. Snap to it, everybody. I don't even know where to begin on explaining how they managed to kidnap Perceptor by using a ferry. I bet Megatron came up with this genius scheme, didn't he? You can stay laughing. Job's almost finished. <laughs> okay, now that was a perfect cut. Welcome, <coughs> Perceptor. Please dispense with the formalities. You are my mortal enemy, and <sighs> Ugh, it's hideous. You know, I really like the fact that Megatron is crying like a baby in this episode. Kill me, kill me now! Now look what you've done. With Megatron now looking like a polished turd, he's going to use this cosmic rust against the Autobots. Oh hey, look about, we got a group shot of all the Autobots. Huh, with all those Autobots, and we still haven't defeated the Decepticons. Wow, okay, now that's just sadistic. The Autobots get infected with cosmic rust because, well, Optimus Prime is very unwise in this episode. But I've never seen problem solving quite like this before. More than meets the eye. You know, I just love how it escalates so quickly in this episode. Megatron thinks he's beating the Autobots, but no, just two seconds pass, and it's a completely different story. I never thought the end would come like this. Rest in peace, Prime! We did it! We're going to be saved! What? You know, I just can't believe the imagery. We've got the Autobots and Decepticons fighting at the Statue of Liberty in an all-out combiner wars over a bug weapon that makes their metal rust. 
The only thing to really note about this episode is that it's Sparkplug's last appearance. So it's like, uh, that's kind of sad, because he just kind of phased out towards the end of Season 2, and from what I know, he was supposed to be in Season 3, the first episode of Five Faces of Darkness, but he got cut. So I'm just going to take on canon here that he died. He died of being an old man. Thank you, Sparkplug, for having a weird name and being a cool dad and for doing stuff sometimes. In your memory, we're going to name you after a dog in Transformers Animated. Goodbye. Episode 62, Starscream's Brigade. Yay, Starscream. After his latest attempt to overthrow Megatron's rule of the Decepticons, he is banished from HQ. But this time, he hatches a plan. So in this episode, we have the Combaticons, a military group that when formed, combine into Bruticus. Brawl! Swindle! Blast off! Vortex! And Onslaught! Who are you? And what are we doing in these crude carcasses? So in this episode, we have a clash of boyfriends. Starscream is jealous of Shockwave because... I don't know, because he's got one eye? Shockwave this! Shockwave that! All I ever hear about is how great Shockwave is! Shockwave is an ideal soldier! He's both humble and respectful! Anyway, this argument leads to Starscream to outright attack Megatron, and you know, I'd say it escalated pretty quickly, but this is Megatron and Starscream, so I can't say I'm surprised. Starscream for some reason believes he's defeated Megatron, though we all know that he can't be beaten that easily. Oh my god, what's up with Soundwave? Oh, okay, that's better. Because of his actions, Megatron finally banishes Starscream. And it only took us 62 episodes. Once again, I can't explain why these moments make me laugh. While on Insanity Beach, Starscream stumbles upon old World War II vehicles and decides to create his own warriors. But first he must travel to Cybertron to collect... Energon cubes? Okay, so the Combaticon's creation kind of makes no sense. It's pretty wild. He puts personality components, which actually just look like Energon cubes, into five old World War II vehicles. But somehow they transform into modern vehicles instead of the old World War II vehicles, which they were based on. You know, I don't actually care how we got there. At least we got there. The Combaticons have all of the Transformers combiners are my favourite. I just feel like their vehicle modes and their personalities are a lot more memorable. You know, I actually prefer Bruticus than Devastator. Whoa, I know that might be kind of controversial, but when I come up with my own Transformers shows, it's fun writing about these guys. I just like their personalities a lot more. Well, would you look at that? A fan project based on the Combaticons is about to get its first pilot by Keenan Carlisle. Damn, dreams do come true. So on the Autobot side, Earth builds a memorial to Optimus Prime before he's even dead? Huh, some good foreshadowing that. I have with me two members of the Autobot team, Jazz and Cliff Jump. That's Cliff Jumper. Uh, yes, Cliff Jumper. They have been invited here as guests of honor to officially cut the ribbon at this. So Jazz and Cliff Jumper are captured by Starscream, but Megatron thinks that Optimus Prime stole the personality circuits on Cybertron. But Optimus Prime thinks that Megatron captured Jazz and Cliffjumper. But I just want to mention that in a record for the entire series, Megatron calls for a retreat in this episode three times, all within eight minutes. Now that is something. Well, their little domestic squabble is none of our concern, but rescuing Jazz and Cliffjumper is. Autobots, transform! Wait, wait, why is that music playing? It's not the end of the episode, is it? Wait, wait, we're not done with this episode just yet. We've still got, like, what, ten minutes left? No, no. Look, we're transitioning to a new scene. Starscream member Combaticons are low on energy, so they decide to milk their boobies? Mm, this is more like it. What show am I watching right now? Megatron gathers all the Decepticons together in preparation of taking down Starscream. We will exterminate him and those who follow him! Nope. Not gonna work. Oh, come on. What did we talk about? I'm taking this from a robot that turns into a canoe? When there's a battle on a gently moving river, you'll want me. With the Stunticons causing too much havoc on the street, Megatron instead assigns Devastator the task on taking on the Combaticons that eventually combine to form Bruticus. <laughs> Why 
Why are they all moaning? You know, this is actually a fun scene. It's kind of good to see Starscream get the upper hand, and Megatron having to declare him as the new leader of the Decepticons. But the Stunticons show up, much to their dismay. Honestly, Dead End is such a mood here. Megatron's in trouble. Who cares? It looks like Starscream's defeated him. So? So you think Starscream's gonna stop here? Good point. He never knows when to quit. And literally, Menasaur just body slams Starscream. I guess that's one way to end the episode quick. Bruticus? No, Starscream! Not Bruticus! It's Megatron, your leader! Megatron, don't please! Ah, so I see we're back to normal. Oh, never mind, he actually banishes him. But wait, why didn't he just destroy him? It's just, come on, it's, it's that easy. I guess somewhere deep in Megatron's processor, he does have a soft spot for Starscream. That goes really kind of unexplained. You'll regret that you did not destroy me, Megatron! I shall have my revenge! Spoiler alert. He doesn't. Oh. Sorry, uh, the transition got all drunk all of a sudden. How many shots are you having? Episode 63, The Revenge of Bruticus. So yes, this is technically a two-parter. So following on from the last episode, even though Starscream and the Combaticons are banished to space, they are still a threat. Shocking. A threat to destroy both Autobots and Decepticons. We're only five seconds into the episode and Starscream's already reenacting my childhood trauma from school. I can't stand it! I can't stand it! This is a cosmic prison! Shut up! You're too cruel to accomplish anything! I beg your pardon! <laughs> oh, I just love how British Onslaught is. Record Sentinel Guard response time and accuracy. Holographic target selected. Target projected. Every time we get a shockwave scene, he's always tired. I feel so sorry for him. So yeah, we're only minutes into the episode and Bruticus has somehow already taken over Cybertron by using shockwave against his own drones. It's just, wow, it was that easy. Mission accomplished. You know what, whatever, it was worth it just so we could get this. Welcome aboard, Shockwave. It looks like we've got a planet to reclaim. Okay, I want to take this time to complain about Blastoff. His face annoys me. As a kid, I always figured it was an animation error. And it's like, what? For some reason, the animators interpreted the purple part as like a visor when he clearly has eyes. You can see those eyes. They should be purple. Why aren't they purple? How is it so hard to misinterpret a character's face model? Anyway, I just wanted to get that off my chest. It's been on my mind for years. Oh, also, we have Insecticons in this episode. But more importantly, we have the introduction to the Protector Bots that, when combined, form Defensor. And we don't get an origin story at all to where they came from. They just exist. We only have Groove and First Aid in their robot modes, but First Aid is the only one who actually gets named. You know, to say this is a toy show, this is actually really bad advertisement. But this was all because their inclusion was very last minute. They have more spotlight episodes in season 3, but for their big debut, eh, you can just tell they were shoehorned in. Anyway, something happens with the Earth's orbit that sends it on a collision course or whatever. But back on Cybertron, Shockwave is able to fool the Combaticons into fighting illusions. Yeah. And with Earth in imminent danger, Shockwave attempts to try and save Megatron. Megatron? Destroyed? Ugh, Starscream, please, don't even try to pretend. With the Earth heading towards the Sun, the Autobots and Decepticons team up, with Megatron and Optimus Prime donating parts to the device that the Insecticons destroyed, so they can travel to Cybertron to stop the Combaticons and save the Earth. And they're able to defeat Bruticus by destroying the three dots on the back of him that Starscream installed as a failed safe device. Yes, it was that easy. And he couldn't have done that sooner. You know, I really wanted them to explore more on why the Combaticons' personality chips were, like, stored away for millions of years. Like, what did they do that made Megatron just be like, nope, you're going in a drawer. It ends kind of sad for the Combaticons because they get rewired and they're going to now follow Megatron's orders. And Starscream, well, of course, Starscream's back on Megatron's team. He just can't get rid of him. Something that kind of goes unexplained throughout the franchise. I mean, what can I say? Megatron has a soft spot for Starscream. Episode 58, Aerial Assault. We finally got there. 
Slingshot and Skydive go undercover to discover who is responsible for the theft of the planes in the Middle East. We have a fun action sequence at the beginning with the aerial bots and the combaticons, but Slingshot takes cover in a cave and gets trapped. Forget about them. Slingshot needs rescuing. He got buried alive. And getting him out will present an interesting problem in engineering. All right, Hoist. The coast is clear. Seriously? This is your plan? You really couldn't have come up with another solution? Yeah, this episode's kind of boring. It's just the Combaticons going up against the aerial bots, and it's fine, it's got some good action, but it's mostly just about Slingshot and Skydive getting badly damaged, then getting robbed by plane nappers. Yeah, no, seriously, plane nappers. Their parts get robbed, and they do absolutely nothing about it. Slingshot gets a bad retool. Hey, there's nothing to worry about! We can always use parts from this! <laughs> hey! Hey, that's not bad at all. Seems like it fits right in. Never let this kid work at Hasbro. The only interesting thing about this episode is the Decepticon's new fortress. It's literally a bird. I guess Megatron's been reading a book of mythical creatures on Earth or something? I don't care, I kinda dig it. If the GoBots can have a dog for a base, then I think the Decepticons can have a bird. They also shamelessly use Spike's model and just slap another character's name on it. Is that sure? Okay. But then it turns out that Hassan was actually Prince Jamal the whole time, and he was just going undercover. I mean, Hassan and Slingshot aren't the strongest human pairing in this series, but I mean, they had a pretty good ending. Ugh, I'm sorry if I don't sound so enthusiastic about this episode. Apparently, tonally, I have a very depressing voice. Episode 64, Masquerade. The Autobots basically poses for Stunticons to learn of Megatron's new plan. What could go wrong? You know, they never actually really explain how the Autobots are able to disguise themselves as the Stunticons. They're ready, Optimus. The new Stunticons. Um, that's not Ratchet's voice. I hate it. Breakdown, alias Sideswipe. Dead End, alias Jazz. Wild Rider, alias Windcharger. And Dragstrip? Dragstrip? A.K.A. Mirage. One stolen ruby, a red, wasn't it? Okay then, we're ready. The way how they actually capture the Stunticons though is actually kind of brutal. I don't know, it feels like the Autobots are Decepticons. I'm not really used to an Autobot plan working out so early into the episode. Spike's also in this episode. This is his last appearance before he ages up. He talks an awful lot in this episode, and I don't like it. Optimus, you're not gonna play chicken with that recall model, are you? Man, Optimus, you're a dead ringer for Motormaster. Did you have to say dead ringer, Spike? Shut the fuck up! With the Autobots successfully disguising themselves as the Stunticons, they head off to Megatron to figure out what his big plan is. Strange, isn't it, Megatron? How safely the Stunticons drive today? So as not to damage their stolen cargo, Starscream. Perhaps. Wow, it took Starscream just two seconds to see right through that whole charade. You know what? I think he should be the leader. It also takes only just two seconds for the Stunticons to break free from Autobot headquarters. Of course, I've got to mention the infamous animation error shot where Ratchet is so teeny tiny, he woke up and decided to be a core class figure. Unfortunately, this episode marks the final appearances of Trailbreaker, one of my favourites, Sideswipe, Inferno, and my boy, Trax. No more Trax, what are we gonna do? Eh, probably just have a little cry, I guess. Anyway, we've got two Menosaurs going at each other, and you know what, this is actually kind of fun. It's fun to see the Autobots kind of do something different for a change, a bit more kind of schemish. And as for Megatron's ultimate weapon, well, it inevitably gets destroyed. Mine experienced me! Megatron, something's wrong! Your scene appears unstable. Suggest abandoning it. Suggestion noted and ignored! <laughs> Yeah, that pretty much just sums up Megatron's entire character arc. Alright, episode 65, Bot. We made it. We made it to the worst episode ever. After Swindle sells the components of his fellow Combaticons, three kids get their hands on Brawl's brain, using it to make a bot. Um, okay, so this is not my favourite episode, but it is Brian's, from TFanPage101, I don't know what to say, Brian, so uh, now you go. So clearly the best episode of Transformers Generation 1 is called BOT or B-O-T, which stands for Bruticus, oh, tough luck. So what happens in this episode is Bruticus gets blown to bits. Oh. 
And so Swindle is the only one that survives, and he sells out all the parts because, you know, he's a mercenary that kind of does that thing. He's a selfish bot. And Megatron finds out, and he's like, no, I'm going to plant a bomb in your noggin, and you're going to rebuild everyone. And he's missing a part, but he tries to build everyone else, and Megatron's like, no, you get that part, because I can't have incomplete robots. I can't sell them on eBay. Swindle! Megatron, I, I, I couldn't find Brawl's personality component. So he goes out and tries to find the part, but oh no, these rotten, spoiled little kids are trying to make a science project. Oh, Mr. Robbins just told me we're supposed to work together. I think you should work together. And they make Bot, which is the best thing ever. I mean, it's a bionicle that turns into a ball, but it's in both modes, and then it's got a Lego head on top of it. It's the coolest robot ever. Bot, say Martin. I must have put something in backwards. And he's going on a rampage because, oh no, that part is inside Bot. We came all the way out here for that hunk of junk? Don't insult him. It makes him mad. And so he's just having a rampage, which, you know, I guess everyone has a tantrum nowadays. You know, especially when you're dealing with rotten kids like that. I don't blame him for breaking the cables in the elevator. Anyway, Swindle eventually gets that bot piece, and, you know, Bruticus is formed once again, and oh no, the kids figure out what the bot thing somehow. Well, it's just a good thing that there's no way to find out for sure, because I don't think we should get involved, do you? I think you should, Joe. I don't think I want to. You don't want to? Why don't you show a little follow through? Jump. Please, I... I just want to get down. I'm not down. suggesting anymore. Jump. Oh, they're trying to build a machine that's going to wipe out the moon. Yeah, it's dark as the moon, I guess. But they're going to test it on the Autobots. So the kids go to wherever the Autobots are, and they're like, hey, they're going to use this weapon. You might want to do something about it. And then so they get the upper hand by actually knowing what the Decepticons are going to do. And then a whole bunch of other mess starts happening. <laughs> I can't control it. It's working by itself. You know, the Autobots win and whatnot. I think this episode has everything you'd adore. Poor editing that makes you really concentrate on what's going on, otherwise you're gonna get lost, so it's really a, a focus group type of thing. Also has Blades attempting murder. Stay calm! We're coming up for you! And also Streetwise Lips, which is adorable. Obviously, this episode gets an 8 out of 7. Watch it now! I'd say that about wraps it up. Yep. What the hell just happened? The Transformers will return after these messages. So here is my episode ranking for Season 2, Part 2. Of course, my favourite episode, like I said, is The Golden Lagoon. It's just a timeless classic to me, and it's one of the few G1 episodes that's actually trying to say something. And my least favourite, well, you've just seen it. Bot. I, I just honestly, I don't even need to explain it. Brian just summed it all up. I, I couldn't care for this episode at all. It's not that it's the worst of Generation 1, because you know what? Actually, I think Season 3 has some contenders. Yeah, this is regarded as one of the worst for a reason. The only thing that really carries you through the episode is the characterization of Swindle. He's just funny in it. And that was season two, one of the longest seasons I think I've ever witnessed in television really. 49 episodes. Hasbro were desperate to get more Transformers out. You can tell at the start of season two, they had tried to make it more consistent to season one, like with core characters, but then as soon as those new Transformers started coming in, yeah, that was it. But all, everything just went out the window, sometimes with logic, with its characters. I think that's one of the reasons, though, I like Season 2 a lot. I could just watch any random episode and not have to worry so much about continuity. That's one of the main appealing things about Season 2. Of course, a lot of character development can be kind of sacrificed when you do it like that. But I think they've got some really good two-parters in here. And I think if it wasn't for the randomness, the writers wouldn't have had so much creative freedom. 
But even with 65 episodes already, Hasbro failed to notice what made the Transformers so special to so many young children. We now return to the Transformers. PSAs! Yes, I bet you didn't see that coming. Don't worry, I will be talking about the 1986 movie. It's just something I can't ignore. I just wanted to bring the PSAs up because it's something that not a lot of fans know about. So during the 80s, there was a bunch of government regulations where a bunch of 80s cartoons had to create PSAs, public service announcements. They were created for the sole purpose of politicians and parents being at ease that their kids won't get totally brainwashed by these cartoon toy commercials that were trying to get them to buy their products. Because hey, if we're going to brainwash our kids into buying our toys, then we've got to at least teach them a few life lessons so that their parents can think that somehow they'll grow up as decent human beings. Now I don't believe in these PSAs, I don't think they had a real effect on kids, but at the same time kids did look up to these cartoon characters an awful lot, so I can understand the logic there. But ultimately I think it's for parents to teach these kids these important valuable lessons, but due to these toy companies and their tactics, I can understand why the government would want to enforce on something like this. But then at the same time, I can see that the government just had to stick up their ass. According to an interview with the show staff, this was a conscious decision to balance out the inherently violent nature of the show. Yeah, they definitely balanced out the action alright. But the PSAs created for the Transformers never actually made it to air. But in the DVD bonuses, we get all five original PSAs, and I wanted to add them to this G1 ranking video so that Generation 1 could feel a bit more complete. So get ready viewers, you're going to learn some really important life lessons today. And you can thank your parents and guardians that I showed you these. Or if you're alone like me and have to learn everything from Gary. I'm running away from home. My parents are mean. Where will you go? I'm not sure, but I'll show them. That's right. You'll show them how mean you can be. Bumblebee. Isn't it better to try to solve problems instead of running away from them? Maybe I could try talking to my parents again. Yeah, tell them how you feel. And remember, running away leads nowhere. Now I know. And knowing is half the battle. The Transformers. I gotta say, with his PSAs, it's actually nice to see the Transformers be kind of more down to earth with the humans, you know, actually teach them something because you don't actually get a lot of life lessons kind of learned throughout the Transformers cartoon. Of course, most things get blown up and then the Transformers just kind of carry on with their day. So, you know, these PSAs, you know, of course, it's kind of just annoying propaganda. But at the same time, there's actually something kind of heartwarming about it. Stay with me. I'm on you like blue. All right. Hi, guys. Can I skate with you? Nah, you're just a girl. <laughs> Glide. Aren't you jumping to conclusions? Let her try. You might be surprised. Okay, but thanks. Wow, look at that. All right. Remember, don't judge people till you give them a chance. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. The Transformers. This coming from the guy that slapped down a girl because he didn't want to hang out with her. Slow down. I can hardly see. Look out, a car. Are you boys okay? Red alert, I didn't see ya. And I couldn't see you. No wonder, you don't have reflectors. They tell drivers where you are. I see what you mean. Remember, if you have to ride when it's getting dark, have the right equipment. And wear bright clothes, now we know. And knowing is half the battle. The Transformers. Right, I'm just gonna say that all of them was in the wrong way. Red Alert didn't even have his lights on, and he's called Red Alert. Now that's just a little bit of hypocrisy going off there. And those kids as well, okay. People still don't wear any bike helmets or any reflectors, so this PSA has not learned anybody anything. You gonna wear that sissy thing? It's called a life jacket. Yeah, well, I don't need one. Prepare to come about. Help! Help me! Gotcha. I guess you know you should have worn a life jacket. Accidents can happen, and a life jacket's good protection. Like seatbelts in a car. Or a motorcycle helmet. Now I know. A knowing is half the battle. The Transformers. Never been a fan of boats. That kid kind of deserved it because he was being such a brat. I didn't need to learn anything from this because I'm not going anywhere near the damn ass sea. Nice car. Should we borrow it? Nah, that's stealing. Come on, I'll ask for permission later. Looks more like you're asking for trouble now. Tracks. I figured I wouldn't get caught. That still wouldn't make it right. Think how you'd feel if someone took your car. Yeah, pretty lousy. And if you got caught, 
You could end up in jail. Remember, taking something that isn't yours just isn't right. It's stealing. Now I know. And knowing is half the battle. Isn't that still like an attempted robbery? Like that kid should be going to jail? Or at best doing some community service now? Tracks, you were too nice on that lad there. Both of them deserve to be slapped. I feel like there's a general consensus that no matter what age you are, you know that stealing is wrong regardless, that like you don't need to be told that. Just based on how everybody reacts if you do something like that. But hey, whatever. I mean, it was good to see Trax again. The Transformers will return after these messages. Ranking the PSAs, I gotta say the Bumblebee one was probably the most effective. It's kind of more toned down and not so in your face. I feel like that might actually teach kids something, considering that kids, you know, do run away from home sometimes, and I feel like if they saw this and they had Bumblebee on their side, would they have learned anything? I don't know, I doubt it, but still. But the worst one has got to be Red Alert. I mean, everyone was in the wrong there. So Red Alert trying to teach those kids something was useless when he literally uh, didn't have his lights on either. Right, so with the PSA is now done, let's move on to the 1986 movie that would change the course of the Transformers history forever and children around the world. Here we go. We now return to the Transformers. Transformers The Movie, released in 1986. It occurs 20 years after the end of season two, in the then now futuristic year of 2005. Like, wow, okay guys, kind of a huge leap there. Now over in Japan, they got Scramble City, which I won't go into so deeply, but I'll briefly touch on it. Basically, old characters meet the new characters. And one thing I wished they did was give us more of this. Now I didn't know about Scramble City for years, but it would have just been so cool to have a whole new season like this. But like all things in the Transformers, nothing ever truly lives up to its potential. The movie was without a doubt one of the single biggest turning points for the series. So it would be strange if I skipped over the movie's events and went straight into season 3 because, well... Everyone dies. That's right kids, throw your old Transformers in the trash, all these characters you've grown up to know and love, Buy our brand new toys that you don't give a crap about. Ironhide, Ratchet, dead. Crown, dead. Braun, eh, I don't know, maybe. Wheeljack, dead. And Windcharger, dead. And of course, the biggest one being Optimus Prime. He's dead. Hasbro really thought it was all about the toys for these kids, huh? I love how Hasbro knew they messed up when the UK's ending, they had to declare that Optimus Prime would return. And the greatest Autobot of them all, Optimus Prime, will return. <laughs> because sure, let's give them more nightmares. You know, this could have all been avoided if they instead thought of a tearless way to tell kids that Optimus Prime had died. Like, convey to them that he's in a better place now. Prime, you can't die! Oh, it's me, Maddie. I'm in heaven now. So sorry I died. I miss you so much. I'm happy here, so I'm not coming home. I miss... You know, I'll just say, everybody talks about Optimus Prime's death, but nobody ever talks about this. Poor Rumble. He's just lost his leader, and he's so sad. But hey, at least one thing came full circle from the first episode of Transformers. Someday I'll be giving the orders, Rumble. You'll do what I say. Look, Starscream. Megatron is strong. He's merciless. He can't be beaten. And you'll never be our leader. I will find a way. Everyone has a weakness. Yeah? Well, not Megatron. Yeah! 
Now I have a love-hate relationship with the movie, and it comes mostly from my childhood. See, when my mum bought this for me in Woolworths, a really outdated UK store, she was not aware of the trauma that was inside this case. I remember watching it on repeat non-stop at my grandmother's house, and I vividly remember bawling like a little bitch because seven-year-old me had never dealt with the concept of death before. So in a way, this movie would actually prepare me for the harsh realities of the world. So thanks, mum. You scarred your kid for life. Despite Optimus Prime not being real, he was real to me, goddammit. So for that, I tip my hat off to Hasbro for being so bold. But in no way was they intending to teach young kids how to deal with the concept of death, and in fact, scarred a lot of them. The G1 movie is without a doubt one of the most significant moments in my childhood growing up because it just really made me understand a lot. Hey dude, you're not the only one. Uh, uh, what are you doing? Go talk about an episode. But I've only seen the movie. Okay, fine, go. All of this time later, since 1986, the Transformers the movie's impact can still be felt, with the fact that the series probably quotes it like once or twice a year at this point. One shall stand, one shall stand, one shall stand. I don't think the Transformers franchise is physically capable of not referencing it at least like a couple times a year. I would have waited an eternity for this. I would have waited an eternity for this. And has gone on to be influential in other ways, like just last year, year, Hasbro introduced the Studio Series 86 subline. Uh, that brings us some absolutely incredible toys of those random guys who showed up to Optimus Prime's funeral, where its sole purpose is just to commemorate how beloved the characters in the movie have become, both those who had a major role in it and ones who showed up for 0.5 seconds. Took them a couple tries to get RC right, but you know, we got there in the end. Hasbro is even selling Optimus Prime's dead corpse, so you can permanently display one of the most traumatizing moments of your childhood on your shelf forever. There was a what if comic that IDW did a couple years ago called Transformers Deviations that was all about what happened if Optimus Prime didn't die in the movie that not many people liked. But still, the point is, one of the opening scenes in the movie has become such an iconic moment in this franchise. Really everything that was introduced in the 86 movie has in some way come back, whether it be the Quintessons, which have shown up every now and then in different shows and comics. Unicron obviously has become one of the most iconic villains in the whole Transformers franchise. Gavatron, Scourge, and Cyclonus, and obviously the rest of the 86 Autobots have become beloved characters. The movie may not have been very well loved when it first came out, but its impact is definitely felt all of this time later, and I honestly don't know what the Transformers series would have been without it. In a way, the movie's events are pretty simple. The old gang kill each other where the new gang comes in to stop the new evil gang leader, who was originally part of the old evil gang, but they got reborn into purple by a giant planet-eating awesome Wells that loves a good munchy munch. He's a monster munch, basically. Oh, and Starscream died. I mean, sure, finally, but I guess that's the end of the Decepticons having any kind of big personality. I'm going to miss his obnoxiousness. For now. The movie is somewhat the best representation though of the Generation 1 era. I mean it introduced a lot of new things that are like a main staple of a franchise today. Such as the Matrix of Leadership. You know I gotta admit this thing was pretty easy to steal. The most powerful steering wheel in Transformers lore. Gotta love how a steering wheel is associated with leadership with a society of robots that turn into cars. My brain broke when I realised that. Also, this was the first movie that introduced me to swearing. Look! It isn't even dented! Oh shit, what are we gonna do now? Yeah, my mum was pretty mad at Hasbro for that. Before we get into season 3, let's mention the brand new characters, uh, sorry, I should say toys, introduced in the movie. We have Hot Rod, who would become the new leader of the Autobots, named Rodimus Prime, which the fandom always seemed to have a love-hate relationship with. Yeah, sure, back then I would have hated him too, but I'm older and wiser now, and you know what? It wasn't his fault that Prime died. Maybe. Then we have the old timer Cup, who's just a cranky old wise man. Then we have Ultra Magnus, the all serious Autobot who you'd think would actually be the leader, but nah. Next up, we've got Blur. What about me, Magnus? What about me? Ma, ma, ma. I can help, I wanna help. What about me? Blur, you can help me alert the others. Absolutely, positively, definitely. Nobody can get the job done faster than I can. Nobody, nobody, nobody. Yeah, he's a bit of a blur, that one. Then we have RC, who isn't the first female Autobot, but the movie wants you to think that she is the first female Autobot, even though technically she is the first female Autobot because her approval for the movie was the gateway to allow female Autobots to appear in the cartoon, because the movie was in development when the cartoon was still being aired on television. Last but not least on the Autobot side we have Springer, 
I got better things to do tonight than die. Yeah, he's pretty fucking cool. Friend find, look behind. You go wrong way, you fool, I say. Oh, and we also have this annoying rhyming squirrel. Over on the Decepticon side, we have Galvatron, who was Megatron, but now he's horny. Really? Why did I say that? Cyclonus, the coolest new Decepticon warrior. In season three, you're gonna feel really sorry for this guy. And then we have Scourge and the Sweeps. That just kind of exist. And that's it. All the old bots are just cannon fodder, really. Well, okay, some old toys did stay in the series, like the Dinobots, Bumblebee, I guess, uh, Blaster and Perceptor. Even though for some reason to me, Blaster and Perceptor always felt like new characters, despite both of them having like dedicated episodes in season two. What was wrong with you kids in the 80s? Did you buy so many microscopes where Hasbro was like, well, the kids like the microscope, so he survives, but the cool ass truck, he has to die. Oh, and for the humans, we have Spike's new song called Daniel. And yes, he's very annoying. Anyway, with all those radical changes mentioned, let's dive into season three, which generally has a mixed reception among fans. I'm mixed on it. There's a lot of good episodes, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of bad episodes, and there's more bad than good. And the animation as well, it's mostly done by Acom now, and it's just bleh. Like, you're gonna notice the dip in quality immediately. But I can do this. Let's move on to season three. We now return to the Transformers. Now I want to start season three off with a compliment because I really love the theme song for this season. I like the intro, we have good transitions between characters and locations, but what really does it for me is the theme song, especially the extended version on the end credits, like I don't know why, I think it's just because of the orchestra that you can hear because I am a big fan of orchestra music and something about it just feels a bit more epic and cooler, a lot more kind of sci-fi as well. It really does blend in well with season 3's premise, like how it mostly focuses on different planets, how it's mostly centered on Cybertron. Overall, it just feels a lot more epic. Also, I've just realized after all these years, this isn't Cup, it's Springer. My entire childhood has just been betrayed. Also, what is wrong with you? Why are you blue? No, oh, I'm afraid I just blew myself. <laughs> Episode 66, The Five Faces of Darkness, Part 1. Okay, so, in the wake of Unicron's defeat, the battered Decepticons struggle to survive and the Autobots enjoy a period of peace and celebration. But this is Transformers. The peace never lasts. The episode begins with the ending scene of a Transformers movie, just in case if some kids didn't go to the theaters to watch the movie because, well, I can imagine some parents would want to prevent their child from being traumatized. I mean, they traumatized them enough with 80s clothing. What's really apparent straight away is the animation style. Like we've got good solid animation in the 86 movie and then we transition into season three where it's like, ooh, yeah. The animation quality just kind of dipped, didn't it? And you know, I like the start of this episode. We've got the old Decepticons fighting over Energon and the new Decepticons doing an unfortunate salute. In the days of Megatron, it was not like this. You mean Galvatron? Well, they were the same guy. <sighs> I feel you, Astro Train. One thing I don't understand though is why it's so loud in this scene. Like, can you please turn it down? Like, wh why is the energy on sound so loud? Please stop! Anyway, the Autobots are doing their own version of the Olympics, and we have these ugly looking aliens. What is this thing? Someone, please execute it. Oh, hey, look, original characters. Don't get used to it. This character right here wasn't even supposed to be Jazz. It was supposed to be a different character called Orgon, but someone mistakenly took the model of Jazz and just put it in. Didn't you want to say something about concord and tranquility in the galaxy? Ah, uh, give me a break. Wow, this new Autobot leader gives me a lot of confidence. This right here is one of the main issues with season three, the Hot Rod slash Rodimus arc. It just goes backwards and forwards. He wants to be the leader of the Autobots, and then he gets sick of being the leader of the Autobots. They just don't know how to characterize Rodimus Prime, and it gets insanely unbearable throughout the entire season. Why do I have to be the chosen one? We have no idea, mate. Right, so I'm not going to go too deep into this episode because, well, I really don't want to. I mean, we've got five parts to talk about, and it's already exhausting. Like, a lot of characters are kidnapped by the Quintessons. Springer and RC go after this alien thing. Oh my god, I, I hate looking at it. 
Outback and Blaster go searching for some Decepticons. Not with my trusty Decepticon detector. No such thing. Why does he look like a Gobot? Cyclonus and the Sweeps go to Unicron's head to find out where Galvatron is. There is no wind in space. Quiet. Oh, so this show finally decides to follow the laws of science. Once they find out where Galvatron is, they go back to Char, and we've got more Decepticons looking battered and bruised. And you know what? I actually feel really sorry for the Decepticons. Me Grimlock not feel sorry. Me Grimlock laugh. <laughs> okay, never mind. So yeah, that was part one. Can we move on, please? Episode 67, The Five Faces of Darkness, Part 2. Gavatron is rescued by Scourge and Cyclonus, and they discover that there is something very wrong with their leader. Disturbs my plasma bath. Basically, he's insane. Galvatron is like the main thing carrying season 3 for me. I love how insane he is. It makes sense story wise. I know we just couldn't afford Lennon Nimoy anymore, but hey, at least we got Frank Welker back, and he's very different from Megatron, so that's good. That's how you know you got a good actor anyway. If Galvatron was the same as he was in the movie, I feel like the Decepticon faction would be just boring, especially now that we've not got Starscream anymore, who added so much personality and life into the Decepticon faction. Now we have Galvatron, this insane maniac that brings that life back. Now of course, I like Scourge and Cyclonus, but I like them even more that they have to deal with this lunatic. Meanwhile with the Autobots, we've got Radamus and Grimlock going up against the Decepticons. Aww, Rumble's all grown up. And now they look really disturbing. I've never been creeped out before with a transformation. That is like, oh my god, that's disgusting. RC and Springer rescue Grimlock and Rodimus, but unfortunately, Rodimus is badly damaged. My time in the light is short. That's what Optimus Prime said when he was dying. Springer. Um, no, he didn't say that. RC, you were there. How do you not know you were there? I remember what he said. Oh, it's me, Maddie. I'm in heaven now! So Rodimus Prime goes on an acid trip that makes him learn more about the Quintessons. Meanwhile on Quintessa with Ultra Magnus, Spike and Cup are being held captive by the Quintessons. And they were supposed to have been massacred by the rebellious Sharktacons in the movie, but for some reason, they're still alive. They're not dead. Why? We'll never know. It never gets explained. You are the Autobot called Cup. You are Cybertron's chief of security. Nah, my name's Teaspoon, and I'm Cybertron's chief dishwasher. I like Cup. He's funny. But also senile. Why do I feel like I've seen this before? Because you've actually been here before. It wasn't that long ago. Dude, how old are you? Anyway, don't even ask. Spike somehow manages to hold one of them hostage. But it doesn't work, and they send him down to the shock to come. The Autobots are saved and escape through a massive silver bolt. The Quintessons decide to blow up their home planet Quintessa because reasons. And that's the end of part two. Episode 68, Five Faces of Darkness, part three. Desperate to destroy the Autobots, the Quintessons make a deal with the Decepticons. I'll briefly talk about the custom Five Faces of Darkness intro that for some reason is only on part three and five. It's all right, it's cool, the animation is still bleh. But, I mean, the transitions are kind of neat, and I've talked about this before on my all intros ranking. I, I like the idea that they did a custom. It was pretty neat. We have the Decepticons attacking an Earth space platform and blowing Wheelie's ship. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, blowing Wheelie. You know, I actually have no idea what they're doing at all. And you know, I actually can't tell who's more annoying, Wheelie or Blur. Now what? Beep, 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 alert, 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 that's what? Like, I don't have enough frustration in my life without beep, 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 alert, alert, alert. Your words invective, and your ship defective. I'm gonna go with Wheelie. I wished Wheelie was on that ship. Meanwhile, the Autobots crash land on a bizarre planet called Goo. I used to stick stuff like this under my seat at school. Um, Spike, you're disgusting. Oh, and Springer gets sucked up by a giant machine and gets decapitated. Because that's a terrifying image. <laughs> Gross. Alright, so we've got the Quintessons going to the Decepticons, and... Ugh, okay. Who plays Bruticus right next to the Combaticons? And why is Autobot Fireflight here? Okay, look, the only major thing to talk about this episode is actually Blitzwing. He's like the only Decepticon not to trust them. From a memory he can't recollect, 
and he pleads with Galvatron not to ally with them, and Galvatron does, and because of this, Blitzwing actually joins the Autobots, and he would be not trusted back into the ranks of the Decepticons. Now this tantalising plot thread was never actually developed in the cartoon, it was supposed to in Starscream's Ghost, but it was rewritten for Octane, I'll go into that episode when we get to it, but later on they would say that he was like part of the Quinison drone army, it is a shame that Blitzwing's story never gets fully developed, because while he's the only original Decepticon that actually gets something to do, because even Soundwave, who's one of the most popular Decepticons, does nothing really in Season 3, he just gets forgotten. Anyway, whatever, let's get into Part 4. Episode 69, Five Faces of Darkness, Part 4. It begins with the Decepticons attacking the Autobots, and oh my god, we have a disgusting shot here. All of these animation errors, I, I can't handle it, my brain, my brain hurts. At least I've got Galvatron making me laugh. Attack! Attack <laughs> Everyone! Did he just run in space? Meanwhile on the Autobot side, Springer is brought back to life by Retguard, and don't even ask how, it's never explained. It wasn't in the movie with Ultra Magnus, so I have no idea. Rodimus, look who's back! Yeah, good to have you back, Springer. Well, don't let your enthusiasm overwhelm you! He is definitely holding a grudge from the movie that RC chose Springer instead of him. Anyway, Rodimus Prime kills himself in order to learn more about the Quinnisons and their involvement with Cybertron through the Matrix. That's not even me being blunt, that's just what happens. Now the only significant thing about this episode really is the huge history lesson we get of Cybertron's past. As Rodimus Prime enters the Matrix, he is greeted by ancient Autobot spirits that have previously held onto the Matrix. It's revealed that the Quinnisons used Cybertron as a factory for two types of robots, the consumer goods and the military hardware, which of course would become Decepticons and Autobots. The Quinnisons would be banished from Cybertron, but the war between the Autobots and Decepticons would rage on, with the Autobots learning the art of transformation, and then it goes into the origin story of Megatron and Optimus Prime. And you know, for Generation 1, it's a good origin story, but I'm glad that it's not been adapted in modern Transformers. I just never liked the idea of the Quinnisons being the creators. I feel like there's more to Cybertron than just that. Like, come on, there's more to Cybertron than just being a factory. But you know, I'm glad that this origin story does exist because then you can look at it and just think about how much you could expand on that idea. Anyway, Wheelie gets attacked by bats. The Constructicons build a city on Earth that transforms into Trypticon. Okay, how? How did they build this in such a short amount of time? Like, wow, okay. Episode 70, Five Faces of Darkness, Part 5. We made it! In this episode, we get introduced to some brand new characters such as Skylynx, Metroplex, and the Predacons, but we also get to see some old faces. As Optimus Prime used to say, transform and roll out! I'm sorry, who are you? But yeah, aw, it's good to see the arc again, especially with Teletran 1. It just reminds me of those good old days. <laughs> Okay, now I'm gonna cry. So yes, I know this show is like a giant toy commercial, but this episode couldn't be more apparent. You know, we've got Skylynx with Predacons, and then we've got Metroplex with Trypticon. <laughs> Christ, how can they be both strong and light? Okay, so I thought Earth in Season 2 was bad, Earth in Season 3, I am jumping right off this planet. I'm going to go to Mars. This is chaotic. I am not staying here with them. Anyway, like I mentioned before, Blitzwing informs Galvatron about the Quinnison's plot against the Transformers, but like Galvatron fashion, he doesn't listen, and he pulls the switch that the Quinnison's wanted to pull, which causes all the Transformers to freeze. Gold darn, they plumb burned out. Well, no matter how newfangled you make them, when they bust, they bust. What the f are they talking about? Anyway, the Transformers are saved because of Spike. Yep, Spike saves the day. You know, the Quintessons were kind of worried about the humans, and you know, they probably should have paid much closer attention to that. So that was Five Faces of Darkness, and overall, not as bad as what I remember. It just feels like the whole plot is rushing itself. It's like Blur wrote this, you know, it just doesn't want to slow down. 
and it's like, oh, it can be sometimes a headache. I'm not going to credit so much on its animation errors because that's the entirety of G1, most specifically Season 3. Because of the low budget, they wanted to be more cost effective when it came to the animation. And you can just tell right off the bat, like the dip in quality. Even though the quality wasn't that high to begin with. Episode 71, The Killing Jar. Um, I think someone forgot to make the bottom text bold. In this episode, Ultra Magnus, Cyclonus, Marissa Fairborn, and Retgard are captured by the Quinnison scientist for experiments, but they are sucked into a more dangerous problem, a black hole. Now you'll notice this episode looks better, that's because Sumbo are animating this episode, not Acom. And for whatever reason, they decided to give Unicron's head a glow up. So yeah, it's a very small cast, but that works in the episode's favour, because we get more time with Ultra Magnus and Cyclonus, who make for really good adversaries. Now they're both being tricked by a Quinnison scientist, who apparently is the one who contributed to the original Autobot design. And you know, I don't understand how Ultra Magnus could fall for the fake Rodimus and Skylinks, but with Cyclonus, yeah, I can understand how he fell for the fake Galvatron. <laughs> And we've got Retgar here watching the movie adaptation of Stephen King's It. Come and find Retgar and say hello to the studio audience. Christ, as a kid I would have been terrified. We also have a human character in this episode called Melissa Fairborn. Now she actually was in Five Faces of Darkness, but I didn't mention her because, well, she doesn't really do much. She's like part of a Space Force command, and you know, she's actually pretty cool. She does a lot more in this episode than she did in Five Faces of Darkness. Now, I'm not familiar with G.I. Joe, but they do a connection here with her family tree. At one point in the episode, they go through a negative universe with the black hole, and they all have different alternate colours, mm, like that's very Shattered Glass vibes. Eh, that was kind of neat. Ultra Magnus looks terrible, though. They're Roadbuster colours, so I get the toy now in Transmiss Animated. But yeah, this episode was fine. It did a good job. I love Cyclonus's tiny little head. Episode 72, Chaos. The episode begins with this, oh, disgusting thing. I, oh my god, I hate looking at this. Every time, it's called a Strukside, and apparently it's an intelligent reptilian. Yeah, I bet. It looks like Ganon's deformed younger brother. I don't even know. That's what Cupper JJ said. You know this thing looks better like a girl, right? Like, why couldn't we have had this instead? I'm officially going to make it canon that this girl is his sister, and let's just leave it kind of unexplained where she gets her looks in the family. A discovery on Goo forces Cup to face a demon from his past. Basically, an obese swamp thing. And you know, it does a good job on expanding Cup's character. But we get a new character in this episode called Runamuck, who's usually partnered with his battle charger buddy Runabout, but we've got him partnered with Blastoff. I will say though, this episode was kind of annoying of how many questions Grimlock was asking. It's like, dude, shut up. Is that crystal cup where it come from? Me, Grimlock, say you tell now or we glitch and short circuit. But Cup does eventually tell the story of him being a prisoner and how when he escaped, he just left the prisoners by themselves. Like, it's been a hundred years and you'd think at one point he would have sent a rescue team. Like, yeah, I know he's traumatized and all, but he didn't have to go. He could have just told people where to go and look for him. <laughs> really? You scared of this guy? But in this episode, he goes back and he does rescue all the prisoners that he left behind and finally forgives himself. Now, this episode was fine. It was all right. But to be fair, I want an episode based on the story Cook told at the end. There was Jonagar with me aboard, flying right into the mouth of this giant space whale, you see. For three days and nights we was trapped inside that whale, and we thought we was done for. Give me that episode. <laughs> episode 73, Dark Awakening. Optimus Prime is revived as a zombie by the Quinnesons. Sure. Because why not? Let's traumatize the kids just a little bit more. Now this episode is very dark and I love it. But I can still understand why it was controversial at the time. Because you gotta bear in mind that this episode began production around the same time of the film's theatrical release. So Hasbro was still unaware about how the death of Optimus Prime would impact audiences. Now despite this being episode 8, they did actually re-air this episode to promote the broadcast of the return of Optimus Prime. I mean to what, to cover up their initial intent of killing Optimus Prime again? This alternate version is actually on YouTube on the Hasbro Pulse channel where you can watch these episodes for free. I mean, this episode is just chock full of memorable quotes and scenes. Monsters. 
They made me a weapon to destroy the very ones I loved in life. Like, damn, that's heartbreaking. Now, I could go deeper into this episode, but I'm going to give this to someone else who actually watched the episode when it was released. Yes, the first YouTuber I ever watched, so I'm happy to introduce P. All. Alright, hi, uh, this is P.A. I am doing Dark Awakening is the episode I chose for this, just because it was one of the ones that uh, is kind of important to some of the Autobot mythos and, and, and Rodimus becoming a leader. Um, right off the bat, you got Galvatron being crazy, talking to the Quintessons, and again, this is how Galvatron is different than Megatron, because he's done with the Quintessons and he just shoots the computer. Oh yes, you are loyal allies, so long as it suits your purposes! That's a Starscream move. Megatron would have just turned the computer off and been like, ah, these fools, you know. They find each other in the middle of space and they all just happen to be right next to the Autobot Mausoleum, which is where all the Autobots go, and it seems dead Autobots go, and that seems in and of itself like a bad idea. Just let's just put all of our dead bodies in a thing and just just fling it into space where we don't really know where it is. They act like they just kind of oh god, I never thought I'd see that again, and yet they were flying right towards it. So <laughs> they're they're flying out. The, the ship blows up. They pull the whole. They don't actually separate the front se section, but they launch an escape pod. Daniel and Spike are on it. And, D and Spike's all like, well, what do we do if we run out of air? And Rodimus is, uh... What do Daniel and I do when the air runs out? Well, basically, you'll have two choices. Suffocate or smother. Very much a Hot Rod joke. Like, I can hear Hot Rod being like, well, you'll suffocate or smother. You know, like, and, it, and I just think that's a neat little personality of Hot Rod coming through in Rodimus there, even though it's a little bit of a, a dark joke, although the whole episode is a little bit of a dark joke. So they get into the mausoleum... I, I still think that veil was something that animators did and that writers added and like, well, that's the mystical veil because it just seems weird, especially since only like Optimus is behind it. They said it's a tribute to all the people who died, but then like all the corpses are down some random hallway that Daniel finds and only manages to find like Ironhide and Prowl. They say this is the mausoleum to all Autobots who died in the Great War. And I feel like over four million years, it would probably have a lot more unknowns or at least uh, more corpses in it. I'm not dead. Oh, they, they find Optimus. He, he's up. He's running around. They're not sure what's going on. Um, which one? He clearly has Optimus in him. Like it's not just a we we zombified a corpse like the Quintessons, you know, chuckle over later in the episode when they're explaining their plan. Like he's clearly in there, which makes me think maybe you all. Maybe they shuffled Optimus Prime off into this space mausoleum a little before uh, they really needed to. But yeah, he, he's like, here, I built I, I, I built this escape ship. They never explicitly explain that he's built this ship out of corpses. There's definitely like some arms and some legs in there. So uh, you never see a face, but that's a little disturbing. But anyway, Prime goes back. They, uh, everybody else, Daniel and them, build another second corpse ship on the thing in like five minutes and escape, crash back into Cybertron. But when they're crashing back into Cybertron, and this is one of my favorite bits of the episode just because it features one of my favorite auto or Transformers, or I guess Autobots, technically Dinobots. Um, they're looking at the viewport and Snarl, like a little puppy dog in dinosaur mode, comes walking up to the windows like... <laughs> And then they, everybody gets off, and Sludge is like, wait, we're not going to listen to you. You're dead, because Prime had told them everybody had died. Um, and the, But then comes to, like, a surprisingly nihilistic realization for a Dinobot. Maybe we did. What are you yammering about? During the battle, so the Quintessons have lured the Autobots into this trap for using Optimus Prime's corpse. And I feel like there were a lot of different ways... Autobots in space, they could have lured the Autobots into this trap, but regardless, ensuing battle, they start blowing, like I said, several aerial bots blow up. Power Glide appears to blow up in this episode, and I don't know if we see him again for the rest of the series or not, but uh, no uh, mention or uh, acknowledgement of Power Glide just exploding in space. Autobots get on the ship. Rodimus tells, or Hot Rod, I guess at this point, tells everybody else to find a way to turn the ship around. I'm going to go hunt Optimus, and they get into a big fight, and Rodimus finally steps up uh, gets into the command center and is like, I'm taking command. What took you so long? In the immediacy makes sense because 
Optimus Prime has clearly been locked in this corpse and is trying to fight it, is, is glad for that somebody has finally come to stop him from doing these horrible things to the people he cares about. But also, it's, it's kind of a statement that, you know, like, hey, you finally stepping up and accepted that you can be the leader. Because that's kind of Rodimus' whole thing. It's like, I don't know. I don't know if I can live up to Optimus for pretty much the entirety of his command. Everybody saves the day. Optimus, like, just suicide missions into this controller thing as you watch him just slowly blow apart as the ship gets bombarded with fire. I'm invincible! The Autobots go back home, and then the episode ends with a... But is this really the end of Optimus Prime? Find out in tomorrow's exciting episode, The Return of Optimus Prime. Well, I mean, you kind of just blew the lead there, buddy. Anyway. You know, Peel, if I watched this as a child, I'd probably be traumatized for life. So I just want to say I'm glad you've made it to adulthood. Thanks for letting me be a part of this. Um, I'm, this was this was fun. Like I said, it let me sit down and watch an episode I haven't sat down and watched in, in quite a while. So uh, I appreciate the chance. I should really go back and watch more of it. Isn't he just the nicest guy in the world? <laughs> Episode 74, Forever is a Long Time Coming. The Quinnisons attempt to alter their own history by opening a time window to Cybertron's ancient past, but they meddle with it too much where it ultimately causes time itself to begin unraveling. So yeah, this episode's lame. I mean, I've just watched this episode and I can't really remember what happened. It's an ACOM episode. It's just visually ugly to look at. Alright, uh, let's look at my notes. Um, Alpha Trion's mustache. Yeah, that's ugly. Please change it back, please. Ah, that's better. Okay, so the time loop is going around Cybertron and Earth, and it's like kind of repeating things, but then it's also reverting things. And we've got Marissa Fairborn, who we've seen in a few episodes now, just get revert back to a baby. Captain Fairborn? Don't tell me this is what led to Kiss players. Okay, I'm gonna burn my eyes out now. We've also got Blaster's door opening sideways, and that just visually damages my brain. Also, Ramhorn is perhaps the ugliest cassette I've ever seen. So yeah, things in this episode just kind of happen, and you know, I wish they actually delved into a multiverse plot. I felt like that would have been way more interesting, and they kind of do it at the end. All right, you've convinced me. That's me! Hmm, genius. Hi, I'm Michael Bay, director of Hollywood hits such as Transformers. It's gotta be a trick! Episode 75, Starscream's Ghost. Yep, even in death, our boy is still scheming. We have a new character called Octane, and he is on the run from the Decepticons, and seeks an asylum on Cybertron, but unfortunately, he encounters the ghost of Starscream. Starscream! Like mentioned in Five Faces of Darkness, the original script for this episode was supposed to have featured Blitzwing and not Octane. Now, I would be more upset about this, but Octane is actually a really fun character. Despite it being so obvious that it was meant to be Blitzwing, I think it still worked in the episode's favour. I mean, come on, this is Hasbro, we've got to promote new toys. Now, this episode takes place technically after A Thief in the Night, but I'm going to let it slide because it's not that big of an error to switch the episodes around. They just revised the script just because of a Blitzwing change. And oh my god, I think I might have a heart attack. The Decepticon insignia is finally drawn correctly. Oh my god, this this is a miracle, and it only took us about five hours. Now this is one of my favourite episodes out of season three, just because I think it's been written so well. I feel like the Decepticon-centred episodes are always at their best. It's a very comedic episode with a lot of great dialogue. Besides, he might have information about the Autobots. Yes, we shall interrogate him. Even if it's not informative, it will be fun. We get some insane moments in this episode, such as Octane tuning in to Roboporn. A little more here. Yeah, that's better. What's that? Don't watch porn, kids, or you'll die. We also have a new Autobot called Sandstorm in this episode who's also a triple changer. Octane asks Sandstorm to protect him, and you know these two have some really good banter. They missed me! That's because they weren't shooting at you! They're after me! Let's see! No two ways about it, you gotta do something about your popularity! So because Galvatron has put a bounty on his head, we've got the Sluxoid, 
the maggot looking creature trying to kill him and you know he actually makes up for it in this episode on his constant failed attempts of trying to kill Octane. It actually makes for some good comedy. <laughs> We get to Cybertron and while Octane is on the run he actually ends up falling into a Decepticon crypt. And I love how he pays nod to Thundercracker who is technically like one of the sweeps or whatever. And he goes over to Starscream's crypt and it's just legs. <laughs> You've gotta love the Decepticon's dark sense of humour. Now as much as I love spooky stuff, I got a friend who loves spooky stuff just a little bit more. The lore expert, Emperor Kumquat. Starscream's Ghost was an episode I watched over and over as a kid so I guess it's my favourite. As a kid, I loved ghosts and Danny Phantom, so to see my favorite character be a ghost was really cool for me. I ignored most of the episode just to focus on the ghost parts, especially because I liked that Starstream came back after he was killed in the movie. Like, I didn't have to be sad about his death, knowing that he was going to return. Octane interests me back then too, because he was a Decepticon hanging around the Autobots, and while I didn't know why as a kid, I did like what I was seeing. As an adult, I'll add that I liked Octane for his surprisingly handsome lips. The episode got even better when Octane was chased into the crypt and Starscream possessed Cyclonus. <laughs> now look scared, moron, or I will have to destroy you. He had to pretend to be Cyclonus, but he wasn't even that good at it, and his screechy Starscream voice was alerting people. Get out of the way! There seems to be something wrong with Cyclonus's voice. Yes, he sounds like Starscream! No need to be insulting! But yeah, one dude, working with a ghost, possessing someone's body, it was just fun for me as a kid. This episode also delivers on a lot of funny Galvatron scenes. Starscream and Octane team up with the Autobots in order to trap Galvatron, but somehow he manages to get out of that. The way how Galvatron comes back is just so funny to me. It's like he's been on a massacre, and all the Autobots are now dead. So yeah, that was Starscream's ghost. A more creative way to bring back a dead character. And he'll be back, but this is definitely one of the best episodes out of season 3. Episode 76, Beef in the Night. Octane steals Trypticon in an attempt to use him to control the Decepticons. And this episode takes place in the city of Carbomnia. Huh, that doesn't sound offensive at all. I'm shocked about the camels haven't rebelled. Yes, I've got to admit, I'm not a fan of the stereotypes in this episode, and actually this isn't the first time we've been introduced to characters such as this. We had a bit of it in Season 2. And you know, stereotyping like this was pretty common in the 80s. It's not the only cartoon to do something like this. Isn't it dangerous to cruise near here? Yeah, sometimes innocent ships get attacked. There's no danger, I assure you. Wow, that lasted only two seconds. In fact, this episode is what caused voice actor Casey Kasem, who played Cliffjumper, Blue Streak, Dr. Archieville, and Teletran 1, to quit the show because he took offence to the name Carbomnia, because if you couldn't tell, it's a stereotype, along with other stereotypes in the show. Big one being the main human character in this episode, Abdu Fakadi. Uh, do you like gold? Gold? Yeah. This is something that interests Abdul Fakadi. Who gets sick and tired of Trypticon and Octane taking all of their oil to make Energon. <laughs> this episode is just Trypticon being a fat pig. Now, with Octane, you can tell this was supposed to be Blitzwing, same with Starscream's Ghost, and they switched it obviously because they wanted to promote the Octane toy, who is also a triple changer. But the thing is, this story just doesn't really work as Octane because we don't know who Octane is. What's his story? Why does he want to go against Galvatron and the Decepticons? Now, the structure of this episode is overall broken, it's all over the place, but if they did have Blitzwing in Octane's role, at least you could look at the episode and kind of make sense of it. But anyway, to keep themselves in Carbomnia, ugh, even saying it is annoying, Octane and Trypticon steal a bunch of gold for Abdu Fakadi. But Galvatron finds out and he is pretty mad. Until Octane convinces him that the Energon that they've gathered is actually much better. That's good! <laughs> oh my god, I just thought about it. Imagine this guy drunk. Now I know that realism isn't Transformers' the strongest suit, but in this episode, Trypticon literally picks up monumental buildings from across the globe, like Paris and India, and hand delivers them to Abdu Fakadi to build his paradise nation. Now who would have thought it would be that easy? 
Now you'd think with Triptychon being a big guy, that the Autobots would know that he's stealing these big buildings because, well, he's out there in broad daylight. But no, they assume it's one of their own Dinobots doing it. It's like, why? I will admit though, this was pretty funny. We're gathered here, as you know, to figure out if any of you Dinobots was involved in stealing Fort Knox and the Taj Mahal. Why am I under investigation? I'm not a Dinobot. You got dinosaur electrons in your circuit, Skylinks. Nevertheless... Thankfully, it doesn't actually take him long to figure out it was Triptychon. Triptychon's the only Decepticon big enough to have carried off all those buildings. Gee, you think? And for some reason, all the countries around the world think it was the Autobots that stole all these buildings. You know, I'm done with this episode. I, I can't be asked with it. It is such a pain in the neck. Like, Triptychon throws a building at Metroplex. Watch out! That's a priceless treasure! The episode ends with the Autobots saving the day, and, uh, yeah, this. Oh, you have my word of honor, Rodimus. In fact, I swear to you on the grave of my mother's camel, and my uncle's goat, and even my sister's donkeys. And did I say my brother's sheep and my nephew's roosters? Such fine roosters! Just stop. Episode 77, Surprise Party. Daniel and Wheelie team up to find out when it's Ultra Magnus's birthday. Aw, that's really sweet. But it's Daniel and Wheelie, so... <laughs> the episode actually begins with the Autobots throwing a surprise party for Daniel. And honestly, this is terrifying. Like, if they did this for me, I would be terrified. I would never trust the Autobots and my dad again. No, Daniel. Spike's so wise. Planned the surprise. Yeah, I'd shit myself. Anyway, this party only lasts two seconds because of the Combaticons attack. And you know, the Combaticons don't even need to form Boudicus anymore because he's just there, right next to them. Who, on God's name? When Ultra Magnus gets hurt by saving Wheelie's life, Wheelie and Daniel want to make it up to him by finding out when his birthday is so they can throw a surprise party. Why not just make the day he saved your life his birthday? Just saves a lot of time. And they head off to the archives and they come across this annoying robot. You want to know when Ultra Magnus was created? That's right, can you help us? Hmm, these three are now in competition on who's more annoying. The robot tells them that that information is probably more likely on an asteroid because of course it's gonna be. Anyway, they go there and they get attacked by more annoying robots. Come on out and show yourselves! Greetings! 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 Honestly, I can't tell now who's more annoying. But the robots are destroyed by Cyclonus, and for some reason, Wheelie doesn't say anything. Huh? Come on, Wheelie! Wheelie, I think we'd better get out of here! Yeah, just stay like that for the rest of the season. I love how when Ultra Magnus is talking to that archive robot on finding out where exactly Spike and Wheelie went, Ultra Magnus just doesn't care what the robot's saying, and even this episode doesn't care what he's saying. Oh, yes, 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 they were here all right. I gave them some information about the old... Yep, just carry on. We don't care. One thing that annoys me about this episode is the insignia transitions. They are just non-stop. Like, they must be at least 20. Anyway, Cyclonus takes Daniel in as a pet, and the episode ends with the asteroid with all the Autobot archived information being destroyed. And nobody cares. Really? Priceless pieces of information have now been gone, and nobody cares? Say, I got an idea, guys. What's that? Why don't we just designate today as Ultra Magnus's birthday? What we really want to know... Why we not think this up long ago? Happy birthday, Ultra! <sighs> I feel sorry for Ultra Magnus in this episode. He smiled once and has regretted it ever since. Episode 78, Madame's Paradise. A quick stroll through Cybertron leads Daniel and Grimlock to some place different. Please welcome to Cybertron, Inara, ambassador from the planet- Oh, oh my god. Why does she look like she's made of moist? Oh hey, we get Carly in this episode. And we also find out Spike's last name, being Witwicky. This episode is overall fine. It's not good, but it's not great either. You'll notice that Grimlock has become more of a joke now. In season one, he was like this kingdom warrior. Now he's just wearing a tuxedo. Or an apron? Tux apron? I don't know, whatever. And you know what, I actually don't mind Grimlock in this kind of style of humour. I think it works. It worked in the movie, but season 3 sometimes can go a little bit too far with it. This episode is full of conveniences. By the way, how Daniel manages to find this underground place on Cybertron that somehow transports him to this fantasy world. Neat monster! 
monster. Not monster, handsome like me, Grimlock. I think it's good that Grimlock can acknowledge another creature's beauty without people reading into it so deeply where it could be interpreted as something else. Unless, the teaming up of Daniel and Grimlock is much better than the last episode of Daniel and Wheelie. What are we? Uh, not Cybertron. California, maybe? Wow, even California's not this weird. Isn't it, Daniel? Are you sure? Okay, never mind. What the hell is that? Daniel! I can't find Daniel anywhere. He couldn't have gone far, Carly. Ah, I see you've learned absolutely nothing from the last episode, Ultra Magnus. Are you looking for your little spawn? I saw him leave with that Dinobot. Oh my god, stop talking. Get her face, get her moist face out of the way. Anyway, Spike and Grimlock meet this tentacle weird looking thing and decide to go off with him to the castle. I don't know. My mom says never to go off with strangers. Everybody here, stranger. Us not go with stranger. Us not go. Okay, okay. Hada boy, Grimlock. Keep teaching those important lessons to the kids watching at home. Anyway, the people of Mononia tell Grimlock and Daniel all about the history, and honestly, I don't care. Like, right, yeah, this is boring. Please, can we move on? Anyway, Daniel gets captured by Woodmen, and the Autobots travel deep into Cybertron and touch the same dragon painting that transports them to Mononia, and Daniel breaks free with a creepy old man that he found in the same cellar, and go out to destroy a rock that releases a gold man who turns into a dragon. What the fuck am I so And Wizard Man yells at Grimlock. If Wizard's so strong, why he need me, Grimlock? Because! Enemies are many. Like insects, they swarm and attack and attack and attack with raw force. Primitive magic driven by hate, by envy. They will not stop. Uh, me Grimlock just wanted to know. <laughs> Why is he yelling at him? Oh, I feel so bad for Grimlock. Okay, so the evil wizard turned out to be a Quinnison, so they defeat him using Blaster, and Grimlock doesn't understand anything. Dad, it was an accident, honest. Daniel tell truth. He not mean to get all dirty. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? Episode 79, Nightmare Planet. And in this episode, Galvatron finally kills Daniel. Your time has come. Prepare to meet your maker. You can't. Oh, I'm so happy. No! Oh, for fuck! Now, this episode is actually a nightmare, but if the story didn't tell you that, because we've seen so much bizarre imagery already in this series, you would have just assumed it's just another regular episode. Like, I don't know, I feel like the writer wants you to have a fun time with this episode. But I have a feeling we're not in it for a fun time! The only thing I really love about this episode is just the bizarre team-up with Springer and one of the Predacons, Razorclaw. Like, they both hate the situation they're in, and I love it. Get on! Be careful, Springer! Be careful, Springer! Now for this episode, I'm going to let my good friend Delzord explain why this is surprisingly one of his favourites. The reason why I like Nightmare Planet in Season 3 is because it's absolutely bonkers. The episode throws a ton of nonsense at you, but not without getting you thinking. This episode blurs the line between dream and reality. And although it's made evident that most things we are seeing are from Daniel's dream, this episode leaves the door open to interpretation. What's interesting about the episode is the amount of different characters we are introduced to. From the get-go we have a clown jumping out of a jack-in-the-box, a witch, and a giant mother-trucking Galvatron. It's me, Headstrong! You, uh, recognize me now! I'm on your side! You Later on in the episode, we have a dragon who captures Springer and Razorclaw, and a giant who manhandles Ultra Magnus and the Predacons, all of which are constructed as part of Daniel's supposed dreams, that have become nightmares. It turns out these nightmares are being created by the Quintessons, 
who are using Daniel's dreams to make characters who they hope will destroy the Autobots and Decepticons. This is an aspect I really like about the episode, as it shows how sneaky and manipulative the Quintessons can be in an attempt to gain victory over the Transformers. My favourite character moment of the episode is a giant sized Galvatron. The reason being, he's a giant sized Galvatron. A few other things I find interesting about the episode is just how dark the Quintessons can be, as they openly discuss inflicting brain damage on Daniel by increasing the strength of his nightmares. The setting is too high, it might damage the human's brain. Never mind, as long as it keeps him from helping the Autobots, it will be worth it. Also, what's going on with Rodimus Prime's eyes? One minute they are Autobot Blue, the next are Decepticon Red. One final interesting note about the episode is that apparently the Transformers deal in the currency of gold, which the princess attempts to negotiate with as part of being rescued. If there's anything to strongly dislike about Nightmare Planet, it's probably the princess. She's incredibly annoying. I'm afraid it's just temporary! The images are too overpowering for Danny to control! But I think the story behind Nightmare Planet, although bonkers, makes it a clever and very different episode. Episode 80, Ghost in the Machine. Starscream possesses Scourge and makes a deal with the devil, Unicron, in the hopes to regain his physical body again. The episode doesn't waste any time and jumps straight into madness with Starscream possessing Scourge. Now you'd think from Starscream's ghost that Galvatron would remember when Cyclonus was possessed by Scourge, but then you'd also think that Cyclonus would remember him being possessed by Starscream. But unfortunately for poor Scourge, they think he's a traitor. Get out of here! Leave me alone! Drop your weapon! There is no reasoning with him! Destroy him! He's lost his mind! <laughs> oh, I love him. I love Galvatron so much. So Scourge and Starscream head off to Unicron's head, and you'd think with it now being like a moon for Cybertron, that the Autobots would keep a closer eye on it, but they just fly in willy-nilly. Starscream and Unicron struck a deal that if he does three tasks for him, that he will grant him his new body. Now, Unicron in Season 3 is being voiced by the late Roger C. Carmel, who does a really good job. Yes, Unicron can grant your request, but only after you have performed three labors. And kind of a sad fact to know, but as this episode aired on October 21st, 1986, Roger C. Carmel passed away from heart failure just a month later. Such a shame. He does such a great performance of Unicron, and along with the other characters he voiced in the series such as Monomaster and Bruticus. Okay, so the pacing of this episode is just nuts. It transitions from scene to scene so fast. It's really hard to kind of keep up with this episode. It's in a rush to actually finish. Like for the next scene on Autobot City, Cup is doing an inspection on Metroplex, and it's good to see all these old characters again, but we don't get a lot of time spent with them because the scene is in that much of a hurry to finish. Thank you, Cup. We take our duty here seriously. <laughs> Our worlds are in danger. Blaster, that sure is some serious music. Miraculously, both Starscream and Scourge managed to infiltrate Metroplex's eyes without setting off any alarms. So, what was the point of the inspection? I guess it failed? But I suppose it was worth it just to see Spike and Bumblebee again teaming up. But why is Bumblebee so fat? The Volkswagen looks like a monster truck now. Anyway, Metroplex's eyes get stolen and he goes nuts. Well, I guess that kind of clears up why Astoria and Powerglide didn't last. Nah, to be fair, I can't really blame Warpath considering all the season 1 and 2 characters are pretty much gone or dead, so he's clinging on to Powerglide because he's like one of the only few left. But sadly, this would be the last appearance of both Warpath and Powerglide. Now, I would explain the next scene, but I think Galvatron does it much better. First, you two, let Scourge and Starscream steal one of Triptychon's eyes. And then you two allowed Astro Train to be used as their escape vehicle. So Scourge is helping Starscream voluntarily. And you four were unable to stop them. Well, all I can say is... Unicron needs a transformation cog, so Starscream just steals Triptychon. Now, why couldn't he have just done that earlier? You know, for the strong, silent type, you sure talk too much. 
It's funny how Starscream has accomplished more by himself in just a few days than Galvatron has all season. Of course, the Autobots are the last to figure out what the plot is of this episode, and you know, with them being so concerned about Unicron being reactivated, why doesn't Rodimus just jump inside Unicron's head and open the Matrix once again? What? Is that recycled plot? Huh, the irony. Unicron wants Trypticon's transformation cog so that he can use Cybertron as his new body. Yeah, at least it'll be accurate to the toy now, I guess. Refusing to call AA, Starscream prepares to jumpstart Unicron. Complete the connection. Do it yourself! I think at least one person has met a Starscream in their life. Starscream's new body is short-lived, however, when Galvatron blasts him, which sends him flying throughout space. Mighty Galvatron, what is that? It's Starscream! Blast him! But he's a ghost! Die, you worthless! You know, it's really poetic that Starscream's last scene in G1 is him screaming among the stars. So that was Starscream's Ghost, an overall fun and quirky episode, but the pacing is too fast for me. I wish there was at least one more episode with Starscream in it, but I feel like this was a fitting conclusion for the character. I mean, for those who wasn't happy about it, at least you got Beast Wars. <laughs> What's so funny, you moron? You! Where are the Autobots? <laughs> this is literally one of my favourite Galvatron moments ever. Episode 81, Web World. Cyclonus attempts to cure Galvatron's madness and takes him to a medical planet, Torculon, planet of the psychiatric apes. <laughs> I can't really explain on why this is one of my favourite season 3 episodes. Now for this episode I'm going to summon one of the first internet personalities that I watched on YouTube. I'm happy to introduce Vangelis. Hey there G1ers, this is internet cameo personality Vangelis, and if there's one thing I love to talk about it's the Transformers season 3, you know, the best season, the sci-fi one, the experimental showcase of young writers not yet knowing the pop cultural juggernaut whose veins pumped hearty with their paycheck scripture. And while there are several post-movie episodes I love, Web World immediately jumped to mind as a highlight of the series. One of my favorite aspects of season 3 is that it is, all proper nouns, the season of consequences. And for the Decepticons, theirs is the loss of Megatron, the lingering heralds of Unicron, and the fact that their god-born new leader is now a screaming shell of what he briefly had become. After an opening that teases the red herring of a classic Autobot-Decepticon conflict, it is quickly revealed that our protagonist is actually Cyclonus! Doting over his unhinged commander and attempting to bellow a fist-shaking threat as the Autobots depart, even the sweeps can't keep up the act as the Decepticons are collectively realizing that their weakest link and greatest adversary on the battlefield is their own leader. Out of my way, fool! My Galvatron, please! We must use strategy! Strategy is for cowards! A villain faction episode is not a common thing in classic toy commercial fare, and I adore how much Webworld shows us not only the growingly unstable state of the Decepticons and their leader, but also who Cyclonus is as a character at this point. Talking up the greatness of Galvatron while not even able to make Swindle flinch at gunpoint when the Combaticon literally states they'd be better off with their leader slain on the battlefield, Cyclonus is clearly intelligent enough to know something's up when Aquinason contacts him to offer some dubious help in the form of information about the psychiatric plan planet of Torculon, and yet, something must be done. On the other hand, something must be done. It's hard to pinpoint favorite parts of this episode, as I love it minute to minute. Galvatron's ridiculous acts of aggression, the straight-up disturbing nature of Torculon and its patience, the knowing bureaucracy of its overly calm wardens. Just say whatever comes to mind. Kill, smash, destroy! Uh, yes, go on. Rend! Mangle! Destroy! 
This episode, for 20-some minutes, makes you root for Cyclonus and fear for Galvatron. It shows you a greater evil than a purple toy with a pointy faction symbol, that being the cold and cruel horror of trying to help a loved one and watching them suffer under the knife of a system devoid of empathy. Yes, tell me about the Autobots. I hate the Autobots! I hate Cyclonus! And I'm not very fond of you! Cyclonus is the Decepticon second in command, carries a large laser gun, and can transform into a galaxy cruising space jet, and yet he is rendered silent and obedient, signing endless forms as a Torculi administrator ignores and speaks over his increasingly concerned questions. <laughs> Watching Galvatron go through this darkly comedic parody of a healthcare system more interested in transaction than patient wellness is a simply fascinating interlude for a show like the Transformers of 1984 through 80, uh, whatever. And one wonders if this came from a place of knowing on the part of the writer, hearing Galvatron's manic rantings grow more desperate and even fearful while Cyclonus continues to stand by, constantly asking questions, wondering if his good intentions will lead to irrevocable consequences. When the Aliar deployed, revealing the deliciously hideous nature of Torculon itself, Cyclonus becomes the good son demanding the release of his loved one before an experimental treatment meant to complete the deterioration of a suffering mind can be executed. Galvatron bellows his threats, but eventually one of them ends with a painful and terrified, PLEASE! I'll do whatever you want! I'll do nothing at all! Galvatron! Oh, Cyclonus! There's a shimey! Help me! Oh, help me! All's well that ends well, though, as Torculon's hubris wreaks its own extermination. The living planet's attempt to devour Galvatron's mind backfires gloriously as it is overloaded by a madness derived from the creation of another, bigger living planet. And one can't help but cheer as Galvatron laser focuses on obliterating Torculon by literally shooting it in the brain before savaging its surface and populace, setting back the Torculi and their disturbing practice by centuries before Cyclonus manages to distract his leader by mentioning the Autobots once again. Have we more pressing concerns, mighty one? The Autobots, for instance. Uh, Autobots! Ultra Magnus! Yes! Yeah. Webworld encapsulates part of what makes Season 3 so great and is easily one of my top G1 episodes of all time. It also provides defined names for Galvatron's plasma bath neural damage. And as far as favorite little goofy moments and errors, there's a couple. You know, there's some classic non-vocoded Dr. Claw voice in the opening 90 seconds with Soundwave. Ratman has found a deposit of isodrite and something else. And the Torculi with the inhibitor ray gun is just always assuming a ridiculously intense pose before firing. Uh, and of course, I have no head, I have no head, I have no head, I have no head. Episode 82, Carnage in C Minor. Now this episode is notorious for being one of the worst and poorly animated episodes, but to be honest, I don't want to talk about it. I actually showed this episode to my friend Daniel, and I'll let his reaction speak for itself. Hi, recording my execution video. You don't even know anything about G1, do you, really? I don't know anything about most, most things. <laughs> and this is no different. Yeah, that was pretty honest. Honesty is the best policy. So this is regarded as one of the best episodes of Generation 1. Means nothing to me. You know him, don't you? Summit Wave. Yeah. Sound Wave, is that one? Yeah, this is Megatron, but That's Galvatron now. Oh, that one. So there's combiners which are bigger than regular Autobots, but there are some combiners in this episode that are the same size as regular Autobots. So, <laughs> devastated there. He's supposed to be way bigger, but he's small. Oh, was that a salute? <laughs> that looked a bit dodgy. Oh, that looks weird. No, that looks very weird. <laughs> Everyone dies. <laughs> you took that out of context, that would look very weird. Also, if you're flying through space, isn't it supposed to be like... Jet propulsion or something? I don't see anything coming out. Mm. 
Like, how are they flying in space? Yeah, isn't that a drug trip? This whole episode's an acid trip. Oh, that was right. <laughs> so much for the comet! What's that supposed to be? <laughs> so much for me! I'm leaving! It's meant to be a parody. <laughs> no. It reminds me of that, like, that shitty Legend of Zelda. Yeah, that's what I was actually going to say. But I was. That's what it reminds me of. That. Yeah, I was going to say it just reminds me of that. When you said this was the best episode, do you mean that ironically or unironically? Unironically. <laughs> <laughs> How? How did he do that? And then they are, they're back there again. Wrong side. Blaster. Driving. That's the wrong side. <laughs> We've got to get to that alien. But they can fly anyway. Not not Autobots, but he can. Weren't they all flying through space? Yeah, well, yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah, so... he's all flying, yeah. <laughs> Look how he's suddenly smiling. <laughs> Oh, they're holding hands. <laughs> so that's why you should help us fight the Decepticons. Oh, so we're just gonna skip the whole speech, huh? <laughs> <so. laughs> Great animation. I hate it. It's so long. But it's like tw it's twenty minutes, but it feels longer. Yeah, it feels probably more like two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I never get it. <laughs> the most beautiful sound in the world. I heard what you said. I can help you find Allegra. What did he say? He says. <laughs> hey, why could he understand it, but he can't? I can know it's stupid, but he's speaking English. Uh... Very impressive. Get out! As our ally, you can have the power. Very well. Stand by. To receive the harmony! Well, she portrayed the people pretty quick. Yeah. Did you get the harmony? No! No! <laughs> Just picks him up. Bebop. That Bebop is part of the secret. And he's probably with the Autobots. Fire! Well, you can see those with him. You literally stood over there. <laughs> Did they write the script first and animate it? Yeah, well, actually, um, it's a well-known fact that they do the script and then four months later they animate it. Should have taken longer. Soundwave, he's singing a second part of the harmony. Get it! The massive <laughs> headache. It sounds like it. <laughs> Much better! <laughs> What's the end game here? <laughs> bah, unconscious. She won't feel a thing. <laughs> I'll probably just cut that bit out. I should rewrite that bit. <laughs> what the fuck was he doing? He just died. <laughs> Looks like he's bound for the junkyard, not the repair shop. Oh, that was beautifully put. <laughs> Will you help us save our friends? Uh, yes or no? <laughs> Blaster, what happened? It's a long story, Perceptor. I'll tell you on the way back to Earth. Yeah, like you said, we just don't want to explain anything to the audience. <laughs> just deal with it. <laughs> Autobots! Impossible! Broadside! Impossible, is it? You're going to be too expected. <laughs> Just the button that says erase. Just grab his ass. <laughs> that seems like a big flaw in his design. Oh, Just yeah. erase his tape. Press the button. So very, 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 Daniel. That felt a lot longer. So Daniel, how would you rank Carnage and C minor? Well, let's say you've never eaten food before, and I give you a plate of raw chicken and you eat it. You're thinking, that tastes really bad. Like, you've got nothing to compare it to, you just know it's bad. Yeah. By any standard. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, if that's the best I've got to offer, then I'm worried about the rest of it. <laughs> it's very confusing. All the letters? Or is this just a special episode <laughs> that's just immensely fucking confusing? <laughs> like, who sat down and set, wrote this and thought, yeah, did this make sense? This seems like a good idea. This took, this isn't annoying. <laughs> this bitch screeching in my fucking ears out. <laughs> It's, a, it's the most, it's the worst rated for a reason. It See, seems like everything was a draft that they gave to a team of interns, yeah. and they said, "Fuck it." Yeah, that's it. Episode eighty-three: The Quintesson Journal. A Quintesson device may just be the key to peace between two worlds. The episode kicks off with one of the worst narrations I've ever heard. For centuries now, the planets Zetaxis and Lenark have been engaged in a senseless and brutal struggle. Can we get Casey Kasem back? You know, these aliens are disgusting. Can't we just kill them both? So for some reason, we have a flying tampon just travelling through space, and both Autobots and Decepticons pick up its signal, which leads to more combat. And nobody actually seems really interested in being part of this episode. Cyclonus is bored, Skylynx is bored, everybody's bored. This is Cyclonus, what news, Brother King? Oh, and for some reason Outback hasn't got any colour on his visor, and it's a recurring thing, it's throughout the whole episode. Remember who he is? He's the Australian one. You know, everything about this episode is just annoying. The Quintessons kidnap the Autobots, but they break free very quickly, because while well, the Shockticons are literally the dumbest henchmen in existence. Well, these bars present a little problem, don't you think? Now, damn me! Be glad to. Oh, finally, Galvatron shows up. I can at least somewhat enjoy a bit of this episode. But you said no mercy, Galvatron! Very true, so I will show none! <laughs> You know, this episode has just lost me to continue talking about it any further when it's like, why would the Quintessons just allow their journal to float through space? Well, at least I learnt one thing in this episode. This reminds me of your wrestling shows on Earth. At least those are faked, Rodimus. Wait, you're telling me WWE isn't real? Ah, uh, this might be a good time for a break. Yeah, good and hurt seeing as how everybody's already left anyway. How much do you want to bet that's how you're feeling about this video? Now for episode 84, The Ultimate Weapon, I'll have my good friend Sam from TFI Creations explain why this is one of his personal favourites. God, I keep saying that wrong, don't I? These guys are all my friends, I, I promise. Hey Cam, season three, The Ultimate Weapon. I absolutely Love this episode, mainly because it has one of the biggest inspirations that I took for one of our works in TFI, and that is a one-armed defensor, because I love the Protector Bots to death. The Ultimate Weapon was my first experience with the Protector Bots, and especially First Aid. Because when I first got the First Aid figure, I had no idea that he was a pacifist. And watching this episode, just how calm and caring he is, and confused about war just made him really, really unique to me because he's so innocent and I absolutely love First Aid as a character. He He's a huge influence on my own writing and stuff. So I loved him in this episode. Another key part I liked was earlier on in the episode, Ultra Magnus and Rodimus Prime, they're discussing, you know, leadership. You know, Rodimus states that, like, it's hard to live up to Optimus Prime, because we all know he was the greatest. I remember watching the 80s movie for the first time, and Optimus Prime dies, and that affected me in a certain way. I wasn't huge into Transformers when I first watched that film, but it was still impactful because everyone knows Optimus Prime. But definitely the highlight for me is the one-armed Defensor. When I first saw that, I don't know what it was, but it was just, it was a unique take on a combiner to have them be not fully there, but I do find it funny that um, Groove in combined mode, his motorcycle doubles in size. And true to their namesake, the Protector Bots, during this battle, they're still trying to save people at any chance. There's a, there's a part where uh, what, like a monorail train comes flying out of the sky and with one arm, Defensor catches it and kind of glides it back to the ground. Definitely love that. What I find quite interesting is I know a lot of uh, G1 episodes have a lot of animation errors. Reading up more on this episode, I come to find out that of all the episodes, this is one of the most 
uh, a finely tuned episode that has the least amount of animation errors. Granted, there are a few, but they're not as prominent as episodes from the past. But yet, overall, The Ultimate Weapon is, is by far my favorite episode of G1, mainly because of the Protectobots and First Aid, Aerial Bots, you know, all of that. It's got everything I always loved about the Transformers, and yeah, I absolutely love it. Okay, but are we ever going to address the old woman with a gun? And also how Vortex knows something's up by smelling the exhaust. I detect the nauseating stench of Autobot fumes. So pure, so pollutant-free. Tell me the truth, human. <coughs> the truth, human, the truth! <coughs> Finally! Okay, so I know they're supposed to be undercover, but still, at the same time, I can't believe they just allowed him to fall out of a car. Like, why were you just watching that? Ultra Magnus saves him, yes, but still, it's like, okay, but they just didn't transform sooner? Really? I really like that this episode showed that there is no ultimate weapon. Like, we hear Megatron all the time throughout seasons one and two talk about the ultimate weapon, and it's like, what is it? What exactly is it? And this episode just delivers on... Nothing really. It's just him saying it and just trying to scare the Autobots. And then the Autobots finally conquer it where, yeah, you ain't got one. Because I use the real ultimate weapon. My mind. Stay back! I said stay back! Episode 85, the big broadcast of 2006. The Quinnissons attempt to retrieve their lost records journal, so they use subliminal messages on the Junkions and inadvertently the entire galaxy. Telling the Junkions that being neat is a good thing and that the other races are their enemies. Only problem is, they send out the wrong message. Causing the Junkions to believe that they should transmit their broadcasts to other races and the affected races soon begin lashing out on their neighbours and all-out war breaks loose. Is it just me, or am I finding these episodes much harder to watch? Now it's not outright stated, but this is essentially the same journal from the Quenison Journal episode. And you know what? I, I don't care. I do not care about this episode. It's just like the Quenison Journal. In fact, I don't know why, but it just felt like I was watching the same episode. Like, it, it felt like it was the exact same. Like, even the characters do not care about this episode, and I cannot fault them for that. The new hyper generator will restore power to the entire 7th grid sector. Hmm? I know you're bored, Rodimus, but with the mantle of leadership... Like, literally, I have the same amount of patience as Galvatron does in this scene, which is none. Fool! Do you think I care? Mighty one, if the Junkians have turned against the Autobots, perhaps... Perhaps, Cyclonus, I still would not care. Now I've got really nothing wrong with the Junkions, I just stopped caring for them after the movie. And, you know, yeah, it's good that they've got more screen time, but this episode's really trying to get me to care about them, and I just don't. I have said, have I not, that the Junkions are of no interest to me? Yes, Mighty One. <laughs> I guess the only thing I really like is Retgard and Nancy, like their relationship, it's kind of fun. You know, they have some funny moments in this episode, but that's pretty much it. The rest of the Junkions are just, yeah, whatever. Quit arms out, kick high, be a winner, two, three, four. I'm a winner, I'm a winner. I believe in me. Also, randomly, we've just got Soundwave coming out of Blastoff. Yeah, overall, this episode is just a headache. There's too many lasers, too many explosions, just so much gunfire going off where it's just like, Clutter. We've got another standoff fight between Rodimus Prime and Galvatron, and as usual, it's underwhelming. And the way how they stop the transmission is just Blaster doing his thing again, and they don't even care who was behind the whole thing. I wonder if we'll ever know who broadcast those mysterious programs. Personally, I don't care. Neither do f***ing I. <sighs> the television, it bewitched me. <laughs> Episode 86, Fight or Flee. The Decepticons conquer Paradon, a world inhabited by pacifist Autobots. This ain't gonna go well. This is also the origin story of Sandstorm. 
even though he appeared in Starscream's Ghost. Yeah, this has happened before, let's just move on. And you know, this episode starts off pretty solid. We got a good action scene between Cyclonus, Gurge, and the Aerial Bots, and the animation is actually pretty consistently good throughout the whole episode. The fight ends because while Cyclonus and Scourge are surrounded and they take refuge in a vortex that they see. You know, it's kind of like seeing a black hole and going, yeah, let's hide in that. In doing this, they end up landing on Paradon, which is an Autobot colony initially hidden away from the wars that plagued Cybertron. Essentially, it's just paradise, it's just Cybertron as it should be. They're in such disbelief that they think it's like robot heaven. Welcome to Paradron, friends! You don't think this is what happens when you get deactivated, do you? Who knows, Gorge? Who knows? Oh my god, it must be. Please, send me there. I love this scene here of the Decepticons craving the Energon and Scourge just knocks that blue RC out of the way. <laughs> I don't know why that always gets me. You know, this episode actually delivers a lot of memorable quotes from both Scourge and Cyclonus, and they seem to really enjoy calling all of these Autobots wimps. Have I got the wrong idea, or are these guys a bunch of wimps? They appear to be wimps. The Decepticons manage to get back in touch with Galvatron, and whoa, hang on, that's actually a pretty cool design there. Out of all of the characters on this Paradon planet, this is the most unique looking design besides from Sandstorm. Give me a toy of that. Now this planet is debating on whether or not they should allow the Decepticons to stay because of the ruckus they've been causing. I mean, Paradise is swift up until the point you come across a Galvatron. Kneel to your new leader. But this is a democracy! I don't have to bow to anyone! Before a society can move forward, all must agree on the rules! Now kneel! Just imagine if Galvatron was president. Sandstorm is imprisoned, but is able to escape, and the Decepticons try their best to chase him down, and... Bruticus is at normal size, and it's Cyclonus's voice. Yes, they literally forgot to draw the right character. Sandstorm manages to find the Autobots of Cybertron, and they are having a tough time believing that Paradon exists. Nobody believes it in this episode. Galvatron is already starting up his new Decepticon Empire, and well, <laughs> we've got this scene here. What do we have here? I believe it is an Autobot invasion party. I know what it is. Didn't you just ask me what we had here? It was just a figure of speech. G1 really does have a lot of sassy dialogues. This episode has an interesting theme to it, similar to the Golden Lagoon that goes beyond a kid's show. War versus peace, but at what price? Do you fight or flee to defend what is yours? But that theme kind of deteriorates, so basically the Autobots are encountering heavy fire from the Decepticons, so their only plan to stop the Decepticons of conquering Paradon, this paradise, is to blow it up. No, Ultra Magnus, change mission. Blow the planet's energon core. That'll destroy the entire planet. I know, Sandstorm. He didn't even have to think about it. Like, really, dude? You couldn't have thought of any more ideas? Nah, this is all too extreme. Ultra Magnus will think of a better plan. I've never seen anything this beautiful in the entire galaxy. All right, give me the bomb. Okay, never mind, I've lost hope. That's Transformers in a nutshell. You know, I'm just stunned of how callous Rodimus is to just write off a whole planet and just like, yeah, let's just blow it up. And he doesn't want to fight, he doesn't want to put up a fight. He just gets everyone to retreat, millions of people having to evacuate in escape pods. I would say I'm being too hard on Rodimus here, but he says this. It's as beautiful in death as it was in life. Well, no need to get all mushy. Cybertron's a better place anyway, not so... Perfect. Episode 87, The Dweller in the Depths. The Quenison's latest scheme to regain control of Cybertron is to unleash one of their oldest creations. Basically, this thing is Cthulhu. So we get new lore. In the distant past of Cybertron, the Quenison's created this thing. And, uh, well, they're going to use the Decepticons to unleash it. Kind of some interesting backstory there with the Quenissons and Cybertron, but it's this. Also, I'm pretty sure there's a continuity error in there somewhere. The Quenissons are too scared to release the beast themselves, so they trick Galvatron into doing it for them. <laughs> this is going to be fun. 
You cringing, cowardly, weak will fools! Why am I still stuck on this worthless cosmic trash bin? Why have I not retaken Cybertron? And most importantly, why have I been saddled with such a useless pile of rusting junk for followers? But Galvatron, we humble sweeps need Energon to... And rightfully so, Galvatron does not trust the Quinnisons because they've betrayed him before in the past, but the Quinnisons actually make a compelling argument here. How can you be so certain we are the ones who betrayed you? Well, you all do look alike. Galvatron is a racist. Now the Autobots trail the Decepticons, but unfortunately Galvatron gets to the depths in time and unleashes chaos. And I gotta say, some of these weird designs are actually pretty cool. Very creative, it gives me like Final Fantasy vibes. These poor creatures look like they're in pain. And we got Octopus Primal here making his debut. The Decepticons retreat, leaving the Autobots to deal with the creatures on their own. But unfortunately, in the next room, Galvatron encounters Cthulhu. Now, this creature is brutal. Basically, to summarize it is... That thing drains robots of their power like some kind of vampire. <laughs> Thanks, RC. I mean, yeah, I was going to say that, but... Uh... Sorry, whose video is this? Everybody is basically almost dead in this episode, it's only Ultra Magnus and RC left on the Autobots team. Meanwhile, with the Decepticons, it's just comical. Yeah, be a good soldier, help him! Galvatron, no! I beg you! I just want to make it perfectly clear that I love all my friends and colleagues equally. So RC is able to hold back the creature by using Galvatron's own cannon. Now why couldn't Galvatron have just done that? So the way how they defeat the creature is just bizarre. So the Autobots and Decepticons who are infected have to hold hands? The power of science, I guess? So the Autobots are holding back the creature with the help of Optimus Prime. Okay, who did the colours on that? So the Autobots defeat the creature by using Perceptor's generator that was at the start of the episode. The Quinnisons get a taste of their own medicine when they have to deal with the creature themselves. And I gotta say, this is a very fitting end. God, I absolutely hate looking at this thing. It makes me want to throw up. <laughs> Episode 88, Only Human. The Autobots interfere with a crime-related business, so a powerful crime lord has their minds placed into symphoid bodies, with the help of a familiar old snake. War has changed. No, not that snake. Yes, that's right, this is our first real G.I. Joe crossover. It was just kind of hinted at before, but now we've got our real crossover. I don't know why they didn't take more of an advantage of this, because like I said earlier, like a G.I. Joe and Transformers crossover would have been actually pretty cool for the 80s. Like, I'm pretty sure that would have gotten a lot of viewing figures. The only time that the Transformers and G.I. Joe crossover is within the comics and toys. Now, I don't care for G.I. Joe, but who knows, maybe a crossover would have done it for me. The episode begins with destruction, and Springer proves that he is terrible at saving people. You locked up, chum. The Autobots are in town. Now this is a good switch around from Season 2's Autobot Spike, where we had a human becoming an Autobot, and now we've got the Autobots becoming humans. And this concept would be adapted several times throughout the Transmus franchise, such as the two-parter in Transmus Animated called Human Error. But if that's not enough for you, then you can just go on Tumblr, and there's about billions of different kinds of fan fiction on there. Now, Transmus Animated's Human Error episode had to stretch it out to two parts. And honestly, I wish that this episode would have done the same. It's just so rushed. There's just so many ideas in this episode that are just half developed. And towards the end, the scene transitions just make it more apparent that it wants to finish. And I've always enjoyed the idea of the Transmus becoming humans when you see fan art of what their interpretations would be like. And I think for this episode, they do a pretty good job with Springer, RC, Rodimus, and Ultra Magnus. But for some reason, RC, despite her robot mode looking exactly like Princess Layla from Star Wars, her human form is completely different. She's even got a brand new hairstyle. And I just love the fact that human Rodimus and human Springer look exactly like their voice actors. We've got Dick Gutierrez and Neil Ross, just the absolute spitting image. And yeah, Transformers Animated did the same with their voice cast. They just made them look like their respected voice actors. So the Autobots get lured into the laboratory and as they are trapped, their minds get transferred in a newly created Symphoid human body and it just looks like crap. Literally, it's just molded from like crap or something. 
Apparently, this is something that the Cobra would use on their old enemies for reasons... I, I don't know. I don't watch G.I. Joe, okay? With the robot bodies now empty, the Synthoid stuff gets thrown in the trash, and just before they become a pancake, they manage to escape. Rodimus goes for Terminator, and they enter a locker room where they find some clothes with colours that accurately match their robot forms. Because convenience. I gotta say, every time I watch this scene, it always makes me smile. You saved our lives, kid. Don't mention it, Gramps. Rodimus? What in the name of Prime? I just love how sad Ultra Magnus is. Yeah, dude, same. I, I hate being a human too. It, it sucks. Wait, how have I only just thought about it? Where is the Matrix during this whole body switching? Is it still in the robot form or is it... I, I don't want to think about it. The Autobots split up, so Magnus and RC go back to contact Autobot City, while Rodimus and Springer go after Draft. But once they reach his house, Rodimus attempts to draw the guards away, but he is wounded, and he is given refuge by Draft's girlfriend, Michelle. Now, Michelle. This bitch. Her motivations are bizarre. So at first she's upset that the Autobots are supposedly killed by Draft, but then later she saves Rodimus, yet later she happily turns him over to Draft, so it's like, was she actually attracted to him? And she changed her mind? Or was she just learning him in a trap all this time? Because if she was working with Draft from the start, why didn't she let Rodimus get captured here? And there's only one explanation for it. She wanted to bone Rodimus. Yes, I know this is a kid's show, but I mean, look at this scene here. We don't often get prowlers around here, let alone good looking ones. What's this? It's called breakfast, dummy. Hmm, smells better than it tastes. Did you enjoy your sojourn, Rodimus? Maybe a little too much, Preceptor. Who knows, probably not. These moments were supposed to be the indication. Regardless, it wouldn't have made the episode any more interesting. I love this little scene here with Springer and some random seller on the street, and this is one of the few Transformers quotes I tend to repeat quite frequently. The path to true humanity, only 4.95 tax deductible. Sorry, pal, I'm a robot at heart. Anyway, later on, Springer ends up riding himself. Hang on a minute. I knew exactly what I was going to say there. Yeah, I said it anyway. Okay, Springer flies himself. Is that better? No. Okay, whatever. Ultra Magnus threatens himself, and then RC kind of rides herself or her modern future alt mode oh god this is bad anyway the autobots find out that they've been turned into humans so they do a reverse and it's all good everyone gets arrested but the cobra guy he goes off into the sunset you know i would like to see the decepticons turn into humans i feel like that would be an interesting episode essentially starscream is cobra in human form but whatever this episode was just an experiment to answer bumblebee's question from season two and it's a pretty mild episode at best. <laughs> episode 89, Grimlock's New Brain. On Cybertron, the Autobots unveil the new generator, and who better to pull the switch to activate it? Throw the switch, Grimlock! Me Grimlock ready, but forgot which button. I went through it with him five times. And five times wasn't enough for you, Ronimus, to take a hint? In this episode, Grimlock gains tremendous intelligence and creates the Technobots. And when combined, they form Computron. Unfortunately, the episode sees the return of, um, the most hideous creatures to grace the Transformers cartoon. Okay, so the journey on how Grimlock gets this new intelligence. Uh, so the new generator is causing all the Autobots to malfunction. So they go down to try and fix it. And this is what I was talking about earlier on in Season 2, like the Dinobots just become a joke, but most specifically Grimlock, like he used to be this warrior, and now he's just become slapstick. No, you think me Grimlock just stupid? You no want me anymore! Now I'm not going to complain too much, because while I think this Grimlock is funny, you know, Greg Berger does a great job at delivering the lines, he works for both the serious and the comedic relief. I just kind of wish there was a bit more of a balance to it, instead of it just being kind of just thrown in there. 
Now, Cup is babysitting Grimlock, but they actually stumble into the core, and then Grimlock, being Grimlock, destroys the generator with his teeth, and in doing this, causes an electrical surge, and he is granted a brand new brain. Grimlock is smart now. I, Grimlock, <coughs> used my rear molars. Uh, that makes good sense. Good going. You what? We now have a T-Rex with vocabulary. And you know what? I really like it. This is where the episode really starts to shine, is when we get smart Grimlock, and I think the dialogue is actually really funny, which makes it one of the most memorable episodes of season 3, and kind of one of the funniest. It did kind of make me sad though when Grimlock rejected to get into the pond with the other Dinobots. And what's wrong with Snarl? He looks like a worm. Listen, Galvatron, you creepo! I did what you asked! Wow, I'm surprised that he's still alive after saying that. So with Galvatron's plans ruined, the ugly maggots tell him that if he wants more anti-electrons, he can get them from Unicron's brain. And honestly, I'm shocked you can get anything from Unicron at this point, because it looks like he's had way too many. You know, with the Decepticons nowadays, it feels like Galvatron's got his own little pet shop. We have a new character highlighted in this episode called Hunger. Yes, literally, from the song Hunger. In the 1986 movie, how on the nose can you be? Well, the Autobots head over to defeat the Decepticons, and Rodimus once again proves how utterly useless he is as a leader, and it's too much for Grimlock, where he's like, nah mate, I'm out. I've had enough of this shit. Why did they have to animate it like that though, where Rodimus is like, please don't go. Help, I'm slowly getting murdered. Like I mentioned at the start of this episode, yes, Grimlock creates the Technobots, a new combiner, and he starts off with Nose Cone with just a box of scraps just laying around, and he's literally created within a transition. Yes, let's just not show the process, we don't need to see it, let's just say it just happened, because Grimlock is smart now, he can create life like that. Are you my father? In a way. It's funny and sad that his whole existence is just so that Grimlock could drill through a wall. Cyclonus and Scourge managed to piss off Unicron, and just out of nowhere, we have the entire Technobots just built. No explanation. And here's my theory. I think they accidentally swapped the Unicron attacking scene with the introduction scene of all the Technobots, because it just makes more sense to introduce them first, and then the Cyclonus and Scourge scene happens where Unicron starts attacking and, you know, they're first in action. And it's just like, yeah, that's got to be it. We've got new characters such as Strafe, Afterburn, Lightspeed, and Scattershot, and I gotta admit, Computron is not my favourite combiner. Who knows, maybe it was MatPat's fault for staining the character in the Prime Wars trilogy. Statements, past falsehoods indicate probable current dishonesty. Is that my excuse? Yeah, I think I'm gonna go with that. The only one out of the Technobots I really like is Scattershot, and that's just because I played as him all the time in Transfer's War for Cybertron in the Escalation. The episode's ending is very rushed. We have a combiner fight that if you blink, you'll miss it. Grimlock gives up his intelligence to aid Computron in the fight against Abominus. Oh, another combiner formed by the Terracons, which is Galvatron's little pet shop group we were talking about earlier. The day is saved and Grimlock is back in the pond with the other Dinobots hunting for fish. Me Grimlock say no fun to be genius all of time. Much more better to be good old Dinobot Grimlock. <laughs> Yay, you're dumb again. Also, this is Cosmos' last appearance. Episode 90, Money is Everything. Marissa Fairborn and the Technobots are drawn into a Quintesson deal when they meet Dick Manus. Oh wait, sorry. Uh, Dirk Manus. Now this is the only episode in Season 3 where none of the major characters appear, like Rodimus Prime, Galvatron, Ultra Magnus, Cyclonus, etc. It's just focusing on the Technobots, and each character gets a moment to shine, which, you know, I think is a really good thing. Because their origin episodes didn't do him any favours. And like mentioned before, we have a returning character, Marissa Fairborn. And she's got a lot more to do in this episode, considering the last time we saw her, she turned into a baby. Well, <laughs> she's grown up a lot since then, and... Um, <laughs> I don't know how to keep a straight face. And she has an unfortunate love interest with this scoundrel. Hello there. Dirk Manis, free trader from Epsilon Ariadne. Just another odd human custom, I suppose. <laughs> no one touches my Marissa and gets away with it. He's working with the Quintessons, but he gets shot down by some Decepticons, and the Technobots are there to save the day, and he offers them a deal that if they pay his fee, he'll give up the Quintessons. The Technobots form Computron to decipher whether or not they can trust him or not. Apparently this is something that they can do. 
How long are they gonna keep that up? Till they decide whether to trust you. In Computron mode, Technobots have the computational ability of 200 supercomputers. When it comes to calculating odds, Computron rarely makes a mistake. I don't care what Computron says. Until we leave for Saturn, I'm not letting you out of my sight. 200 supercomputers can't beat a woman's instinct. Now when it comes to this dick, I gotta say, at first he seems like another Oggy, you know, that character from season 2, but over the course of the episode he kinda grows on you and his banter between Marissa is actually quite comical, despite the situation being incredibly toxic. So his situation is that he has a device that the Quintessons want called the Recreator, which basically just disassembles and then also can reassemble the victims. That the Quintessons con him with fake money, but then he cons them by putting a bomb on the device if anything goes wrong, but then they con him again before he can blow up the device as they blow up his ship, called Lazy Sue, and no one attacks Lazy Sue like that. So he teams up with the Technobots and reunites with Marissa, who is very pissed at him. You're fantastic. Yes, so are you, Dirk. <laughs> what was that for? Want a list? Ooh, that reminds me of a love both me and my girlfriend share. <laughs> but this is short-lived when he cons Marissa and the Technobots again, but he only does this so in turn that he can con the Quintessons by using the Disassembler to repair the Technobots. Honestly, you could have just told him the plan from the start, so I don't know why this guy has to be such a dick. Anyway, we get a combined fight between Computron and Abominus. And I gotta say, Computron's strategy on calculating the odds before every attack is extremely flawed. Angle of fire, 14 degrees off center. Calculating return fire pattern. Well, at least he was fighting Abominus, because I think any other combiner he would have lost. <laughs> Calculated force necessary to activate Terracon timer mechanism, 16 megahertz. Okay, he's giving me a headache now, let's move on. I like how this episode ends, so Melissa ends up actually conning Dick, and they both have a little laugh off. And you know what? This is actually quite a funny end. Fun fact, a married couple wrote this episode, both Carla and Jerry Conway. Hmm, I wonder if any of this was inspired from their own romance. I kinda hope not. Episode 91, Call of the Primitives. In this episode, the Transformers go full anime. Well, that escalated quickly. Seriously though, this has some of the best animation I've seen throughout the entire series. So in this episode, a monkey creates Unicron's little brother, Tormatron. That doesn't sound real, it's so stupid. Grow on Energon. You are more than I could have hoped for, Tormatron. Much more. <laughs> What the fuck is this piece of shit? You know, I just want to talk about the animation style. It's just drop dead gorgeous in every shot. And you know, if the entire series was animated just like this, in this kind of manga anime style, I feel like most people would have had a different outlook on G1. But I can't fault the fans for wanting episodes to be more in this style. It really sets the bar high, even though the bar was not that very high to begin with. I'm a sucker for over-stylized character models, you know, when you got Rodimus just looking the way he does, he just looks so much more pointier. Well, I mean, all the characters do, they've all got a certain sharpness to him that I just go, wow. Like, I'm not kidding, I was too focused on the animation and I completely forgot what the plot was about. Okay, so a glowing rock called the Oracle created Unicron with the help of a monkey called Primacron. So the Oracle summons all the primitive Transformers to gang together to defeat the monkey's latest creation, Tormatron. He's described as Unicron's little brother. And he's causing havoc, so the Oracle wants him to be stopped because he's making everything grey. We've got grey Transformers, we've got grey Earth, everyone's grey. Now the plot of this episode is very forgettable, and that's a good thing because I don't like the idea of a monkey and a glowing rock being responsible for the creation of Unicron. Now the only thing really fun about this episode is watching the Beast Transformers try and get along, you know, and Skylynx automatically makes himself the leader of the group. There's some good comedy moments here. The way how this episode ends is just stupid. Primacron, who creates all these, like, giant beings, does not know how to defeat Tormatron. He says he's thought of everything, and Grimlock's just there like... You 
nuts like primitive like me. Me, Grimlock, think I did right thing. Grimlock just saved the whole universe with a switch. I'm just trying to process that. <laughs> I hate this thing. The scrotum deserves it. And somehow this ends up being the last appearance of both Jazz and my boy, Windcharger. There he is. He's just there in the background. Someone on the team must have been a Windcharger fan to just put him in the background like that just randomly. Episode 92, The Face of Najika. The Autobots discover a race of aliens who have also experienced persecution from the Quintessons. Yes, I know, another Quintesson episode. So they're after a quadrant lock, which is capable of sealing off like regions of space. They sealed off a planet called Zimojin. The Quintessons feared the natives because of their telepathical abilities, so they sealed them off to stop them from evolving further. But it's not just the Quintessons after the lock, so is Galvatron. And I wish we had more of him in this episode because he's just, oh, he's just hilarious. Mighty Galvatron, please! We are in danger of... Ah! Ah! You shall learn the secret of this disc, or die trying! Blur is also in this episode. Yay, Blur. Peculiar, peculiar, what's peculiar? Where, where, where? So far this trip has been boring, boring, boring! It's about time we saw something peculiar, heard something peculiar, even smelled something peculiar! <laughs> Put yourself in idle, Blur. Spoiler alert, he doesn't stay in idle. Also, something I thought I'd never see, the Autobots flying out of Skylinx's mouth. That's disgusting. Okay, so in order to stop the Autobots, the Quintessons decide to just trap the Autobots into the lock, but they accidentally get pulled in themselves, and so does Cyclonus because Galvatron just chucks him in. The Quintessons try to get out of it, but their isolator key is broken, and the only thing that can get them out is Preceptor because he has a universal emulator or whatever. Anyway, he gets trapped in his microscope mode and is kidnapped by some dude. And his insignia is removed and is placed on a faceless Najika. The face of Najika. Oh, hey, look, it's Windblade's little sister. No, I'm serious. An impressive display, Katsudan. Per this unit's design specifications, yes. Does this surprise you? You know, the only thing creepy about it is that she's using Perceptor's voice. No, wait. Oh, I just realized Perceptor's consciousness is inside of her. Okay, so Perceptor ends up in a tiny alien Asian robot. Well, it's not every day that Perceptor gets to show his inner feminine side. And for some reason, they were terrified your people would reach the stars. Okay, so he doesn't have to hold it like that, but he does anyway. Take me to the city. Wait a minute, I didn't realize how small he was. Okay, so on to the other Autobots. Uh, they are carrying Blur, who was injured during their fall to the planet, and he is not happy. You can tell Blur's mad when he starts speaking slowly. Get us out of here, wham, zip into car mode, zoom, push, gone, we'll never have to think about it. Oh, oh. Go find Perceptor. You fix him, maybe he can fix me. He tells them to leave him behind, and immediately after that, he gets captured by a tribe. And Ultra Magnus and Rodimus encounter the same tribe later on, and it doesn't take long for Rodimus to want to blow up another planet. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. How about we blow this popsicle stand? The sooner, the better. And then, I'll just wipe New York off the fucking map. Well, one thing I don't get when it comes to the people of this planet is their logic to execute Blur, because while they think he's a devil of the servant Quintessons, and they remember what the Quintessons look like because they've got a stick with their face on it, yet the Quintessons are right there in the crowd with Cyclonus watching Blur's execution. Like, how did they not notice? I gotta love what Cyclonus says here, though. Burn him now! Be patient! Don't call attention to us! Vengeance now! 
Anyway, yeah, the day is saved, uh, they get their stars back, Perceptor has to hang up the dress, and actually this is Perceptor's last episode. So, I guess this is like a good last episode for him. Memoirs of a tiny alien robot geisha with a male alien robot's transplanted brain. He really has come a long way. Now that's character development. I don't really know how to end this off, so here's an uncomfortable clip of Blur really enjoying the molten pit. Episode 93, The Burden Hardest to Bear. In this episode, Ronimus Prime doesn't want to be the leader anymore, so Scourge takes the Matrix, and Galvatron loses his shit. Only Galvatron leads. I will not rest until the Matrix and Scourge have been destroyed! Now it's time to introduce another Transmers YouTuber who grew up with this episode as a kid, and who better than the Jesus-loving geek himself, Rodimus Primal. Hey everyone, it's Rodimus Primal. Cam asked me to talk about my favorite G1 cartoon episode, and that really is a hard one, because I there's a lot. A lot of people overlook a lot of the episodes in season three. Which one is my favorite? I have to probably go with the burden hardest to bear. And I think it's one that really reaches me on a personal level on, you know, the first of all, the character of Rodimus Prime, which is this, that episode alone just can, you know, really make me see that character in such a positive light, despite his, his shortcomings and, and things that he's had going on. You know, you have Rodimus Prime at the beginning of the, the episode is leading the Autobots to, in the defense of Japan, where the Decepticons are attacking. And he wins. He's able to, you know, you have, you get to see some uh, your old uh, G1 favorites, you get to see Devastator and Predaking fighting Broadside. You get to see Skylinks riding in with Rodimus Prime and Cup against Cyclonus and the Sweeps. You get to see Defensor fighting against Bruticus, which is, is great as well. But despite all of this, Rodimus Prime has to deal with, well, the fact that even though he is successful in what he's doing, people just don't see it. You know, uh, the people of Japan sit there and they they give him an earful uh, because the Decepticons attack and it scared away business and people are are, uh, are terrified of the Transformers fighting. But here Rodimus Prime is like, Hey, I am well aware of the damage that's been done, but we stopped the Decepticons from... This is very bad for business. You frighten locals and scare tourists away. Yeah, then maybe you ought to try protecting yourselves. Your presence and the presence of others like you does endanger us. And so Rodimus Prime is, has that that burden on his shoulders, and he's like, I just, I gotta get away. Give me a break, will you? Since when am I the only one who can solve everybody's problems? But, but you... Just leave me alone! <laughs> and then the Decepticons end up stealing the Matrix from him, uh, bringing it back to Char, where Galvatron, like, is like, wants to play with it, and he's like, You dropped it, didn't you? You broke the Matrix, didn't you? Return the Matrix! I will! I will! Scourge, take this and destroy it! But mighty Galvatron, you agreed to return it! I lied! But Hot Rod is left earlier in the episode. There is a, I believe it's, you know, a kendo instructor is, is teaching his students when the Decepticons had attacked. And uh, so Hot Rod basically hangs out there doesn't want to be leader anymore he doesn't want to be rod of his prime anymore and uh so so scourge launches an attack you know after usurping galvatron to attack the earth and attack japan so while this is happening you know hot rod wa witnesses a lesson that the kendo structure instructor is given to a young student who you know loses his footing and is like what were you thinking oh i was thinking i didn't want to lose and it's like well you don't think about anything what do you mean don't think about anything think about that like just do what you're supposed to do what one is obliged to do and hot rod comes to that realization when he sees scourge attacking and he sees how much the matrix has mutated him and also the young student is also there instrumental in helping you know hot rod you know so then hot rod ends up stealing the you know ends up taking the matrix back becoming rodimus prime again before scourge 
has to face Galvatron. Scourge! Mighty Galvatron! Oh, no! Galvatron! You don't understand! Understand what? It wasn't my fault! It was the Matrix! Ah! The Matrix? And this too is the fault of the Matrix! At the end of the episode, the best lesson there was it's not just the Matrix, it's I've also regained that part of myself. And I think about that, about that particular line in the episode towards the end where he finally realizes, like, I must take on my responsibilities. Well, son of a gun, found that missing part, huh? Not just the Matrix Cup, a missing part of myself. I've had a lot of experiences happen in my, in my life. You know, I worked in, in corporate, uh, you know, businesses before and had to deal with that leadership and wanted to quit. And here I am, I'm a father and a husband, and I need to make sure that my family is taken care of. And I have that burden of responsibility. And sometimes I wish I can go back to the days when I was like in my early 20s. How do you feel, Ruddy? Strong enough to go after him? I'm still me, you're still you. Matrix, Matrix. Hot Rod, listen to what you're saying. I know exactly what I'm saying. Life is not that simple. Life ha gives you a lot of challenges, but you need to keep moving forward. And what you are you know, obliged to do, you need to step up and do it. And you can do it. And it's not too late. And you can succeed. And that is why Burden Hardest to Bear resonates for me as my favorite G1 cartoon episode. So, thank you. Episode 94, The Return of Optimus Prime Part 1. I've done it! Optimus Prime lives! It's true. Our leader is back. Yes, guys. And this time, no fear. Wait, didn't he die? Like, twice? So yeah, basically, this entire episode is a massive continuity error. Because, you know, last time we saw him, he blew up. He didn't have an arm, and he was missing half of his face. And did I forget to mention he blew up? Yet in this new episode, Octopus Prime is shown completely intact, albeit dead, but still. Someone fixed Prime's body, but no one can fix the story. But who cares, okay? The kids are happy, Optimus Prime is back. So tell us, Hasbro, what's your genius plot? How are you going to bring back Optimus Prime? So two scientists that are bitter about the Autobots use the body of Octopus Prime to unleash a dangerous plague on the Autobots and ultimately the universe. Really? Okay. So we have brand new human characters in this episode. Jessica, Gregory, and Mark. It's unfortunate that we didn't get human characters that Prime knew from the beginning like Spike and Carly and heck, even Chip Chase. So while on a deep space mission, both Gregory and Jessica come across a ship carrying Optimus Prime. They both recognize their former Autobot leader, especially Gregory, who has reservations on saving him because he reflects on a memory where he was previously scarred during a battle between Optimus Prime and Megatron. Prime did this to me. This is his fault. Something tells me I'm not really gonna like Gregory. Oh, Lousy robot. Oh, way to go. Hit him when they're down. We need to kill Gregory. Okay, so Optimus Prime's ship is on a collision course with a plantoid orbiting star, so they go and rescue him. After successfully checking if Optimus Prime has athlete's foot, they watch the ship collide, which sets the whole thing into a supernova, but their ship gets unfortunately covered with some weird spores. So when they return to Earth, Jessica's father, Mark, tests out the spores on these innocent creatures and it's like, wow dude, what did the mice ever do to you, you dick? And conveniently, just as they learn that the spores are incredibly contagious, the Decepticons attack. Jessica is injured after saving her father and the Autobots are desperately trying their best to save her. Get away from her, you killers! Don't touch her! Leave my daughter alone! Get away, I said! I can do this! Um, dude, the Autobots are trying to help her? The ambulance! It's one of them! They're taking away Jessica! Oh, I hate them, Gregory! I hate them all! Um, okay. Okay, so these two arseholes come up with a plan to infect the other Autobots by using Prime's body. 
even though they saved his daughter's life with an exoskeleton? Wait, nobody tell Chip. Yes, so the Autobots provide Jessica with an exoskeleton so she can walk again, but the father is in a bit of rage about this, and to be fair, I kinda get him. If they had a Decepticon in a hospital where my daughter was at, I'd be pretty mad too. Jesse, what have these monsters done to you? Dad, I can walk! They're destroying you like they destroy everything else. No, we just want to help! They timed that so right with the exoskeleton and the music in the background. Okay, so the experiment to use Optimus Prime failed, so they're just going to burn his body instead to use his metal. It's just some things that they say and do with Optimus Prime in this episode. Like, I can't imagine kids watching this and enjoying it because they keep teasing Optimus Prime dying, even though this is his return. Yeah, so this new trio, it just reminds me of the bot kids. They're just eerily similar to each other. So Jessica saves Optimus Prime from becoming a crisp, and now I'm conflicted if I want to be buried or cremated, because this right here is not giving me a lot of confidence to be cremated, because look how Optimus Prime just comes out of there. So Jessica's father, Mark, wants to use her as bait to lure the Autobots in, but she just goes against her father's wishes anyway and just tells them what he's planning. Why do I keep seeing you in my dreams, Optimus? Maybe because there's a giant ass statue of Optimus Prime right there. Also, I'm pretty sure it wasn't that fat. Okay, so we've got Rodimus Prime once again questioning his leadership status, but I actually really like this scene. Like, the way how he talks, like, when he finds out that there's a chance that Optimus Prime might still be alive, he gets all the Autobots together, rallies them all together to charge to go rescue him, and it's just really cool. Like, the music really helps, and we get all the characters, like, and Bumblebee even is there. Like, the stakes are high, and it's just really epic. Okay, so we get some new characters introduced called the Throttlebots. And they're alright, they're cool, they're just kind of background fodder really, they don't really do much. You know, I've always kind of looked at them as sort of like the Power Rangers of the Transformers. You kind of wish they'd just get a bit more screen time really. The Autobots find Optimus Prime in the lab, but he's pretty wasted. Optimus. I remember the time on Cybertron. Anyway, the Autobots get infected, all hell breaks loose. People gone mad! This is no place for me! The irony in that line. Oh, the humans get infected as well, and it's pretty much the end of the world. And this moment right here would lead into the highly acclaimed spin-off series. The hate plague, as it's become known, is spreading like wildfire across our world. It began with infected Transformers. Okay, so with the hate plague spreading across the entire planet, Rodimus thinks it's more important to bring back Optimus Prime. His engines, they cannot take the strain! Rekgar, any hope that Junkions can repair him? He's dead, Jim. <laughs> okay. Rodimus orders Skylinks to find a Quinnison because he concludes that, well, if the Quinnisons brought Optimus Prime back before, then they can do the same again. Even though it was Alpha Trion who built Optimus Prime, from Orion Pax, yes, the Quinnisons created the Transformers race, but weren't they driven off Cybertron way before? Uh, it's, okay, who cares, whatever. We've just got the Quinnisons for some reason running away from Shocktacons who are infected, but wait, isn't the plague only on Earth? Why is it on the planet the Quinnisons are on? It, how did it spread that fast? Okay, there's so many questions here. I, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought each second I carry on talking. Anyway, after this, Rodimus Prime decides to shut down Metroplex because he realises that if he gets infected, then we're all screwed. Anyway, things escalate, Rekgar gets infected, and then, unfortunately, so does Rodimus. And when all seems lost, the Quinnisons successfully manage to bring back Optimus Prime, and yes, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. Optimus. It's true. Our leader is back. Um, excuse me, what the actual fuck are you doing in my house? Prime is back in part two. So Optimus gets catched up on the last episode's events, but honestly, he needs to catch up with the entire series, because when this guy was alive, all of his comrades from seasons one and two were still alive, and now they're dead. He needs to know about Unicron. He also needs to know that Megatron is now Galvatron. Also, I'm fairly certain he has no memory at all of what happened in Dark Awakening. Like, oh yeah, you were also a zombie and you tried to murder everyone. Seriously, if I just woke up from this, I would have some serious questions. I mean, I don't know, I think he'd be pretty mad at Rodimus Prime. Vector Sigma, give me back that fucking Matrix immediately. You've run this organization right out of the fucking ground, Hot Rod. I tried to do my best. If you would let Ultra Magnus have the Matrix like I had intended, then we wouldn't be in this mess now, would we? No, we wouldn't, Optimus, sir. The best you can do is bring me back to life to fix your problems. It's probably the best move as leader that you've ever made. 
By all accounts, this is one of the better looking animated episodes, and this is the last episode animated by Toei. Now they would return to animate the exclusive Japanese sequel series, Headmasters, but when it comes to the last episode, with the American cartoon, they did a really good job. Everyone's pretty much shinier, all the character models are on point, and with this being a season finale, they really went all out. Okay, so not all Autobots were infected, some were just badly damaged, and this goes for Bumblebee, who was reformatted into Goldbug by the Quinison. I mean, I guess he looks friendly. I mean, sure, why not? I can't say I really have an opinion on Goldbug. He just exists. He's there. That's just something they wanted to do for the toys, and this series is almost over, and at this point I really couldn't care. <laughs> I just simply look at it as like, Bumblebee went from being a bee to a wasp. Gold wasp? Uh, gold mug? Uh, whatever. Okay, so this is amazing. We've got Optimus Prime back. We've got the goat. So tell us, Optimus, how are we going to fight back? How are we going to stop this plague? How are we going to save the world? What's the plan? I have no plan. We just do what they want. How are we going to live with ourselves? From here, the fight will be your own. Wow. So Prime's useless. Okay, so the only answer that can be found is through the Matrix, and unfortunately... Optimus Prime has the Matrix. But Jessica comes up with an idea on how Optimus Prime can get the Matrix without being infected. I believe I have the answer. It cannot be. Chip Chase, is that you? Now we transition to Galvatron where he's being attacked by the Decepticons. So the Autobots need the metal that he stole in part one so they can create a shield for Optimus Prime so he doesn't get infected with the Hate Plague and somehow Optimus Prime manages to convince him to join him. And this is where the episode really shines for me. These two working together, we get some really good banter between the two. I've explained it to you. You told me it was important, but you didn't tell me why. That's because I know you too well, Galvatron. Now I really like the Char segment. The Autobots have to go through some obstacles and Galvatron is just enjoying their torture. We've got a giant ass spider. Oh my! <laughs> I was ready to help, but I knew you didn't need me. Come along. I love you, Galvatron, you sadistic purple horny man. After killing off some worms, they finally get to the metal, but unfortunately, the other Autobots get infected, Jessica gets infected, and in turn, infects Galvatron. I find it kind of weird how they just leave Jessica on char. I mean, she touches Skylink, so shouldn't he be infected? Or oh, whatever. Anyway, Optimus Prime embraces his Ultra Magnus shell and takes on Rodimus. It's pretty much just a game of tug of war. There's nothing really memorable about the choreography, really. It's just like watching your siblings fight. You have no soul. That is why I have no fear. In order to find a cure for the Hate Plague, Optimus must travel deep within the Matrix and talk to the ancient Autobot leaders. This place is essentially a senior care home. He first speaks with Alpha Trion, but he needs to go deeper and talks to a creature called It. Now seriously, that's his name on TF Wiki. I love how it's pretty much just Peter Cullen's voice, but they've just pitched it up to a high level. Like you can tell this is Peter Cullen, it's like he's just talking to himself. Contain the spores and send them into the sun, but no one was able to- Okay, now that's enough for you. Let's move on. So Optimus Prime finally figures out the cure and unleashes the Matrix. And we have the sound cue to prove that it is working. Optimus Prime shall die again! You got the time! There's something just really magical about this, you know, it's a good payoff to the 1986 movie for people who were bitter about Prime's death, you know, having him unleash the touch, there's just something really cool about it, and I think a lot of G1 fans, you know, watching this as a kid, must have just had their hands in the air, like, woohoo, finally, you know, we get that moment. After this though, the episode is in a rush to end, which is fine, I guess, you know, we have a good scene anyway between Optimus Prime and Galvatron, and then we've got the human characters. I can't say what I'm feeling. I'm so terribly sorry. We had no right to do what we did with the spores. And for what we thought and believed of you, we... I deeply apologize. Yeah, whatever. You're both going to jail. I really like this ending for the season, and if this was like the definitive end of the entire series, I would have been happy. 
We've got the Autobots and Decepticons getting along. Granted, it'd probably be only for a day. But still, nonetheless, I feel like they could have added a lot more to this ending. They could have let the song, the touch, at least play out just a little bit longer. Uh, because after this, we get an advert for Ultra Magnus. Like, really guys? You could have really added more to this episode. But we get an advert for Ultra Magnus, who is barely in this episode. Vehicle mode. Ultra Magnus is an armored transport truck. A machine with magnificent fighting skills. Yeah, it was pretty useless in this two-parter. Now, despite me really enjoying this two-parter, the resurrection of Optimus Prime was too little too late. Of course, he returned just because the kid's reaction to his death was so bad. And I can't blame him, I cried when I was a kid watching this as well. Because Optimus Prime is an important character, not just in the world of Transformers, but he's a pop culture icon around the world. Kids look up to him. Now I could go on on why Optimus Prime means so much to me, but I feel like I've done enough of that already. So for my next collaboration and the final one of this video, I'm going to let Alfonso from Alfonso Nation explain why Optimus Prime means so much to him. Take it away. Hey what's up Cam, Alfonso here of the Alfonso Nation. Alright. Since we're talking about G1 goodness, I gotta talk about the center of it all. And my favorite character of all time, Optimus Prime. This entire series was the birth of this incredible character, and it was voiced by, at the time, a legend in the making, Peter Cullen. And his influence and example literally altered the course of the collective story as it should. One of the ways G1 Prime uh, stands out unique in this series it's his relatability with not only other Cybertronians, but humans as well. He's personable, he's humble, he's gracious, he's approachable, but he's also aggressive. And he's wise, and he's consistent, and he's bold when it matters most. The ability to reason with other enemy characters like Galvatron, putting aside the differences for the greater good. The reason this means so much to me is because these exact same characteristics created a precedent and it extended beyond this show. This show was the beginning of it, but it created this, this standard for Optimus Prime. And there's even really powerful messages like, The wisdom of the ages, it's lost. No, not lost. We're all a little wiser now. It's up to all of us to fill it again. With the wisdom we accumulate from this moment on. That's my boy, man. That's my boy. Even a Decepticon, like Galvatron, literally confessed. There will be no war today, Optimus Prime. You have earned Galvatron's respect. And honestly, I can't say I blame him. I am my Optimus Prime, if you couldn't tell. And this show was the beginning of it. And because of that, we are where we are today. Thanks, Cam and everybody. Alfonso signing out. Transformers will return after these messages. Now here's my episode ranking of season 3, and arguably a difficult season to rank just based on the fact that this is not my favourite. But you know what, when it came to rewatching these episodes for this video, I've kind of found a greater appreciation for the series. Like I can see what they were trying to do and steer the franchise in a different direction. I don't think it worked out for the most part. But without a doubt, there are some good episodes in this season, so I don't feel like I can be as harsh to season 3 anymore like I used to be as a kid. My favourite episode is of course Starscream's Ghost because there's just so much fun to have with that episode. And my least favourite one, well, Daniel's face says it all. So that's it, the Transformers series has wrapped up. And you know, the return of Optimus Prime did a good send off for the entire series. Absolutely perfect. There should be nothing else to come after this. I'm fairly certain that this is the definitive end for the Transformers Generation 1 cartoon. Please, please let it be the end. We now return to the Transformers. Fuck! Episode 96, The Rebirth Part 1. Which is ironic because this is the death of the series. It was perfect, but no, you just had to blow it up. You and your pride and your ego. You just had to be the man. So Galvatron invades Autobot City and then Cybertron with a plan to destroy the Autobots forever. And this is something new. To be fair, Galvatron did say he'd call the war off only for a day. So season 4 is a three episode season, and I really do think the rebirth is the definitive example of milking it. It's like, the cow is dead. Why are you still trying to milk its nipples? Okay, look, I know that's not what they're actually called, but still. 
So David Wise has stated that he was contacted by Sunbow Productions to write up a five part series finale, but he was told he had to introduce brand new characters for the upcoming Transformers toy line. Both the Headmasters and the Target Masters. To transform us out of one, the vehicle transforms and so does that again. Target Master Transformers. I think I just died inside. So in total, the rebirth introduces to 46 brand new characters. That's a lot. Regardless, David Wise finished the script and outlined all five episodes, but due to budget cutbacks, it was now reduced to a three-parter, which I can imagine was just a massive headache for the writers. So in total, there are 98 episodes of G1. And that annoys me. Like, really guys? You were two episodes off from 100? Now I like the number 98, but... I also love round numbers. You, ju you just had two more episodes. You could have made it a hundred. Oh yeah, if you couldn't tell by that commercial, the season four intro was basically just mashed up commercials. And you know what? It's actually kind of a smart idea. But unfortunately, we have two different animation styles in this intro and they don't work together well at all. Plus, the intro looks nothing like the actual episodes. So the episode begins with the Autobots slagging off the Decepticons. Meanwhile, Ultra Magnus walks in a room where Optimus Prime is on his knees. Fan art has just been created somewhere on Tumblr. Optimus claims that he's been having visions since he opened the Matrix and something big is coming. And conveniently, Goldbug informs Optimus of the approaching Decepticons. And Optimus realizes that whatever he's been sensing is starting right now. Prime is already proven to be absolutely useless in this episode. We get new Decepticons called Ape Face, Snapdragon, and Mindwipe, who is my favorite by the way how he asserts his dominance to light speed. Circuits are under my power light speed. You will back away. Back away. You feel powerless to resist. If only the Autobots had Ozzy Osbourne on their team. You will back away. Back away. No, no, no! New Decepticon spies, Pounce, and Wingspan are infiltrating the Autobot base and they are being tailed by Punch, who is an Autobot, but he can also disguise himself as a Decepticon named Counterpunch. And you'd think that this ability would only be able to work once, but whatever. So the Decepticon stole the Plasma Energy Chamber key from the Vault. Meanwhile on Cybertron, we have Blur, Daniel, and Hot Rod. Yes, he still exists. Along with brand new Autobots, Brainstorm, Highbrow, Crosshairs, Celebros, and... <sighs> There's just a lot, okay? Anyway, the Decepticons attack, and we basically get a commercial for a brand new Decepticon, Six Shot, that has six modes. Five up, five down! It's like shooting cyber ducks in a barrel! No, that's it. Seriously. That's his only scene throughout the entire three-parter. So the plasma energy chamber goes berserk and shoots the Autobots off into space, crash landing on another planet called Nebulos, and with Hardhead finally murdering Blur, and evacuating the ship before it explodes, the Autobots encounter the Nebulons. Look! Up ahead! Boy, are we glad to see you! What are you doing? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? So the Nebulons capture them to see if they're part of a group called the Hive, an evil rival faction on the planet. The Decepticons attack, Daniel gets injured after saving RC, and some Autobots are captured. We get a quick history lesson of the Shrek people and their war with the machines. They name all of the characters, but honestly, and I'm not trying to sound mean here, but I don't give a f Okay, so the Nebulons managed to stabilize Daniel's condition, but this means he'll have to be connected to life support permanently. Quick, where's the wire? <laughs> I'm kidding, Daniel's not that bad. Well. And the Nebulon leader, Shrek, explains that they know the weak points of the machines, but they just don't have the firepower. So Spike brings up Brainstorm's idea of organic partners that might just do the trick. And the Autobots just agree to allow the Nebulons to use their heads as suits? Except for Cerebros. What about you, Cerebros? No. What? I must stand by what I believe in. Which is Autobot supremacy. But we're helping these people in their fight. Nope. This series has gone downhill. I'm done. Okay. I guess that means he's out. RC requests to be Daniel's headmaster, and Spike agrees. Uh, where's Carly? The mother of the child? Does she agree to this? 
So what, like, his next of kin is an Autobot? So they all remove their heads and they're about to become headmasters. Now, the headmasters concept is something I just don't care about. I've just never found it interesting. I've always found the idea kind of confusing. And I think my friend Lewis brings up a really good point here. I've literally thought about it a million times. I do not want someone in my head. <laughs> They would probably either go driven crazy because of the way I don't shut off my brain at all, or it's just the fact that I will never be able to actually just be myself. I'll be with someone in my head all the time, and it's annoying. <laughs> Episode 97, The Rebirth Part 2. The Autobot Headmasters proved to be a smashing <laughs> success. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't read that seriously. They were a smashing success in Japan. Anyway, the Decepticons soon find Nebulon partners of their own, the Hive. So the Nebulons pick which Autobots they want to partner up with, and I find this whole thing just underwhelming. You know, it would have been more interesting if they brought back characters such as Chip, or even Marissa Fairborn if they wanted to go ahead with this idea. I mean, Carly's not even in this episode. And all we get is the Shrek people, and we have no idea who these guys really are. We've not got any sort of attachment to them. You know, it probably wouldn't have been so bad if we got more episodes with these guys, but it's only three episodes. So I, why, why bring random characters in when we could just like bring back characters that have been a part of this series since the beginning? And we're focusing on these characters when we just got back Octopus Prime, who seems rather dazed and confused throughout the entire episode. Like, he's just come back from the dead, and he seems more of an older man uh, than the hero that we used to know. The main highlight of this episode is really the Hive bonding with the Decepticons. I just find these Headmasters way more entertaining. Those Autobots are gonna be molten metal! Alright, knock it off! And what of my weapon? It's me, I'm Fracus! And if you think Blowpipe was bad, I'm worse! And you're louder. They're basically just little gremlins. Ugh, me, a top Hive scientist paired with a mangy knight scavenger like you! And to be bonded to that creature? This project was a bad investment. <laughs> so Optimus enters Vector Sigma to talk to Alpha Trion, and this dude is basically everywhere whenever Optimus Prime needs help. Why did we bring back Prime? We should have just brought back Alpha Trion instead. So Alpha explains that the key is on Nebulos, and that Vector Sigma arranged for Galvatron to learn of it, and all of this is being done to bring a second golden age of Cybertron, which is all for the merging of humans and Autobots. Alpha Trion tells Prime and Ease to preserve the key at all costs, and Prime is confused by this, but it's kinda hard to argue with God's will after all. While the animation is left to be desired, I gotta admit we do get some pretty fun action sequence in the rebirth, but sometimes that's really just all it is. The Decepticons steal the key, but Brainstorm manages to run a scan on Nightstick before the Decepticons run off. Using the scans gives Spike an idea for the Nebulon sharpshooters to also become target masters. And Optimus Prime arrives, and honestly, I had to be more confused than ever before. Optimus Prime, I want you to meet some friends of mine. I don't see anybody. We are the Target Masters. And we're all Headmasters now, Prime. Watch. Yeah, the movie totally killed Transformers. Just as the Autobots claim victory from getting the key back, Zarok, the Hive leader, unveils his work of art. You are wrong. My god, what's that? This is my work of art. It's finally completed. This is the Scorpion. What is it now, guys? Like 99 transitions? How many shots you had? Are you, are you still standing? We made it. Episode 98, The Rebirth Part 3. The battle for the key to the plasma energy chamber comes to an end as well as the conclusion of the American continuity of the Transformers. So we have a new Decepticon threat controlled by the Nebulons, Scorponok. Whereas the same as Six Shot is the absolute definition of wasted potential. He's nothing more than a controlled machine operated by Lord Zarek, whereas in Headmasters, that completely ignored the Rebirth events as his own unique origin story. But unfortunately, in the Rebirth, this is all we get. Okay, so with the rebirth being extremely fast paced, I'm just going to kind of skim over some plot details because, well, if they're not going to care about pacing, then I'm not either. 
Okay, so Scorponok kidnaps RC and Daniel by eating them, and then you've got Spike who wants to stay on the planet so he can talk to Celebros on joining the Headmasters. And Optimus doesn't like that, he's worried, so he has a little mini mind fit. And then Celebros wakes up and he asks him to join the Headmasters, and he's like, no, he's like, well, my son's in danger, and he's like, okay, whatever, showing a real lack of care. And it's like, seriously, this is the last episode of Transformers, and we're going to focus on this wannabe beachcomber pacifist. <laughs> Very well. Uh, Galvatron uh, finds out about the Decepticons now becoming Headmasters, and you know what? Uh, this whole episode, this is probably the funniest moment. Just Galvatron being so disgusted by the idea. You've all got some explaining to do. Are you out of your minds? You call yourselves Decepticons? Allowing these filthy organic beings to cohabitate your bodies? I'm going to blow those creepy creatures clear out of you! Galvatron forgets about this though because Zarak has the key to the plasma energy chamber so he's like, okay, fine. So Lord Zarak tortures Daniel so RC gives up the key and they seem to heavily imply a love romantic connection between Daniel and RC. And I can't help but feel a bit creeped out by it. I mean, this boy must be like, what, 14? You know, I would have been okay with it if it was like a sibling dynamic sort of thing. But the idea of them leaning into it being romantic is just extremely uncomfortable. RC, I just want to say, RC, I, I... You don't have to, Daniel. I feel the same way too. A kid's therapist is going to make a fortune. Okay, so Cybertron is missing, and this is because Galtron has installed engines on Cybertron for it to travel throughout space. Galvatron reveals his plan is to activate the plasma energy chamber and let energy spread out and cause the sun to nova, destroying both Earth and Cybertron. <laughs> and even the Decepticons are like, what? At last! The key to the plasma energy chamber! You're not going to open that thing! I am, idiot! On Nebulo, Spike and Celebrus locate the Hive City, and they begin using old robot machines to modify the city to create this giant transforming robot city. Fortress Maximus. It's just like Triptychon all over again. How did they find the time? It's just like, what, a box of scraps? <laughs> it's just... The pacing is incredible. I swear to God, Spike has got to be one of the most genius human beings to ever exist. Anyway, just as the Autobots on Cybertron walk straight into a trap, Spike comes to the rescue, and we get an all-out brawl between Fortress Maximus and Scorpionok. Oh, Celebros is also the head of Fortress Maximus, so they're like, they're duking it out. So Spike puts his son first before saving the universe, and well, you know what happens. Uh, the Decepticons get defeated, Spike comes up with a plan that saves the day, leading to the revitalization of Cybertron, and... Okay, there's no point debunking the science of how he did it. He just pressed a button, okay? Despite saving the day, Celebros begs Spike to deactivate him. And honestly, I can't blame the dude at this point. But he sees that Cybertron has now entered a new golden age. The Autobots are happy. And you know, I actually kind of love that Spike saved the day in the last episode. You know, after being rescued in the first episode. It's kind of a good tribute to that. Now I gotta say, the series ending is really bad. It ends on such a cliffhanger note. As a kid, I assumed there was always more episodes after this. It just teases you with potential storylines that could be told. It sets up the Headmasters and Targetmasters staying on Nebulon, and we have Galvatron with Lord Zarok declaring that he will return to conquer more planets. And I will rule the galaxy! Who will rule the galaxy? We shall see, Galvatron. We shall see. I can just imagine kids waiting for years for Galvatron's revenge to occur, but not realizing that that was the last episode of the entire series. But at this point, let's face it, the Transformers exhausted themselves and Hasbro gave up. Unlike in Japan, however, where they got the Headmaster series and then the sequel series, the Victory, etc. That would still be alive over in that country, but unfortunately with America, they just kind of give us a half ass free party with an unsatisfying ending. And it kind of leaves a massive hole in my heart that that's it for the American continuity. Like, damn, it ended just like that. That's why I like to just forget about it, relax, and just imagine season three as the definitive end. 
But season four will always be like a giant lump on the back of my head. It, I know it's there and I can't get rid of it. I guess you could look at season four as kind of like a repetitive loop that the Transformers will constantly go through, like it still goes through today. Like the story ends with the Decepticons still at large, but it's just gonna start up again and it's just gonna repeat, repeat, repeat. So in a way, sadly, it is kind of a good metaphor for the future. And I'm not going to rank my personal favourite episode from season 4 because there's only 3 and it doesn't matter what order the parts are in, I feel the same about all 3 of them. The pacing is bad, the dialogue is uninspiring, the action, the animation, it's all flat. And there we have it, that's where the story ends with the Decepticon still at large and the Alouettes in control of a revitalised Cybertron. Okay, with that now done, it's time to rank every episode from worst to best. I'm going to need some help though. The Transformers will return after these messages. Optimus! Well done, Cam. Like I said, you've got the touch. Thanks, Prime. It was way harder than I thought it was going to be. But I got there in the end. Wait, Cam. Wasn't there a season five? I could have sworn. Nah, Prime. Season five was just recycled old episodes of you talking to some kid named Tommy. Oh, yeah, that's right. I wonder what happened to Tommy. Listen, Prime. I'd love to chat, but I gotta rank every episode now from worst to best. I'll be right back, though. Wish me luck. As I believe the Earthlings say, lay it on me, man. 98, Carnage and C-Minor. 97, Bot. 96, Thief in the Night. 95, Forever is a Long Time Coming. 94, City of Steel. 93, Day of the Machines. 92, The Quintesson Journal. 91, The Big Broadcast of 2006. 90, The Core. 89, Aerial Assault, 88, Countdown to Extinction, 87, The God Gambit, 86, Quest for Survival, 85, Dinobot Island Part 2, 84, Atlantis Arise, 83, Surprise Party, 82, Madame's Paradise, 81, The Gambler, 80, The Face of Najika, 79, Prime Target, 78, Autobop, 77, only Human. 76. Nightmare Planet. 75. The Rebirth Part 3. 74. The Rebirth Part 2. And 73. The Rebirth Part 1. 72. Sea Change. 71. Blasters Blues. 70. Five Faces of Darkness Part 3. 69. Five Faces of Darkness Part 4. 68. Five Faces of Darkness Part 2. 67, Five Faces of Darkness Part 5. 66, Five Faces of Darkness Part 1. 65, The Dweller in the Depths. 64, The Ultimate Doom Part 1. 63, The Ultimate Doom Part 2. 62, The Autobot Run. 61, Fire on the Mountain. 60, Roll for It. 59, Money is Everything. 58, The Ultimate Weapon. 57, The Ultimate Doom Part 3. 56, Megatron's Master Plan Part 1. 55, Grimlock's New Brain. 54, Changing Gears. 53, Autobot Spike. 52, A Plague of Insecticons. 51, Chaos. 50, Kremzeek. 49, Child's Play. 48, Divide and Conquer. 47, Call of the Primitives. 46, The Girl Who Loved Paraglide. 45, Traitor, 44, Transport to Oblivion, 43, Masquerade, 42, Dinobot Island Part 1, 41, Cosmic Rust, 40, Megatron's Master Plan Part 2, 39, Desertion of the Dinobots Part 1, 38, Trans Europe Express, 37, Desertion of the Dinobots Part 2, 36, Fight or Flee, 35, More Than Meets the Eye Part 3, 34, Auto Berserk, 33, Heavy Metal War, 32, Attack of the Autobots, 31, 
Vakita Vector Sigma Part 1, 30, Vakita Vector Sigma Part 2, 29, The Secret of Omega Supreme, 28, The Return of Optimus Prime Part 1, 27, The Insecticon Syndrome, 26, More Than Meets the Eye Part 2, 25, The Burden Hardest to Bear, 24, SOS Dinobots, 23, The Immobilizer, 22, The Master Builders, 21, Ghost in the Machine, 20, A Decepticon Raider in King Arthur's Court, 19, The Killing Jar, 18, The Search for Alpha Trion, 17, The Revenge of Bruticus, 16, Web World, 15, Make Tracks, 14, War of the Dinobots, 13, Dark Awakening, 12, The Return of Atlas Prime Part 2, 11, Starscream's Brigade, 10, Hoist Goes Hollywood, 9, Enter the Nightbird, 8, A Prime Problem, 7, Triple Takeover, 6, More Than Meets the Eye Part 1, 5, Starscream's Ghost, 4, Microbots, 3, War Dawn, 2, Fire in the Sky, and finally, number one, my favourite episode of all time, is of course, The Golden Lagoon. Alright Prime, I've got to ask, what's your personal favourite episode? That's a tough one, Cam, but I do enjoy the episode where I am balling. <laughs> I bet you was a real player in your prime. <laughs> I see what you did there. I know it's not an episode, but I really enjoy the movie. But Prime, you die. Yep, exactly. I wish I stayed dead. Look, having to deal with Megatron for stellar cycles, becoming a zombie, having to listen to Blaster's music, you'd wish for an early retirement. Huh, Prime, I guess I've never really thought of it like that before. Being dead is a bliss, Cam. Oh yeah, Prime, I almost forgot. I need to give you back the Matrix. You can keep it, Cam. You've earned it. Wow, really? No, give me back that Matrix immediately. Let's go, Cam. I'm going to take you on an adventure. Plus, I've got to go find Tommy. I think I left him on a planet somewhere. <laughs> Boy, I sure hope he isn't dead. So there you have it guys, every Generation 1 episode ranked from worst to best. Thank you for following me on this journey, it's been really fun and it's been a lot of hard work. So if you haven't already and you like this video, which I assume you did because you watched 7 hours or so of it, uh, be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell for more videos just like this. Once again, thank you to everyone who collaborated in this video, it means a great deal to me. And uh, yeah, until the next video, uh, well actually I'm going to go to sleep. For a long time. I think I might just hide in a cave somewhere. <laughs> anyway, this has been Conan Cam. And until next time, goodbye. No one tell Prime. <laughs>